Birdie's Ride by Lady Dunboyne, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Here's a nice state of things. We have run short of candles for the tree, and of course the shops will be shut tomorrow and the day after. What is to be done? Almost anything else might have been managed in some way, but a Christmas tree in semi-darkness. Can anything more dismal be imagined? And Alice Chetwin's usually bright face looks nearly as gloomy as the picture she has called up. "'What's the row?' cries schoolboy Bertie, planting two good-natured if somewhat grubby hands on his sister's shoulders. "'Alice in the dumps? That is something quite new. Can't you cut some big candles in two and stick them about? Here's Cousin Mildred. Ask her. She'll be sure to hit upon something.' "'No, don't bother her,' whispers Alice, giving him a warning pat as a pretty girl some years older than themselves enters the room. She is so disappointed at getting no letter again today. I am so sorry, for it has quite spoiled her Christmas. Hush, don't say I told you anything about it. What mischief are you two children plotting? Cousin Mildred tries to speak cheerily and to turn her face so that they may not see any traces of tears about her pretty blue eyes, but there is a little quiver in her voice which betrays her. In a moment, Alice's arm is round her neck, and Bertie is consoling her after his rough and ready fashion. Cheer up, Cousin Milly. I'll bet anything you'll get a letter tomorrow. I can't do that, Bertie, I'm afraid, for the postman doesn't come on Christmas Day. Doesn't he? What a beastly shame! I declare I'll speak to father. No, no, your father knows all about it. It's quite right, and I'm so glad the poor old man has one day to spend comfortably with his wife and children. I don't quite know why Cecil hasn't written, but worrying about it won't do any good. Now, let us talk about something else. Alice, when can you be spared from the tree? Mother wants all the help she can get for the church dressing. "'Is she down at the church now? "'All right, darling, I'll come in two minutes. "'Isn't it a plague about these candles? "'The shops are sure to be shut in Appleton the day after Christmas, "'and the poor children will be so disappointed "'if we have to put off the tree.' "'The poor dear school children. "'Oh, that is a pity. "'But candles, oh dear, I don't know how we can do without them. "'Is it quite impossible to send to Appleton today?' "'Why, to say the truth, I asked Father this morning, and he said there was no one to go. "'You see, Coachman is away for a holiday, and Sam is as busy as he can be, "'and there is no one else who can be trusted with a horse, "'and one cannot ask anybody to trudge five miles and back through the snow, "'though it is not at all deep.' "'And there is more snow coming, I fear,' says Mildred, looking out at the grey, thick, wintry sky. "'It is awfully cold. Ah, there is a feeble little ray of sunshine struggling out.' "'Well, I must go back to my occupation of measuring flannel for the old women's petticoats. "'It is nice and warm for one's fingers, at any rate. "'And, Allie, dear, tell Mother I'll join her at the church as soon as ever I can. "'The keepers have brought us such lovely holly out of the woods. "'You never saw such wealth of berries. "'The wreaths will be splendid this year.' "'And Mildred goes away, humming a little Christmas carol, "'and bravely trying to forget the sore anxiety that is pressing on her heart, "'for the faraway soldier lover whose Christmas greeting she had so hoped to receive today. "'Isn't she a trump?' cries Bertie, who can see and appreciate the effort his cousin is making. I know she has half cried her eyes out when she was by herself, but she didn't mean us to find it out. I say, Alice, I'll have another try for that letter of hers, and get your candles, too. Grey Plover has been roughed, and he's as sure-footed as a goat. The snow is nothing to hurt now, and I'll trot over to Appleton and be back in no time at all. Oh, Bertie, don't! Cousin Mildred said there was a snowstorm coming, and you might get lost like the people in the Swiss mountains. Or the babes in the wood, eh? You little silly, don't you think I'm man enough to take care of myself? And Master Bertie, who is fifteen, and a regular sturdy specimen of a blue-eyed, sunburnt, curly-haired English lad, draws himself up with great dignity, and looks down patronizingly at his little sister. Alice, of course, subsides, vanquished by this appeal, but she cannot help feeling some very uncomfortable qualms of conscience when it appears that she is to be the only person admitted into the young gentleman's confidence. "'Don't go bothering poor mother about it. She always gets into such a funk as if no one knew how to take care of themselves. And be sure not to say a word to Cousin Mildred. I want to surprise her by bringing her letter by the second post. And if father asks where I am—oh, but that will be all right. I shall get back before he comes home from shooting.' And Bertie is gone before his sister has time to put into words the remonstrance she has been struggling to frame. "'He'll miss his dinner, poor dear,' she thinks compassionately but is consoled by the remembrance of an admirable pastry-cook's shop in Appleton, where the gingerbread is sure to be extra plentiful on Christmas Eve of all days in the year. "'A real old-fashioned Christmas, father calls it,' thinks Alice as she goes to the window and looks out at the whitened landscape, amongst which the leafless branches of the trees stand out like the limbs of blackened giants. The snow which has been falling at intervals for some days is not deep, but there is a heavy lowering appearance about the sky betokening that the worst is yet to come. The little birds, which Alice has been befriending ever since the winter set in, come hopping familiarly round the window, and one saucy robin gives a peck to the glass as if to intimate that a fresh supply of crumbs would be acceptable. 
Alice feels in her pocket for a bit of bread and finding some fragments hastily scatters them on the window ledge, promising a better repast by and by. Then she gives a last look at the half-dressed Christmas tree, shakes her head over the insufficient candles, and murmuring that Bertie really is the dearest boy in the world, runs off to aid her mother in decorating the old village church. Meanwhile, Grey Plover is swiftly and resolutely bearing his rider over the half-frozen snow in a manner worthy of his name. He is a handsome, strong-built pony, Squire Chetwin's gift to his son on his last birthday, and a right goodly pair they make, at least in the fond father's eyes. Perhaps if either Mr. Chetwind or his steady old coachman had been at home, Master Bertie would not have found it quite so easy to get his steed saddled for that ten miles ride, with the ground already covered with snow and the heaviest fall that has been known for many a year visibly impending. There is a keen northeaster blowing, but Appleton lies to the west, so that for the present it only comes on the back of his neck, and Bertie turns up his collar to keep out the flakes which seem scattered about here and there in the air, and trots bravely along, whistling and talking by turns to his pony, and to a wiry little terrier, which is really Cousin Mildred's property, but in common with most other animals is deeply devoted to Bertie. "'Steady, lad, steady!' and Bertie checks his steed as they descend a somewhat steep incline bordered by high hedges, of which the one to the north is half concealed by a bank of snow. "'I declare I never thought it could have grown so deep in the time,' mutters Bertie to himself. "'I hope it won't snow again before tonight, or I shall have some work to get home. What's the time? Just two. All right. Two hours more daylight at any rate. More if a fog doesn't come on. Good day, John. Merry Christmas to you.' as the village carrier, his cart heavily laden with Christmas boxes and parcels, passes him, leading his old horse carefully up the hill. "'The same to you, Master Bertie, and many of them. How be the squire and Mrs. Chetwind and—' "'All well, thank you, John, but I can't stop to go through the list now. I've to get to Appleton and back as soon as I can.' "'To Appleton! Laws now, Master Bertie, don't you do nothing of the kind. As sure as I'm alive, there's awful weather coming, and you and that little pony will never get back if you don't mind.' "'Little pony indeed, John!' Grey Plover is nearly fourteen hands, and do you suppose I care for a snowstorm? Old John points to the wall of grey cloud advancing steadily from the northeast. You just look yonder, master. If that don't mean the worst storm that we have known for many a long year, my name's not John Salter. Well, then I must make all the more haste. If I don't turn up by church time tomorrow, you and old Moss will have to come and dig me out. Come along, Nettle. And whistling to the terrier, which has been exchanging salutations with the carrier's old half-bred collie, Bertie canters on. "'I don't think I can find time to go home to luncheon,' says Mrs. Chetwind, casting an anxious eye round the half-decorated church, which presents a one-sided appearance, two columns being beautifully wreathed with glossy dark leaves and coral berries, shining laurel and graceful ivy, and the third as yet untouched. "'Mildred, when you come back, will you and Alice bring me some biscuits and I can eat them in the vestry? The daylight now is so short, and I think today is even darker than usual. We shall have to work very hard to get finished in time.' "'I'll stay with you,' replies her cousin, "'and Alice shall bring provisions for us both.' and by this means the secret of Bertie's absence from the early dinner remains unobserved. It is snowing heavily as Alice, in fur cloak and snow boots, trips back to the church some quarter of a mile distant from her home. The girl is beginning to be very anxious about her brother and sorely repents her extorted promise of secrecy as to his intentions. "'We are getting on,' says Mrs. Chetwin, glancing round. "'I wonder if your father will look in on his way back from shooting. I suppose Bertie must have gone to join him, as we have seen nothing of the boy. I hope they won't be late. The snow is getting quite deep.' A hasty knocking at the church door makes Alice start and turn so pale that her cousin laughs at her for setting up nerves. Before, however, they can open it, the intruder makes his way in, and proves to be the stable helper, with a face so white and scared that the alarm is communicated to Mrs. Chetwind. "'Millie,' she says faintly, "'there's been some accident. Ask him. Quick! Herbert's gone!' "'No, no,' says her cousin, bent only on reassuring her. "'Speak out, James. Don't you see how you are frightening your mistress?' "'If you please, ma'am. Grey Plover has come home alone and—' "'The pony! Master Bertie wasn't riding!' "'Yes, ma'am. He started to ride to Appleton about half-past one o'clock. "'To ride in such weather?' "'Yes, ma'am. He would go, and the squire not being at home, I could not hinder him, "'and now the pony's just galloped into the yard, and—' "'Mary, dearest, don't look so frightened!' cries Mildred, fearing her cousin is going to faint. "'I dare say he got off to walk and warm himself, and the pony broke away. "'Bertie rides so well he would not be likely to have a fall. "'But the snow! Isn't it quite deep in some places, James?' "'Yes, ma'am. Six or seven feet, they say, in the drifts, though most part of the road was pretty clear this morning. But it's been snowing heavily these two hours and more, and nearly as dark as night, and Grey Plover must have been down some time or other, for when he came in the saddle was all over snow.' Mrs. Chetwin gives a gasp, and for a moment her cousin thinks her senses are going, but with a brave struggle she rallied her powers. 
James, you and the gardener said better go off at once. Two of you try each road to Appleton to meet Master Bertie. Alice, dear, run up to the house and fill father's flask with cordial and see that they take it and, and a blanket and tell someone to go and meet your father. He will know best what to do. I must go myself to look for my boy. God, help me. What shall I do if he has come to harm? You cannot walk, darling. And Mildred tenderly leads her to one of the open seats and strokes her hands in loving but vain efforts at encouragement. Don't imagine anything bad till it comes. Bertie is sure to have taken some of the dogs with them, and they would have come home to tell us if anything were wrong. There was only little Nettle at home, Mrs. Chetwin answers with a sigh. Jerry and Nell are out shooting with Herbert, and the new dog is no use. Oh, Millie, my bright, bonny boy, where can he be? See how dreadfully dark it has grown, and the cold. Think if he should be lying helpless in the snow. About the same time, on this December afternoon, a young man is getting out of the one-horse omnibus, which the George Hotel a small third-rate inn, albeit the best in Appleton, usually sends down to meet the afternoon train from London. He is a tall, soldierly-looking person with bright, dark eyes and a brisk, imperative manner which ensures a certain amount of attention even from the surly landlord. But when, instead of demanding luncheon or any creature comforts for himself, the traveller orders a dog cart or any sort of trap with a good horse to take him to Mr. Chetwin's house, five miles distant, the host demurs. Impossible! The omnibus horse is the only one roughed, and he has been out twice today already. Besides, there is likely to be a heavy fall of snow before night. Even if a horse and trap could get to Edenhurst, there would be no possibility of getting back before nightfall. Mine host is very sorry to disoblige the gentleman, but it is quite out of the question. The young man, who is evidently not used to stolid opposition, begins to chafe, and his dark eyes give an angry flash. However, he forces himself to speak quietly and persuasively, and even descends to bribery in his anxiety to spend his Christmas at Edenhurst. Still, the landlord remains obdurate, the fact that he has a big commercial dinner impending at five o'clock, making him the less inclined to spare any of his men. "'Well, hang it all!' cries the young man impatiently. "'Then I declare I'll get there on my own legs. I can carry my bag,' swinging it stoutly over his shoulder as he speaks. "'And you must find some means of sending the other things over tomorrow morning at latest.' "'It would be too tantalizing,' he adds to himself, "'after coming two thousand miles to see the little woman if we could not spend our Christmas Eve together after all.' And turning a deaf ear to the landlord's remonstrances and prophecies of evil, he sets forth briskly on the road, well known to him, although untrodden for two long years. Dear little soul, he's saying to himself as he strides through the snow, what a surprise it'll be to her. I'm half sorry now I did not write. Perhaps she'll be startled. But I don't believe in sudden joy hurting anyone. I wonder if she'll be altered. I hope not. The little face couldn't be sweeter than it was. And Herbert Chetwind is a rare good fellow. What a welcome I shall get from him and his kind-hearted wife. It's almost worth toiling and broiling for two years in India to come home for such a Christmas. I wonder if that jolly pickled birdie is much grown. Capital little companion he used to be, I remember. How far have I come? Oh, just past the second milestone. The snow is getting plaguy deep and I can hardly see ten yards ahead. I can't say it is pleasant traveling. How I shall appreciate the splendid fire in the big hall fireplace at Edenhurst. They will be burning the Yule log for Christmas. How I shall enjoy taking up all the old home customs once more. I wonder if the weights go round now. What a brute I used to feel, lying snug in bed and listening to the poor little shivering mortals singing outside in the frosty morning air, almost before it was light. But I believe Herbert's wife and Millie always took care that they had a warm breakfast and a toast at the kitchen fire afterwards, but, hello, I say, what little dog are you out alone in the snow in this lonely part of the road? Lost your master, have you, poor little beggar? Never mind, you had better follow me home to Edenhurst for tonight. They wouldn't refuse a welcome even to a stray dog on Christmas Eve. I say, you are very pressing in your attentions, my friend. I'm afraid you are on a wrong track, sniffing and prancing around me. I'm not your master, nor have I the honor of that gentleman's acquaintance, unless— By Jove! If it isn't little Nettle, the dog I gave Mildred when I went to India. What can she be doing out here alone? And what does she want me to do, I wonder? As the terrier, delighted at the sudden recognition, dances round him more energetically than ever, catches his hand and the skirts of his coat gently in her teeth, then runs on a little way ahead, looking back to see if he is following. "'Lead on, I'll follow thee. That seems to be what you want me to say, eh, little Nettle? All right there.' And the traveller's two long legs contrive to make quite as rapid progress along the road as the terrier's four short ones, especially as the poor little animal occasionally lights on a snowy heap softer and deeper than the rest, and is nearly lost to sight altogether for some seconds. Presently, however, in spite of all obstacles, she scurries on ahead and stops short with a joyful, self-satisfied bark in front of a dark object which is half sitting, half lying in a bed of partly melted snow under the hedge, an object which upon closer inspection proves to be a slight, curly-headed boy, clad in heather-colored jacket and knickerbockers. His cap has fallen off and his eyes are nearly closed as he leans back on his cold couch, with an expression of half-conscious suffering on his young face. "'Come, this won't do!' exclaims the traveller, in a tone of no small surprise and concern. "'I say, young sir, have you forgotten that this is December and not exactly the season for enjoying life in gypsy fashion?' 
The boy's eyes open dreamily and scan the keen brown mustached face which is bending over him, but he neither moves nor makes any response. The traveler lays a hand on his shoulder and speaks again, somewhat more peremptorily. I say, young one, get up, do you hear? Do you want to get frozen to death? If there is some roughness in the tone, there is none in the manner and gesture with which, dropping on one knee in the snow, the traveler proceeds to chafe the cold, nerveless hand, which in answer to this appeal the boy slowly tries to lift. He points to his left foot, which is stretched out in an uncomfortable, twisted attitude, and his new friend is not long in discovering that a sprained ankle is the cause of the mischief. A serviceable many-bladed knife is quickly produced, and the boot dexterously slid open, to the instant relief of the injured limb, which is much swollen. The boy gives a gasp of satisfaction and murmurs, "'Thank you,' as he makes a still unsuccessful effort to scramble to his feet. "'Take care, let me give you a hand.' "'Poor little chap,' as the patient collapses again. "'Here, have a pull at this,' taking a restorative from a medicine case in an inner pocket. "'That's right, you'll be able to tell me about it presently. "'Nettle, little ass, it's a pity you can't speak, isn't it?' "'How do you know the dog's name?' the boy inquires, now almost roused into curiosity. "'How do I know it? Why, because she belonged to me for six months before I went to India, and then I gave her to the lady who I hope is to be my wife now I've come back.' "'What? Are you Cecil Gordon?' "'The same, at your service. Cousin Sis, as your little sister used to call me, if, as I suppose, you are my old playfellow Bertie. Two years have made a difference in your size, my lad, and this snow gave your face a blue sort of look which prevented my knowing you at first. And now tell me what pranks have you been playing to get into such a plight? I rode Grey Plover to Appleton this afternoon to get some things the girls wanted, and the snowstorm came on heavily, and it got horribly dark, as you see, and somehow we stumbled into a snowdrift. I'd marked the bad places as I came and thought I could keep clear of them, but the darkness misled me and the snow got into my eyes. We rolled over together, and my foot caught in the stirrup and came out with an awful wrench, but it's ever so much better since you cut the boot open. And then I suppose the pony made off? Yes, I believe so. I felt awfully sick when I got up, but I managed to crawl out of the drift, for I'd just sense enough left to mind being smothered. I don't suppose I could have lain here very long when you came, or I should have been frozen. Well, the great thing will be to get you home as soon as may be, but the snow is getting so deep that it won't be very pleasant traveling. Can you bear to put that foot to the ground? No, then don't try. My legs must do duty for two. Oh, I'm too heavy. You'll never be able to carry me, especially through the snow. Nonsense. If you begin making difficulties, I shall have to treat you as one of our fellows. So the story goes, did the wounded sergeant in Zululand. Oh, what was that? Why, the enemy was close upon them, and B, that was the officer, was bent upon rescuing the sergeant of his troops who was wounded and helpless and whose own horse had been killed. So he told him to get up behind on his horse, and the sergeant refused, and told B to save himself and leave him to perish. And B answered in peremptory fashion, If you don't obey orders at once, I shall punch your head. Don't punch mine today says Bertie with a rather feeble laugh. It feels so queer and top-heavy. I'll give you leave to try as soon as I'm all right again. All right. But now about this getting home. Here, you take the bag and I'll carry you. Will you ride in ordinary pick-a-back fashion, or, as I've seen soldiers do at what they've called chummy races, lengthwise across their bearers' shoulders? Bertie prefers the former method, and with some little difficulty is hoisted into the required position. How are they all at home? asks Captain Gordon after they have advanced some little way in silence. Very well. And very jolly. Only today Cousin Millie was out of spirits because— Well, what? The tone is sharp and impatient. Because you hadn't written, and she did so want a letter for Christmas, and I thought there might be one by the afternoon post. They do come then sometimes. And that was the reason for your taking that crazy ride through the snow? My dear little fellow, and the brisk voice is very kind and gentle now. I am sorry to have been the cause of all this trouble. Oh, never mind. It was partly, too, to get Alice the candle she was bothering about for the Christmas tree. By the by, I hope they've not fallen out of my pocket. No, here they are, all right. I'm afraid you found no letter at the post office after all. You see, the orders for home came to us rather suddenly, and when I found I could be in England as soon as a letter could reach, I didn't write. I am so sorry it happened so. You had lots of real fighting among the Afghans, hadn't you? Yes, I'll tell you about it some day. Just now I want my breath for something more than talking. How deep the snow is between these high hedges. Yes, if only we could get over into the fields it would be better. And there's a shortcut, too. Can we find it? I'll try, but my head is so stupid somehow. Don't I hear someone whistling behind us? As Bertie speaks, a young laboring man comes up to them, looks with some surprise at the pair, and answers with a surly grunt to Captain Gordon's inquiry as to the nearest way to Edenhurst. Why, Jack, you can show us, cries Bertie impatiently. There's a stile somewhere that leads right past your mother's cottage, and then we can get across Higgins's fields. 
"'If there is a cottage, I shall be glad of five minutes' rest by the fireside,' says Cecil, who is beginning to get decidedly blown. "'I was just thinking what an awfully lonely road this was.' "'Jack Brown is a surly fellow,' whispers Bertie in his ear, but not so low but that the man catches the last words. "'Surly! And who wouldn't be, young master, I'd like to know, in my place? Didn't the squire have me up for poaching, and didn't I get three weeks in jail along of snaring a few worthless pheasants? Much he or anyone would have cared if my old mother had starved the while.' "'For shame!' Bertie's wrath is making him quite energetic. "'As if Mother and Mildred didn't go to see the old woman nearly every day and make sure she wanted for nothing.' "'Well, well,' interrupts Cecil. "'Don't rake up bygones on Christmas Eve of all days in the year. Forgive and forget. Peace and goodwill, that's what the bells always seem to me to be saying. I say, my friend, I'm sure your mother will be willing to let the young master sit by her fire for five minutes after he's nearly got himself killed, and buried, too, riding to Appleton to do his sister and cousin a good turn.' A shadow of a smile lurks on Jack's grim visage at this appeal, and he proceeds to lead the way across a difficult, hog-backed stile, over which he helps to lift Bertie with more gentleness than might be expected. Then striding before them through the snow, which is more even and easy to wade through in the open field, he presently stops at the door of a little thatched cottage which is opened by a tidy old woman. Bertie is soon established in her own high-backed wooden chair by the fire, drinking hot if somewhat hay-scented tea, and obtaining great relief from the attentions his friend is now better able to bestow upon the injured foot. Meanwhile, this is becoming a very sad Christmas Eve to the anxious watchers at Edenhurst. The squire has returned home, puzzled and half incredulous at the confused report of Master Bertie's disappearance which has reached him. But when the snow-soaked saddle and the riderless pony have been shown him, he too grows seriously alarmed, and without waiting to change his wet things, sets off in the direction of Appleton. Other messengers have already been dispatched, but the hours pass by and no news is obtained, no one happening to think of the shortcut and old Mrs. Brown's cottage. Even the bells are mute. The villagers cannot bear to ring them when their dear lady is in such trouble. She is trying hard to force herself to believe that nothing can be so very wrong. It is foolish to be so over-anxious. No one has any heart to carry on the joyous preparations for Christmas, in which Bertie usually bears an active part, but Mrs. Chetwynd will not let the poor people suffer, and their gifts of warm clothing and tea and sugar are all looked over and carefully ticketed by Mildred and Alice. Poor girls, they have little spirit for the work, but it is better for them than the dreary waiting which follows. At last Alice can bear it no longer. She throws a cloak round her and steals out into the avenue. The air is clearer now and the snow has ceased to fall. The earth is covered with a brilliant white sheet and overhead the wintry stars are shining out one by one in the deep blue vault. The girl begins to feel more hopeful as the still frosty air cools her hot cheek and the stars look down upon her with their silent greeting of peace. Glad tidings of great joy, the Christmas message of nearly nineteen centuries ago, Surely it cannot be that a heartbreaking grief is to come on them on this of all nights in the year. A prayer is in her heart, on her lips, and even in that moment, as if in answer, there burst forth the most joyous of all sounds to Alice's ear, their own village bells ringing in a merry Christmas peal. It had been understood that this was to be the signal of Bertie's being found and safe. Louder and louder it comes, and eager congratulations are exchanged by the anxious watchers. Mrs. Chetwynd wants to fly to meet her boy, but is gently restrained by Mildred, who reminds her that his father must be with him, nor is it long before a happy group are seen approaching. There is Bertie, who has insisted on putting his injured foot to the ground lest his mother should be frightened by seeing him carried, bravely hopping along with the aid of his father's strong arm, faithful little Nettle trotting close at his side, and Jack Brown, with whom the squire has shaken hands and exchanged a merry Christmas, slouching behind. But who is the tall figure on Bertie's other side? Ah, Cousin Mildred knows." And well it is, perhaps, that the growing darkness throws a friendly veil over the joyous blushes and the happy, thankful tears that mark that meeting. End of Bertie's Ride by Lady Dunboyne Recording by Angela A Chaparral Christmas Gift by O. Henry Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The original cause of the trouble was about twenty years in growing. At the end of that time, it was worth it. Had you lived anywhere within fifty miles of Sundown Ranch, you would have heard of it. It possessed a quantity of jet-black hair, a pair of extremely frank deep brown eyes, and a laugh that rippled across the prairie like the sound of a hidden brook. The name of it was Rosita McMullen, 
and she was the daughter of old man McMullen of the Sundown Sheep Ranch. There came riding on red roan steeds, or, or to be more explicit, on a paint on a flea-bitten sorrel, two wooers. One was Madison Lane, and the other was the Frio Kid. But at that time they did not call him the Frio Kid, for he had not earned the honors of special nomenclature. His name was simply Johnny McRoy. It must not be supposed that these two were the sum of the agreeable Rosita's admirers. The Broncos of a dozen others champed their bits at the long hitching rack of the Sundown Ranch. Many were the sheep's eyes that were cast in the savannas that did not belong to the flocks of Dan McMullen. But of all the cavaliers, Madison Lane and Johnny McRoy galloped far ahead. Wherefore they are to be chronicled. Madison Lane, a young cattleman from the Nueces country, won the race. He and Rosita were married on Christmas Day. Armed, hilarious, vociferous, magnanimous, the cowmen and the sheepmen, laying aside their hereditary hatred, joined forces to celebrate the occasion. Sundown Ranch was sonorous with the cracking of jokes and six-shooters, the shine of buckles and bright eyes, the outspoken congratulations of the herders of kine. But while the wedding feast was at its liveliest, there descended upon it Johnny McRoy, bitten by jealousy like one possessed. "'I'll give you a Christmas present!' he yelled shrilly at the door with his forty-five in his hand. Even then he had some reputation as an offhand shot. His first bullet cut a neat underbit in Madison Lane's right ear. The barrel of his gun moved an inch. The next shot would have been the bride's, had not Carson, a sheepman, possessed a mind with triggers somewhat well-oiled and in repair. The guns of the wedding party had been hung in their belts upon nails in the wall when they sat at table as a concession to good taste. But Carson, with great promptness, hurled his plate of roast venison and frijoles at McRoy, spoiling his aim. The second bullet, then, only shattered the white petals of a Spanish dagger flower suspended two feet above Rosita's head. The guests spurned their chairs and jumped for their weapons. It was considered an improper act to shoot the bride and groom at a wedding. In about six seconds there were twenty or so bullets due to be whizzing in the direction of Mr. McRoy. "'I'll shoot better next time,' yelled Johnny, "'and there'll be a next time!' He backed rapidly out the door. Carson, the sheepman, spurred on to attempt further exploits by the success of his plate-throwing, was first to reach the door. McRoy's bullet from the darkness laid him low. The cattlemen then swept out upon him, calling for vengeance, for while the slaughter of a sheepman has not always lacked condonement, it was a decided misdemeanor in this instance. Carson was innocent. He was no accomplice at the matrimonial proceedings nor had anyone heard him quote the line, Christmas comes but once a year to the guests. But the sortie failed in its vengeance. McCroy was on his horse and away, shouting back curses and threats as he galloped into the concealing chaparral. That night was the birth night of the Frio Kid. He became the bad man of that portion of the state. The rejection of his suit by Miss McMullen turned him into a dangerous man. When officers went after him for the shooting of Carson, he killed two of them, and entered upon the life of an outlaw. He became a marvelous shot with either hand. He would turn up in towns and settlements, raise a quarrel at the slightest opportunity, pick off his man, and laugh at the officers of the law. He was so cool, so deadly, so rapid, so inhumanly bloodthirsty, that none but faint attempts were ever made to capture him. When he was at last shot and killed by a little one-armed Mexican who was nearly dead himself from fright, the Frio kid had the deaths of eighteen men on his head. About half of these were killed in fair duels, depending on the quickness of the draw. The other half were men whom he assassinated with absolute wantonness and cruelty. Many tales are told along the border of his impudent courage and daring, but he was not one of the breed of desperados who have seasons of generosity and even of softness. They say he never had mercy on the object of his anger. Yet at this and every Christmas tide, it is well to give each one credit, if it can be done, for whatever speck of good he may have possessed. 
If the Frio kid ever did a kindly act or felt a throb of generosity in his heart, it was once at such a time and season, and this is the way it happened. One who has been crossed in love should never breathe the odor from the blossoms of the retama tree. It stirs the memory to a dangerous degree. One December in the Frijo country there was a retama tree in full bloom, for the winter had been as warm as springtime. That way rode the Frijo kid and his satellite and co-murderer, Mexican Frank. The kid reined in his mustang and sat in his saddle, thoughtful and grim, with dangerously narrowing eyes. The rich, sweet smell touched him somewhere beneath his ice and iron. I don't know what I've been thinking about, Mex, he remarked in his usual mild drawl, to have forgotten all about a Christmas present I got to give. I'm going to ride over tomorrow night and shoot Madison Lane in his own house. He got my girl. Rosita would have had me if he hadn't cut into the game. I wonder why I happened to overlook it up to now. Ah, oh, shucks, kid, said Mexican. Don't talk foolishness. You know you can't get within a mile of Mad Lane's house tomorrow night. I see old man Allen day before yesterday, and he says Mad is going to have Christmas doings at his house. You remember how you shot up the festivities when Mad was married and about the threats you made? Don't you suppose Mad Lane will kind of keep his eyes open for a certain Mr. Kid? You plumb make me tired, Kid, with such remarks. I'm going, repeated the Frio Kid without heat, to go to Madison Lane's Christmas doings and kill him. I ought to have done it a long time ago. Why, Max, just two weeks ago, I dreamed me and Rosita was married instead of her and him, and we was living in a house. And I could see her smiling at me, and, oh, hell, Max, he got her, and I'll get him. Yes, sir, on Christmas Eve he got her, and them's when I'll get him. There's other ways of committing suicide, advised Mexican. Why don't you go out and surrender to the sheriff? I'll get him, said the kid. Christmas Eve fell as balmy as April. Perhaps there was a hint of faraway frostiness in the air, but it tingles like seltzer, perfumed faintly with late prairie blossoms and the mesquite grass. When night came, the five or six rooms of the ranch house were brightly lit. In one room was a Christmas tree, for the lanes had a boy of three, and a dozen or more guests were expected from the nearer ranches. At nightfall, Madison Lane called aside Jim Belcher and three other cowboys employed on his ranch. Now, boys, said Lane, keep your eyes open. Walk around the house and watch the road well. All of you know the Frio Kid, as they call him now, and if you see him, open fire on him without asking any questions. I'm not afraid of his coming round, but Rosita is. She's been afraid he'd come in on us every Christmas since we were married. The guests had arrived in buckboards and on horseback, and were making themselves comfortable inside. The evening went along pleasantly. The guests enjoyed and praised Rosita's excellent supper, and afterward the men scattered in groups about the rooms or in the broad gallery smoking and chatting. The Christmas tree, of course, delighted the youngsters, and above all were they pleased when Santa Claus himself in magnificent white beard and furs appeared and began to distribute the toys. "'It's my papa,' announced Billy Sampson, aged six. "'I've seen him wear them before.' Berkeley, a sheepman, an old friend of Lane, stopped Rosita as she was passing by him on the gallery, where he was sitting smoking. "'Well, Mrs. Lane,' said he, "'I suppose by this Christmas you've gotten over being afraid of that fellow McRoy, haven't you? Madison and I have talked about it, you know.' "'Very nearly,' said Rosita, smiling. But I am still nervous sometimes. I shall never forget that awful time when he came so near to killing us. He's the most cold-hearted villain in the world, said Berkeley. The citizens all along the border ought to turn out and hunt him down like a wolf. He has committed awful crimes, said Rosita. But I don't know. I think there is a spot of good somewhere in everybody. He was not always bad. That I know. Rosita turned into the hallway between the rooms. 
Santa Claus in muffling whiskers and furs was just coming through. I heard what you said through the window, Mrs. Lane, he said. I was just going down in my pocket for a Christmas present for your husband. But I've left one for you instead. It's in the room to your right. Oh, thank you, kind Santa Claus, said Rosita brightly. Rosita went into the room while Santa Claus stepped into the cooler air of the yard. She found no one in the room but Madison. Where is my present that Santa said he left for me in here? she asked. Haven't seen anything in the way of a present, said her husband, laughing. Unless he could have meant me. The next day, Gabriel Rad, the foreman of the XO Ranch, dropped into the post office at Loma Alta. Well, the Frio kid's got his dose of lead at last, he remarked to the postmaster. That so? How'd it happen? One of Sanchez's Mexican sheep herders did it. Think of it. The Frio kid killed by a sheep herder. The greaser saw him riding along past his camp about twelve o'clock last night and was so scared that he up with a Winchester and let him have it. Funniest part of it was the kid was dressed up all with white Angora skin whiskers and a regular Santa Claus rig out from head to foot. Think of the Frio kid playing Santy. End of a Chaparral Christmas Gift by O. Henry Read by Winston Tharp Christmas from the Long Ago by J. W. Wright Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org we always used grandmother's stocking, because it was the biggest one in the family, much larger than mother's, and somehow it seemed to be able to stretch more than hers. There was so much room in the foot, too, a chance for all sorts of packages. There was a carpet-covered couch against the flowered wall in one corner of the parlour. Between the foot of it and the chimney was the door into our bedroom. I always hung my stocking at the side of the door nearest the couch, on the theory, well defined in my mind with each recurring Christmas, that if by any chance Santa Claus bought me more than he could get into the stocking, he could always pile the overflow on the couch. And he always did. It may seem strange that a lad who seldom heard even the third getting-up call in the morning should have awakened without any calling once a year or that his red night-gowned figure should have leapt from the depth of his feather-bed, or that he should have crept breathless and fearful to the door where the stocking hung. Notwithstanding the ripe experience of years past, when each Christmas found the generous stocking stuffed with good things, there was always the chance that Santa Claus might have forgotten this year, or that he might have miscalculated his supply and not had enough to go around, or that he had not been correctly informed as to just what you wanted or that some accident might have befallen his reindeer and sleigh to detain him until the grey dawn of Christmas morning stopped his work and sent him scurrying back to his toy kingdom to await another yuletide. And so, in the fearful silence and darkness of that early hour, with stilled breath and heart beating so loudly you thought it would awaken everyone in the house, you softly opened the door, poked your arm through, felt around where the stocking ought to be, but with a great sinking in the heart when you couldn't find it the first time. And finally, your chubby fist clutched the misshapen, lumpy, bulging fabric that proclaimed a generous Santa Claus. Yes, it was there. That was enough for the moment. A hurried climb back into the warm bed, and then interminable years of waiting till your attuned ear caught the first sounds of grandmother's dressing in her nearby bedroom and the first gleam of winter daylight permitted you to see the wondrous stocking and the array of packages on the sofa. It was beyond human strength to refrain from just one look. But alas, the sight of a dapple grey rocking horse with silken mane and flowing tail was too much, and the next moment you were in the room with your arms around the arched neck, while peals of unrestrained joy brought the whole family to the scene. 
Then it was that Mother gathered you into her lap, and wrapped her skirt about your bare legs, and held your trembling form tight in her arms, until you promised to get dressed if they would open just one package, the big one on the end of the sofa. After that there was always, Just one more, Mother. Please. And by that time the base burner was warming up, and you were on the floor in the middle of the discarded wrapping paper, uncovering each wondrous package down to the very last the very, very last, in the very toe of the stocking. The big round one that you were sure was a real league ball, but which proved to be nothing but an orange. There was a new high-powered motor in my garage. It came to me yesterday, Christmas. It is very beautiful, and it cost a great deal of money. A very great deal. If we were in the little old town, it would take us all out to Aunt Em's farm in ten minutes. It always took her an hour to drive in with the old spotted white mare. I am quite happy to have this wonderful new horse of today, and there is some warmth inside of me as I walk round it in the garage while Henry, its keeper, flicks with his chamois every last vestige of dust from its shiny sides. And yet... How gladly would I give it up if only I could have been in my feather bed last night. If I could have awakened at daybreak and crept softly, red-flannelled and barefooted to the parlour door. If I could have groped for Grandmother's stocking and felt its lumpy shape respond to my eager touch. And if I could have known the thrill of that dapple-grey rocking-horse when I flung my arms around its neck and buried my face in its silken mane. End of Christmas by J. W. Wright Christmas at Fezziwig's Warehouse by Charles Dickens Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Christmas at Fezziwig's Warehouse Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work to night. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hands. Before a man can say Jack Robinson. Hilly ho, cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick. Cheer up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life for evermore. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see on a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Mrs. Fezziwig, beaming and lovable. In came the six followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door, but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came anyhow and every how. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley, 
Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pairs of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been thrice as many, oh, four times as many, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again with a stagger when the clock struck eleven the domestic ball broke up mr and mrs fezziwig took their stations one on either side of the door and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out wished him or her a merry christmas end of christmas at fezziwig's Warehouse by Charles Dickens. Read by Pam Castile. A Christmas Barring Out by Stella C. Shutter. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'Bobby and Alice and Pink had hung their stockings "'by the living-room mantel, and though it was very, very early, "'they decided to go to bed. "'They always wanted to go to bed early on Christmas Eve. "'Morning seemed to come so much more quickly "'when they went to bed early. "'They wouldn't even wait for a story. "'They would just say goodnight to Grandma and go right to bed. "'Why!' exclaimed Grandma in surprise "'when they had explained their intentions to her. "'You mustn't go to bed so soon.' be awake in the morning before daylight. Come in and visit with me a while, and I'll see if I can't think of a story to tell you the same as on other nights. So they went in and sat down on their stools in front of the fire. Grandma put on her spectacles, but instead of her knitting, she took up her Bible. The children were very still, while she read the story of the first Christmas, how in a stable in Bethlehem the baby Christ was born, and how an angel appeared to the shepherds who were watching their flocks, and told them about the Savior's birth. And then a host of angels came and praised God, saying, Glory to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men, just as we sing today on Christmas. I think, said Grandma, that I will tell you tonight about a Christmas treat at our school. When I was a little girl, we had a custom handed down from pioneer times called barring out. A few days before Christmas, the teacher would arrive to find the schoolhouse door securely fastened. Before he was admitted, he would have to sign a paper promising to treat his pupils. In those days, we didn't have much store candy, and we looked forward for weeks to the Christmas treat we got at school. You wouldn't think much of it today. Six sticks of red and white striped candy apiece, wintergreen and sassafras and clove, and maybe one of whorehound. My, but it tasted good to us. We didn't eat it all up at once, either. No, indeed. But one year, we didn't know whether to look for a treat or not. The teacher, a Mr. Hazen, was from Clayville, and he had been heard to say that he did not believe in barring out or in being forced to treat his pupils. Nevertheless, we all came early to school one morning and locked him out. While we all cried, Treat! Treat! at the tops of our voices, William Orbison opened the window a tiny bit and thrust out the paper they had prepared for the teacher to sign, but he refused to touch it. This was not alarming, as most all of the teachers stayed out for an hour or two just for fun. We played games and had a good time. But by time for morning intermission, the older pupils had begun to get anxious. Could it be possible that the teacher really did not mean to treat? At noon he was still out, walking up and down the playground, clapping his hands together, stamping his feet, and rubbing his ears to keep warm. We were anxious and earnest now. The wood box was empty and the fire was getting low. There was no water in the water bucket, and some of the younger children were coaxing for drinks. No teacher in our recollection had ever refused to treat. There was an old rule that if the teacher persisted in refusing to treat, he was to be ducked in the nearest stream of water. We had heard of instances when this had been done, but no one wanted to try it. 
The older pupils stood around in frightened little groups, and some of the smaller children were crying openly when the teacher knocked loudly on the door and asked that the paper be handed out to him. But the paper had disappeared. We searched all over the room, but it was nowhere to be found. Again the teacher knocked and asked rather impatiently for the paper. Then William Orbison sat down at his desk and hurriedly prepared another paper and handed it out the window to the teacher. He looked at it in a puzzled way for a little bit, smiled a queer smile, and without a word signed the paper and handed it back to William. Then he was admitted and took up books, but all afternoon he kept smiling to himself as if he knew a joke on someone. We felt uneasy, though we didn't know why. After school that evening, my brother Truman asked William Orbison to let him see the paper the teacher had signed. When he read it, he gave a long whistle of astonishment. And what do you think William had done? In the fuss and excitement of writing out the second paper, he had omitted the word treat. The teacher had promised nothing. That explained his smiles. We were a disappointed lot of children, I can tell you. We shouldn't have any Christmas treat, for after the way the teacher had talked about treating, no one thought he would treat if he could help it, and here was a way out for him. The next day we were perfectly sure he did not intend to treat, for when William Orbison left out a word in his reading lesson, the teacher said, "'Watch yourself, William. Leaving out words is getting to be quite a habit with you.' Other years we could hardly wait till the day before Christmas. We wore our best clothes, and right after dinner we would speak pieces, have spelling and ciphering matches, sing songs, have our treat, and play games the rest of the afternoon. Lots of the older brothers and sisters would come to visit, and they would play with us, and the teacher would play too, and we would have lots of fun. But this year I should rather have stayed at home and watched the Christmas preparations at our house, for there wouldn't be much fun at school without any treat. It was a cold, windy morning, and Father took us to school in the sled. We had lessons in the morning as usual, and in the afternoon recitations and songs and a little play that the teacher had helped us get up. Truman gave Hamlet's soliloquy and did it very well, too, and Charlie had a piece, but he forgot all but the first verse. We were so interested that we didn't think about the treat, and you can imagine how surprised we were when the teacher, instead of dismissing us, said that we would now have an unexpected but very welcome visitor. The door opened, and in came old Santa Claus with a white beard and a red coat, and on his back the biggest bag. You should have seen our eyes pop. Of course it wasn't the really, truly Santa Claus who comes in the night and fills the stockings. Oh no, this was just a pretend Santa. He put his bag down on the teacher's platform, and after he had made a little speech, he opened it up. And what do you suppose was in that bag? Candy. Cream candy and chocolate drops and clear candy, red and yellow, shaped like animals and horns and baskets, such candy as we had never seen before, a sack for each pupil. As we went up one by one, the smallest first, to get our treat, Santa asked each one of us to recite something for him. The smaller children knew verses out of their readers, and some of us recited the pieces we had said earlier in the afternoon. But how we all laughed when Longford Henlon, who was the tallest boy in school, couldn't think of anything to say but, I had a little dog, his name was Jack, put him in the barn, he jumped through a crack. And now to bed, to bed, and go right to sleep. I've heard that if Santa Claus comes and finds children awake, he goes away and comes back later. That is, he means to come back later, but he has been known to get so busy he forgot to come back at all. So say your prayers and go to sleep. End of A Christmas Barring Out by Stella C. Shutter. Recording by Angela. Christmas Carol by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ring out, ye bells. All nature swells with gladness at the wondrous story. The world was lorn, but Christ is born to change our sadness into glory. Sing, earthlings, sing. Tonight a king hath come from heaven's high throne to bless us. The outstretched hand o'er all the land is raised in pity to caress us. Come at his call. Be joyful all, away with mourning and with sadness. The heavenly choir, with holy fire, Their voices raise in songs of gladness. The darkness breaks, and dawn awakes, Her cheeks suffused with youthful blushes. The rocks and stones in holy tones Are singing sweeter than the rushes. Then why should we in silence be, When nature lends her voice to praises, When heaven and earth proclaim the truth Of him 
for whom that lone star blazes. No, be not still, but with a will, strike all your harps and set them ringing. On hill and heath, let every breath throw all its power into singing. End of Christmas Carol by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Recording by Raven Notation RavenNotation.wordpress.com The Christmas Eve Burglary by Arnold Bennett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org lady dane said gee if that portrait stays there much longer you'll just have to take me off to pyre hill one of these fine mornings pyre hill is the seat of the great local hospital but it is also the seat of the great local lunatic asylum and when the inhabitants of the five towns say merely pyre hill they mean the asylum i do declare i can't fancy my food nowadays said lady dane and it's all that portrait she stared plaintively up at the immense oil painting which faced her as she sat at the breakfast table in her spacious and opulent dining-room sir jehoshaphat made no remark despite lady dane's animadversions upon it despite the undoubted fact that it was generally disliked in the five towns the portrait had cost a thousand pounds some said guineas and though not yet two years old it was probably worth at least fifteen hundred in the picture market for it was a cressage and not only was it a cressage it was one of the finest cressages in existence it marked the summit of sir jehoshaphat's career sir jehoshaphat's career was perhaps the most successful and brilliant in the entire social history of the five towns this famous man was the principal partner in dane brothers his brother was dead but two of sir g's sons were in the firm dane brothers were the largest manufacturers of cheap earthenware in the district catering chiefly for the american and colonial buyer they had an extremely bad reputation for cutting prices they were hated by every other firm in the five towns and to hear rival manufacturers talk one would gather the impression that sir g had acquired a tremendous fortune by systematically selling goods under cost they were also hated by between eighteen and nineteen hundred employees but such hatred however virulent had not marred the progress of sir g's career he had meant to make a name and he had made it the five towns might laugh at his vulgar snobbishness the five towns might sneer at his calculated philanthropy but he was nevertheless the best-known man in the five towns and it was precisely his snobbishness and his philanthropy which had carried him to the top moreover he had been the first public man in the five towns to gain a knighthood the five towns could not deny that it was very proud indeed of this knighthood the means by which he had won this distinction were neither here nor there he had won it and was he not the father of his native borough had he not been three times mayor of his native borough was not the whole northern half of the county dotted and spangled by his benefactions his institutions his endowments and it could not be denied that he sometimes tickled the five towns as the five towns likes being tickled there was for example the notorious sneed incident sneed hall belonging to the earl of chell lies a few miles south of the five towns and from it the pretty countess of chell exercises that condescending meddlesomeness which so frequently exasperates the five towns sir g had got his title by the aid of the countess interfering iris as she is locally dubbed shortly afterwards he had contrived to quarrel with the countess 
and the quarrel was conducted by sir g as a quarrel between equals which delighted the district sir g's final word in it had been to buy a sizable tract of land near sneed village just off the sneed estate and to erect thereon a mansion quite as imposing as sneed hall and far more up to date and to call the mansion sneed castle a mighty stroke iris was furious the earl speechless with fury but they could do nothing naturally the five towns was tickled it was apropos of the housewarming of sneed castle also of the completion of his third mayoralty and of the inauguration of the dane technical institute that the movement had been started primarily by a few toadies for tendering to sir g a popular gift worthy to express the profound esteem in which he was officially held in the five towns it having been generally felt that the gift should take the form of a portrait a local dilettante had suggested cressage and when the five towns had inquired into cressage and discovered that that genius from the united states was celebrated throughout the civilized world and regarded as the equal of velasquez whoever velasquez might be and that he had painted half the aristocracy and that his income was regal the suggestion was accepted and cressage was approached cressage haughtily consented to paint sir g's portrait on his usual conditions namely that the sitter should go to the little village in bedfordshire where cressage had his principal studio and that the painting should be exhibited at the royal academy before being shown anywhere else cressage was an r a but no one thought of putting r a after his name he was so big that instead of the royal academy conferring distinction on him he conferred distinction on the royal academy sir g went to bedfordshire and was rapidly painted and he came back gloomy the presentation committee went to bedfordshire later to inspect the portrait and they too came back gloomy then the academy exhibition opened and the portrait showing sir g in his robe and chain and in a chair was instantly hailed as possibly the most glorious masterpiece of modern times all the critics were of one accord the committee and sir g were reassured but only partially and sir g rather less so than the committee for there was something in the enthusiastic criticisms which gravely disturbed them an enlightened generation thoroughly familiar with the dazzling yearly succession of cressage's portraits need not be told what this something was one critic wrote that cressage displayed even more than his quote, customary astounding insight into character end quote another critic wrote that cressage's observation was as usual quote, calmly and coldly hostile end quote. another referred to the quote, typical provincial mayor immortalized for the diversion of future ages end quote. inhabitants of the five towns went to london to see the work for which they had subscribed and they saw a mean little old man with thin lips and a straggling grey beard and shifty eyes and pushful snob written all over him ridiculous in his gewgaws of office when you looked at the picture close to it was a meaningless mass of coloured smudges but when you stood fifteen feet away from it the portrait was absolutely lifelike amazing miraculous it was so wondrously lifelike that some of the inhabitants of the five towns burst out laughing many people felt sorry not for sir g but for lady dane lady dane was beloved and genuinely respected she was a simple homely sincere woman her one weakness being that she had never been able to see through sir g of course at the presentation ceremony the portrait had been ecstatically referred to as a possession precious for ever 
and the recipient and his wife pretended to be overflowing with pure joy in the ownership of it. It had been hanging in the dining-room of Sneed Castle about sixteen months when Lady Dane told her husband that it would ultimately drive her into the lunatic asylum. "'Don't be silly, wife,' said Sir G. "'I wouldn't part with that portrait for ten times what it cost.' This was, to speak bluntly, a downright lie. Sir G. secretly hated the portrait more than any one hated it. He would have been almost ready to burn down Sneed Castle in order to get rid of the thing. But it happened that on the previous evening, in conversation with the magistrate's clerk, his receptive brain had been visited by a less expensive scheme than burning down the castle. Lady Dane sighed. "'Are you going to town early?' she inquired. "'Yes,' he replied. "'I'm on the rotor to-day.' He was chairman of the borough bench of magistrates. As he drove into town, he revolved his scheme, and thought it wild and dangerous, but still feasible. 2. On the bench that morning, Sir G. shocked Mr. Sherratt, the magistrate's clerk, and he utterly disgusted Mr. Bourne, superintendent of the borough police. I do not intend to name the name of the borough, whether Bursley, Hanbridge, Knipe, Longshore, or Turnhill. The inhabitants of the five towns will know without being told. The rest of the world has no right to know. There had recently occurred a somewhat thrilling series of burglaries in the district, and the burglars, a gang of them was presumed, had escaped the solicitous attentions of the police. But on the previous afternoon an underling of Mr. Bourne's had caught a man who was generally believed to be wholly or partly responsible for the burglaries. The five towns breathed with relief and congratulated Mr. Bourne, and Mr. Bourne was well pleased with himself. The Staffordshire Signal headed the item of news, Smart Capture of a Supposed Burglar. The supposed burglar gave his name as William Smith, and otherwise behaved in an extremely suspicious manner. Now Sir G., sitting as Chief Magistrate in the police court, actually dismissed the charge against the man. Overruling his sole colleague on the bench that morning, Alderman Easton, he dismissed the charge against William Smith, holding that the evidence for the prosecution was insufficient to justify even a remand. No wonder that Mr. Bourne was discouraged, not to say angry. No wonder that that pillar of the law, Mr. Sherratt, was pained and shocked. At the conclusion of the case, Sir Jehoshaphat said that he would be glad to speak with William Smith afterwards in the magistrate's room, indicating that he sympathised with William Smith and wished to exercise upon William Smith his renowned philanthropy. And so, at about noon, when the court majestically rose, Sir G. retired to the magistrate's room, where the humble Alderman Easton was discreet enough not to follow him, and awaited William Smith. And William Smith came, guided thither by a policeman, to whom, in parting from him, he made a rude, surreptitious gesture. Sir G., seated in the armchair which dominates the other chairs round the elm table in the magistrate's room, emitted a preliminary cough. <clears throat> Smith, he said sternly, leaning his elbows on the table, you were very fortunate this morning, you know. And he gazed at Smith. Smith stood near the door, cap in hand. He did not resemble a burglar, who surely ought to be big, muscular, and masterful. He resembled an undersized clerk who has been out of work for a long time, but who has nevertheless found the means to eat and drink rather plenteously, he was clothed in a very shabby navy blue suit, frayed at the wrists and ankles, and greasy in front. His linen collar was brown with dirt, his fingers were dirty, his hair was unkempt and long, and a young and lusty black beard was sprouting on his chin. His boots were not at all pleasant. 
"'Yes, Governor,' Smith replied lightly, with a Manchester accent. "'And what's your game?' Sir G. was taken aback. He, the chairman of the borough bench and the leading philanthropist in the county, to be so spoken to. But what could he do? He himself had legally established Smith's innocence. Smith was as free as air, and had a perfect right to adopt any tone he chose to any man he chose. And Sir G. desired a service from William Smith i was hoping i might be of use to you said sir jehoshaphat diplomatically well said smith that's all right that is but none of your philanthropic dodges you know i don't want to lead a new life and i don't want to turn over a new leaf and i don't want to help in hand nor none of those things and what's more i don't want a situation i've got all the situation as i need but i never refused money nor beer neither never did and i'm forty years old next month i suppose burgling doesn't pay very well does it sir g boldly ventured william smith laughed coarsely it pays right enough said he but i don't put my money on my back governor i put it into a bit of public-house property when i get the chance it may pay said sir g but it is wrong it is very anti-social is it indeed smith returned dryly anti-social is it well i've heard it called plenty of things in my time but never that now i should have called it quite sociable like sort of making free with strangers and so on however he added i come across a cove once as told me crime was nothing but a disease and ought to be treated as such i asked him for a dozen of port but he never sent it ever been caught before sir g inquired not much smith exclaimed and this'll be a lesson to me i can tell you now what are you getting at governor because my time's money my time is sir g coughed once more sit down said sir g and william smith sat down opposite to him at the table and put his shiny elbows on the table precisely in the manner of sir g's elbows well he cheerfully encouraged sir g how should you like to commit a burglary that was not a crime said sir g his shifty eyes wandering around the room a perfectly lawful burglary what are you getting at william smith was genuinely astonished at my residence sneed castle sir g proceeded there's a large portrait of myself in the dining-room that i want to have stolen you understand stolen yes i want to get rid of it and i want uh, people to think that it has been stolen well why don't you stop up one night and steal it yourself and then burn it william smith suggested that would be deceitful said sir g gravely i could not tell my friends that the portrait had been stolen if it had not been stolen the burglary must be entirely genuine what's the figure said smith curtly figure what are you going to give me for the job give you for doing the job sir g repeated his secret and ineradicable meanness aroused give you why i'm giving you the opportunity to honestly steal a picture that's worth over a thousand pounds i dare say it would be worth two thousand pounds in america and you want to be paid into the bargain do you know my man that people come all the way from manchester and even london to see that portrait he told smith about the painting then why are you in such a stew to be rid of it queried the burglar that's my affair said sir g i don't like it lady dane doesn't like it but it's a presentation portrait and so i can't <laughs> you see mr smith and how am i going to dispose of it when i've got it smith demanded 
you can't melt a portrait down as if it were silver by what you say governor it's known all over the blessed world seems to me i might just as well try to sell the nelson column oh nonsense said sir g nonsense you'll sell it in america quite easily it'll be a fortune to you keep it for a year first and then send it to new york william smith shook his head and drummed his fingers on the table and then quite suddenly he brightened and said all right governor i'll take it on just to oblige you when can you do it asked sir g hardly concealing his joy to-night no said smith mysteriously i'm engaged to-night well to-morrow night no to-morrow i'm engaged to-morrow too you seem to be very much engaged my man sir g observed what do you expect smith retorted business is business i could do it the night after to-morrow but that's christmas eve sir g protested what if it is christmas eve said smith coldly would you prefer christmas day i'm engaged on boxing day and the day after not in the five towns i trust sir g remarked no said smith shortly the five towns is about so dry the affair was arranged for christmas eve uh, now sir g suggested uh, shall i draw your plan of the castle so that you can william smith's face expressed terrific scorn do you suppose he said as i haven't had plans of your castle ever since it was built what do you take me for i'm not a blooming excursionist i'm not i'm a business man that's what i am sir g was snubbed and he agreed submissively to all william smith's arrangements for the innocent burglary he perceived that in william smith he had stumbled on a professional of the highest class and this good fortune pleased him there's only one thing that riles me said smith in parting and that is that you'll go and say that after you'd done everything you could for me i went and burgled your castle and you'll talk about the ingratitude of the lower classes i know you governor three on the afternoon of the twenty fourth of december sir jehoshaphat drove home to sneed castle from the principal of the three dane manufactories and found lady dane superintending the work of packing up trunks he and she were to quit the castle that afternoon in order to spend christmas on the other side of the five towns under the roof of their eldest son john who had a new house a new wife and a new baby male john was a domineering person and being rather proud of his house and all that was his he had obstinately decided to have his own christmas at his own hearth grandpapa and grandmamma drawn by the irresistible attraction of that novelty a grandson though mrs john had declined to have the little thing named jehoshaphat had yielded to john's solicitations and the family gathering for the first time in history was not to occur round sir g's mahogany sir g very characteristically said nothing to lady dane immediately he allowed her to proceed with the packing of the trunks and then tea was served and the time was approaching for the carriage to come round to take them to the station when at last he suddenly remarked i shan't be able to go with you to john's this afternoon oh gee she exclaimed really you are tiresome why couldn't you tell me before i will come over to-morrow morning perhaps in time for church he proceeded ignoring her demand for an explanation he always did ignore her demand for an explanation indeed she only asked for explanations in a mechanical and perfunctory manner she had long since ceased to expect them sir g had been born like that devious mysterious incalculable and lady dane accepted him as he was she was somewhat surprised therefore when he went on 
I have some minutes of committee meetings that I really must go carefully through and send off tonight. And you know as well as I do there'll be no chance of doing that at John's. I've telegraphed to John. He was obviously nervous and self-conscious. There's no food in the house, sighed Lady Dane, and the servants are all going away except Callear, and he can't cook your dinner tonight. I think I'd better stay myself and look after you. You'll do no such thing, said Sir G. decisively. As for my dinner, uh, anything will do for that. The servants have been promised their holiday to start from this evening, and they must have it. I can manage. Here spoke the philanthropist with his unshakable sense of justice. So Lady Dane departed, anxious and worried, having previously arranged something cold for Sir G in the dining-room, and instructed Callear about boiling the water for Sir G's tea on Christmas morning. Callear was the under-coachman and a useful odd man. He it was who would drive Sir G to the station on Christmas morning, and then guard the castle and the stables thereof during the absence of the family and the other servants. Callear slept over the stables. And after Sir G had consumed his cold repast in the dining-room, the other servants went, and Sir G was alone in the castle facing the portrait. He had managed the affair fairly well, he thought. Indeed, he had a talent for chicane, and none knew it better than himself. It would have been dangerous if the servants had been left in the castle. They might have suffered from insomnia and heard William Smith, and interfered with the operations of William Smith. On the other hand, Sir G. had no intention whatever of leaving the castle uninhabited to the mercies of William Smith. He felt that he himself must be on the spot to see that everything went right and that nothing went wrong. Thus the previously arranged scheme for the servant's holiday fitted perfectly into his plans, and all that he had had to do was to refuse to leave the castle till the morrow. It was ideal. Nevertheless, he was a little afraid of what he had done, and of what he was going to permit William Smith to do. It was certainly dangerous, certainly rather a wild scheme. However, the die was cast, and within twelve hours he would be relieved of the intolerable incubus of the portrait. And when he thought of the humiliations which that portrait had caused him, when he remembered the remarks of his sons concerning it, especially John's remarks, when he recalled phrases about it in London newspapers, he squirmed and told himself that no scheme for getting rid of it could be too wild and perilous. And, after all, the burglary dodge was the only dodge, absolutely the only conceivable practical method of disposing of the portrait, except burning down the castle and surely it was preferable to a conflagration, to arson. Moreover, in case of fire at the castle, some blundering fool would be sure to cry, The portrait! The portrait must be saved! And the portrait would be saved. He gazed at the repulsive, hateful thing. In the centre of the lower part of the massive gold frame was the legend, Presented to Sir Jehoshaphat Dane, Knight as a mark of public esteem and gratitude, etc. He wondered if William Smith would steal the frame. It was to be hoped that he would not steal the frame. In fact, William Smith would find it very difficult to steal that frame, unless he had an accomplice or so. "'This is the last time I shall see you,' said Sir G. to the portrait. Then he unfastened the catch of one of the windows in the dining-room, as per contract with William Smith, turned out the electric light, and went to bed in the deserted castle. He went to bed, but not to sleep. It was no part of Sir G.'s programme to sleep. He intended to listen, and he did listen. And about two o'clock, precisely the hour which William Smith had indicated, 
he fancied he heard muffled and discreet noises. Then he was sure that he heard them. William Smith had kept his word. Then the noises ceased for a period, and then they recommenced. Sir G. restrained his curiosity as long as he could, and when he could restrain it no more, he rose and silently opened his bedroom window and put his head out into the nipping night air of Christmas. And by good fortune he saw the vast oblong of the picture, carefully enveloped in sheets, being passed by a couple of dark figures through the dining-room window to the garden outside. William Smith had a colleague then, and he was taking the frame as well as the canvas. Sir G. watched the men disappear down the avenue, and they did not reappear. Sir G. returned to bed. Yes, he felt himself equal to facing it out with his family and friends. He felt himself equal to pretending that he had no knowledge of the burglary. Having slept a few hours, he got up early and, half-dressed, descended to the dining-room just to see what sort of a mess William Smith had made. The canvas of the portrait lay flat on the hearth-rug, with the following words written on it in chalk, This is no use to me. It was the massive gold frame that had gone. Further, as was later discovered, all the silver had gone. Not a spoon was left in the castle. End of the Christmas Eve Burglary by Arnold Bennett Recording by Ruth Golding Christmas 2013Christmas in the Heart by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The snow lies deep upon the ground, and winter's brightness all around decks bravely out the forest sear with jewels of the brave old year. The coasting crowd upon the hill, with some new spirit seems to thrill, and all the temple bells a chime, ring out the glee of Christmas time. In happy homes the brown oak bough, vies with the red-gemmed holly now, and here and there, like pearls, there show the berries of the mistletoe. A sprig upon the chandelier Says to the maidens, come not here. Even the pauper of the earth Some kindly gift has cheered to mirth. Within his chamber, dim and cold, There sits a grasping miser old. He has no thought save one of gain, To grind and gather and grasp and drain. A peal of bells, a merry shout, assail his ear, he gazes out, upon a world to him all grey, and snarls, why, this is Christmas Day. No, man of ice, for shame, for shame, for Christmas Day is no mere name. No, not for you this ringing cheer, this festal season of the year. And not for you the chime of bells, From holy temple rolls and swells. In day and deed he has no part, Who holds not Christmas in his heart. End of Christmas in the Heart By Paul Lawrence Dunbar Recording by Raven Notation RavenNotation.wordpress.com A Christmas Sermon by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Sermon. By the time this paper appears, I shall have been talking for 12 months. 
and it is thought I should take my leave in a formal and seasonable manner. Valedictory eloquence is rare, and deathbed sayings have not often hit the mark of the occasion. Charles II, wit and skeptic, a man whose life has been one long lesson in human incredulity, an easygoing comrade, a maneuvering king, remembered and embodied all his wit and skepticism, along with more than his usual good humor in the famous, I'm afraid, gentlemen, I'm an unconscionable time a-dying. One, an unconscionable time a-dying. There's a picture, I'm afraid, gentlemen, of your life and of mine. The sands run out, and the hours are numbered and imputed. And the days go by, and when the last of these finds us, we have been a long time dying. And what else? The very length is something if we reach that hour of separation undishonored, and to have lived at all is doubtless, in the soldierly expression, to have served. There is a tale in Tacitus of how the veterans mutinied in the German wilderness, of how they mobbed Germanicus, clamoring to go home, and of how, seizing their general's hands, these old war-worn exiles passed his finger along their toothless gums. Sunt lacrimae rerum. This is the most eloquent of the songs of Simeon. And when the man has lived to a fair age, he bears his marks of service. He may have never been remarked upon the breach at the head of the army. At least he shall have lost his teeth on the camp bread. The idealism of serious people in this age of ours is of a notable character. It never seems to them that we have served enough. They have a fine impatience of their virtues. It were perhaps more modest to be stingily thankful that we are no worse. It is not only our enemies, those desperate characters. It is we ourselves who know not what we do. Thence springs the glimmering hope that perhaps we do better than we think, that to scramble through this random business with hands reasonably clean, to have played the part of a man or a woman with some reasonable fullness, to have often resisted the diabolic, and at the end, to be still resisting it, is for the poor human soldier to have done right well. To ask to see some fruit of our endeavor is but a transcendental way of serving for reward, and what we take to be contempt of self is only greed of hire. And again, if we require so much of ourselves, shall we not require much of others? If we do not genially judge our own deficiencies, is it not to be feared we shall be even stern to the trespasses of others? And he who, looking back on his own life, can see no more than that he has been unconscionably long a-dying, will he not be tempted to think his neighbor unconscionably long of getting hanged? It is probable that nearly all who think of conduct at all think of it too much. It is certain we all think too much of sin. We are not damned for doing wrong, but for not doing right. Christ would never hear of negative morality. Thou shalt was ever his word, with which he superseded thou shalt not. To make our idea of morality center on forbidden acts is to defile the imagination and to introduce into our judgments of our fellow men a secret element of gusto. If a thing is wrong for us, we should not dwell upon the thought of it, or we shall soon dwell upon it with introverted pleasure. If we cannot drive it from our minds, one thing of two. Either our creed is in the wrong and we must more indulgently remodel it, or else if our morality be in the right, we are criminal lunatics and should place our persons in restraint. A mark of such unwholesomely divided minds is the passion for interference with others. The fox without the tail was of this breed, but had, if his biographer is to be trusted, a certain antique civility now out of date. A man may have a flaw, a weakness, that unfits him for the duties of life, that spoils his temper, that threatens his integrity, or that betrays him into cruelty. It has to be conquered, but it must never be suffered to engross his thoughts. The true duties lie all upon the farther side and must be attended to with a whole mind so soon as this preliminary clearing of the decks has been effected. In order that he may be kind and honest, it may be needful he should become a total abstainer. Let him become so then, and the next day let him forget the circumstance. Trying to be kind and honest will require all his thoughts. A mortified appetite is never a wise companion. Insofar as he has had to mortify an appetite, he will still be the worse man. And of such and one a great deal of cheerfulness will be required in judging life, and a great deal of humility in judging others. 
and may be argued again that dissatisfaction with our life's endeavor springs in some degree from dullness. We require higher tasks because we do not recognize the height of those we have. Trying to be kind and honest seems an affair too simple and too inconsequential for gentlemen of our heroic mold. We had rather set ourselves to something bold, arduous, and conclusive. We had rather found a schism or suppress a heresy, cut off a hand or mortify an appetite. But the task before us, which is to co-endure with our existence, is rather one of microscopic fineness. And the heroism required is that of patience. There is no cutting of the Gordian knots of life. Each must be smilingly unraveled. To be honest, to be kind, to earn a little and spend a little less to make upon the whole a family happier for his presence, to renounce when that shall be necessary and not be embittered, to keep a few friends but these without capitulation above all, on the same grim condition to keep friends with himself. Here is a task for all that a man has of fortitude and delicacy. He has an ambitious soul who would ask more. He has a hopeful spirit who should look in such an enterprise to be successful. There is indeed one element in human destiny that not blindness itself can controvert. Whatever else we are intended to do, we are not intended to succeed. Failure is the fate allotted. It is so in every art and study. It is so above all in the continent art of living well. Here is a pleasant thought for the year's end and for the end of life. Only self-deception will be satisfied, and there need be no despair for the despairer. 2. But Christmas is not the only mile mark of another year moving us to thoughts of self-examination. It is a season from all its associations, whether domestic or religious, suggesting thoughts of joy. A man dissatisfied with his endeavors is a man tempted to sadness. And in the midst of the winter, when his life runs lowest and he is reminded of the empty chairs of his beloved, it is well he should be condemned to this fashion of the smiling face. Noble disappointment noble self-denial, are not to be admired, not even to be pardoned if they bring bitterness. It is one thing to enter the kingdom of heaven maim, another to maim yourself and stay without. And the kingdom of heaven is of the childlike, of those who are easy to please, who love and who give pleasure. Mighty men of their hands, the smiters and the builders and the judges, have lived long and done sternly and yet preserved this lovely character, and among our carpet interests and twopenny concerns, the shame were indelible if we should lose it. Gentleness and cheerfulness, those come before all morality. They are the perfect duties. And it is the trouble with moral men that they have neither one nor the other. It was the moral man, the Pharisee, whom Christ could not away with. If your morals make you dreary, depend upon it, they are wrong. I do not say give them up, for they may be all you have, but conceal them like a vice lest they should spoil the lives of better and simpler people. A strange temptation attends upon man to keep his eye on pleasures even when he will not share in them, to aim all his morals against them. This very year a lady, singular iconoclast, proclaimed a crusade against dolls, and the racy sermon against lust is a feature of the age. I venture to call such moralists insincere. At any excess or perversion of a natural appetite, their lyre sounds of itself with relishing denunciations, but for all displays of the truly diabolic envy, malice, the mean lie, the mean silence, the calumnious truth, the backbiter, the petty tyrant, the peevish poisoner of family life, their standard is quite different. These are wrong, they will admit, yet somehow not so wrong. There is no zeal in their assault on them. No secret element of gusto warms up the sermon. It is for the things not wrong in themselves that they reserve the choicest of their indignation. A man may naturally disclaim all moral kinship with the Reverend Mr. Zola or the hobgoblin old lady of the dolls, for these are gross and naked instances. And yet in each of us some similar element resides. The sight of a pleasure in which we cannot or else will not share moves us to a particular impatience. It may be because we are envious or because we are sad, or because we dislike noise and romping, being so refined, or because, being so philosophic, we have an overweighing sense of life's gravity. At least, as we go on in years, we are all tempted to frown upon our neighbor's pleasures. People are nowadays so fond of resisting temptations. Here is one to be resisted. They are fond of self-denial. 
Here is the propensity that cannot be too preemptorily denied. There is an idea abroad among moral people that they should make their neighbors good. One person I have to make good? Myself. But my duty to my neighbor is much more nearly expressed by saying that I have to make him happy, if I may. 3. Happiness and goodness, according to canting moralists, stand in relation of effect and cause. There was never anything less proved or less probable. Our happiness is never in our own hands. We inherit our constitution. We stand buffet among friends and enemies. We may be so built as to feel a sneer or an aspersion with unusual keenness, and so circumstanced as to be unusually exposed to them. We may have nerves very sensitive to pain, and be afflicted with a disease very painful. Virtue will not help us, and it is not meant to help us. It is not even its own reward, except for the self-centered and, I had almost said, the unamiable. No man can pacify his conscience. If quiet be what he want, he shall do better to let the organ perish from disuse, and to avoid the penalties of the law and the minor capitis diminuto of social ostracism, is an affair of wisdom, of cunning, if you will, and not of virtue. In his own life, then, a man is not to expect happiness, only to profit by it gladly when it shall arise. He is on duty here. He knows not how or why, and does not need to know. He knows not for what hire, and must not ask. Somehow or other, though he does not know what goodness is, he must try to be good. Somehow or other, though he cannot tell what will do it, he must try to give happiness to others. And no doubt there comes in here a frequent clash of duties. How far is he to make his neighbor happy? How far must he respect that smiling face so easy to cloud, so hard to brighten again? How far on the other side is he bound to be his brother's keeper and the prophet of his own morality? How far must he resent evil? The difficulty is that we have little guidance. Christ's sayings on the point being hard to reconcile with each other and, the most of them, hard to accept. But the truth of his teaching would seem to be this. In our own person and fortune, we should be ready to accept and to pardon all. It is our cheek we are to turn. Our coat we are to give away to the man who has taken our cloak. But when another's face is buffeted, perhaps a little of the lion will become us best. That we are to suffer others to be injured and stand by is not conceivable and surely not desirable. Revenge, says Bacon, is a kind of wild justice. Its judgments, at least, are delivered by an insane judge. And in our own quarrel, we can see nothing truly and do nothing wisely. But in the quarrel of our neighbor, let us be more bold. One person's happiness is as sacred as another's. When we cannot defend both, let us defend one with a stout heart. It is only in so far as we are doing this that we have any right to interfere. The defense of B is our only ground of action against A. A has as good a right to go to the devil as we to go to glory, and neither knows what he does. The truth is that all these interventions and denunciations and militant mongerings of moral half-truths, though they be sometimes needful, though they are often enjoyable, do yet belong to an inferior grade of duties. Ill-temper and envy and revenge find here an arsenal of pious disguises, this is the playground of inverted lusts. With a little more patience and a little less temper, a gentler and wiser method might be found in almost every case. And the knot that we cut by some fine, heady quarrel seen in private life or in public affairs by some denunciatory act against what we are pleased to call our neighbor's vices might yet have been unwoven by the hand of sympathy. To look back upon the past year, and to see how little we have striven and to what small purpose, and how often we have been cowardly and hung back, or temerarious and rushed unwisely in, and how every day and all day long we have transgressed the law of kindness. It may seem a paradox, but the bitterness of these discoveries, a certain consolation resides. Life is not designed to minister to a man's vanity. He goes upon his long business most of the time with a hanging head, and all the time like a blind child full of rewards and pleasures as it is, so that to see the day break or the moon rise, or to meet a friend, or to hear the dinner call when he is hungry, fills him with surprising joys. This world is yet for him no abiding city. Friendships fall through, health fails, 
Weariness assails him. Year after year, he must thumb the hardly varying record of his own weakness and folly. It is a friendly process of detachment when the time comes that he should go. There need be few illusions left about himself. Here lies one who meant well, tried a little, failed much. Surely that may be his epitaph, of which he need not be ashamed. Nor will he complain at the summons which calls a defeated soldier from the field, defeated, I, if he were Paul or Marcus Aurelius. But if there is still one inch of fight in his old spirit, undishonored, the faith which sustained him in his lifelong blindness and lifelong disappointment will scarce even be required in this last formality of laying down his arms. Give him a march with his old bones. There, out of the glorious sun-colored earth, out of the day and the dust and the ecstasy, there goes another faithful failure. From a recent book of verse, where there is more than one such beautiful and manly poem, I take this memorial piece. It says better than I can what I love to think. Let it be our parting word. A late lark twitters from the quiet skies and from the west. Where the sun, his day's work ended, lingers as in content. There falls on the old gray city an influence luminous and serene, a shining peace. The smoke ascends in a rosy golden haze. The spires shine and are changed. In the valley shadows rise, the lark sings on. The sun, closing his benediction, sinks and the darkening air thrills with a sense of the triumphing night, night, with her train of stars, and her great gift of sleep, so be my passing. My task accomplished and the long day done, my wages taken, and in my heart some late lark singing. Let me be gathered to the quiet west, the sundown splendid and serene, death. End of A Christmas Sermon Gift of the Magi by O. Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato Gift of the Magi by O. Henry one dollar and eighty-seven cents, that was all, and sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher, until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at eight dollars per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box, into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity, when its possessor was being paid thirty dollars per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to twenty dollars, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. 
She'd been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she'd calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she'd spend planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare, and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier-glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you've seen a pier-glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there are two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knees and made itself almost a garment for her, and then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still, while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sofroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran, and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked like Sofroni. "'Will you buy my hair?' asked Della. "'I buy hair,' said Madame. "'Take your hat off, and let's have a sight at the looks of it.' Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, in the next two hours, trip by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone, and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly, on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way to a little prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas, and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, 
and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock the coffee was made, and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain on her hand, and sat on a corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, "'Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty.' The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror nor any of the sentiments that she'd been prepared for, he simply stared at her fixedly, with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. "'Jim, darling,' she cried, "'don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast.' Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim laboriously, as if he'd not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. "'You say your hair is gone?' he said with an air almost of idiocy. "'You needn't look for it,' said Della. "'It's sold, I tell you. Sold and gone, too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered,' she went on with sudden serious sweetness. "'But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim?' Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He unfolded his Della. For ten seconds let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. "'Don't make any mistake, Dell,' he said, "'about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package you may see why you had me going for a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat. For they lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoiseshell, with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful, vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she tugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile, 
and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leaped up like a little cinched cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm, the dull precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. "'Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it.' Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. "'Dell,' said he, Let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents, being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat, who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that, of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. O oh, all who give and receive gifts, such as they, are the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. End of Gift of the Magi by O. Henry The Hard Times in Elfland by Sidney Lanier Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hard Times in Elfland Strange that the termagant wind should scold the Christmas Eve so bitterly. But wife and Harry the four-year-old, big Charlie, nimble wits and I, blithe as the wind was bitter, drew more frontward of the mighty fire where wise Newfoundland fan foreknew the heaven that Christian dogs desire. Stretched o'er the rug, serene and grave, huge nose on heavy paws reclined, with never a drowning boy to save, and warmth of body and peace of mind. And as our happy circle sat, the fire well capped the company. In grave debate or careless chat, a right good fellow mingled he. He seemed as one of us to sit, and talked of things above, below with flames more winsome than our wits, and coals that burned like love aglow. While thus our rippling discourse rolled, smoothed down the channel of the night, we spoke of time, thereat one told, a parable of the season's flight. Those seasons out, we talked of these, and I, with inward purpose sly, to shield my purse from Christmas trees and stockings, and wild robbery, when Hal and nimble wits invade my cash in Santa Claus's name. In full the hard, hard times surveyed, denounced all waste as crime and shame, hinted that waste might be a term, including skates, velocipedes, kites, marbles, soldiers, towers infirm, bows, arrows, cannon, Indian reeds, cap pistols, drums, mechanic toys, and all the infernal host of horns, whereby to strenuous hells of noise are turned the blessed Christmas morns. Thus roused, those horns, to sacred rage, I rose, forefinger high in air. When Harry cried, some water wage, Papa, is hard times everywhere? Maybe in Santa Claus's land it isn't hard times none at all. Now, blessed vision, to my hand, most pat, a marvel strange did fall. Scarce had my Harry ceased, when, look, he cried, leapt up in wild alarm, ran to my comrade, shelter took beneath the startled mother's arm, and so was still. What time we saw, a foot hang down the fireplace, then, with painful scrambling, scratched and raw, 
Two hands that seemed like hands of men, Eased down two legs and a body through the blazing fire, And forth there came before our wide and wondering view, A figure shrinking half with shame and half with weakness. Sir, I said, but with a mien of dignity. The seedy stranger raised his head. My friends, I'm Santa Claus, said he. But oh, how changed! That rotund face, the new moon rivalled, pale and thin. Where once was cheek, now empty space. What e'er stood out, did now stand in. His piteous legs scarce propped him up. His arms mere sickles seemed to be. But most o'erflowed our sorrow's cup. When that we saw, or did not see, his belly, we remembered how it shook like a bowl of jelly fine. An earthquake could not shake it now. He had no belly, not a sign. Yes, yes, old friends, you well may stare. I have seen better days, he said. But now with shrinkage, loss and care, your Santa Claus scarce owns his head. We've had such hard, hard times this year for goblins. Never knew the like. All Elfland's mortgaged, and we fear that gnomes are just about to strike. I once was rich and drowned in hail. The whole world called me Jolly Brick. But listen to a piteous tale, young Harry. Santa Claus is sick. Twas thus a smooth-tongued railroad man comes to my house and talks to me. I've got, says he, a little plan that suits this nineteenth century. Instead of driving as you do, six reindeer slow from house to house, let's build a grand trunk railway through from here to Earth's last terminus. We'll touch at every chimney top, an elevated track, of course. Then, as we whisk you by, you'll drop each package down. Just think the force you'll save, the time. Besides, we'll make our millions. Look, you, soon we will compete for freight, and then we'll take Dame Fortune's bales of good nil. Why, she's the biggest shipper, sir, that e'er did business in this world. Then death, that ceaseless traveller, shall on his rounds by us be whirled. When ghosts return to walk with men, we'll bring em cheap, by steam and fast. We'll run a branch to heaven, and then we'll riot man, for then at last we'll make with heaven a contract fair to call each hour from town to town, and carry the dead folk's souls up there, and bring the unborn babies down. The plan seemed fair. I gave him cash. Nay, every penny I could raise. My wife ear cried, "'Tis rash, tis rash! How could I know the stock-thief's ways? But soon I learned full well, poor fool. My woes began that wretched day. The president plied me like a tool, in lawyer's fees and rights of way. Injunctions, leases, charters, I was meshed as in a mighty maze. The stock ran low, the talk ran high, then quickly flamed the final blaze. With never an inch of track, tis true, the debts were large, the oft-told tale. The president rolled in splendour new. He bought my silver at the sale. Yes, sold me out. We've moved away. I've had to give up everything. My reindeer, even, whom I pray, excuse me. Here, o'er oh, sorrowing, poor Santa Claus burst into tears, then calmed again. My reindeer fleet, I gave them up. On foot, my dears, I now must plod through snow and sleet. Retrenchment rules in Elfland now. Yes, every luxury is cut off. Which, by the way, reminds me how I caught this dreadful hacking cough. I cut off the tail of my Ulster furred, To make young Chris a coat of state. That very night the storm occurred, Thus we become the sport of fate. For I was out till after one, Surveying chimney-tops and roofs, And planning how it could be done, Without any reindeer's bouncing hoofs. My dear, says Mrs. Claus that night, a most superior woman she. It never, never can be right that you, deep sunk in poverty, this year should leave your poor old bed and trot about bent down with toys. 
There's Chris a-crying now for bread, To give to other people's boys. Since you've been out, the news arrives, The else insurance company's gone. Ah, oh, claws, those premiums, Now our lives depend on yours. Thus griefs go on. And even while you're thus harassed, I do believe, if out you went, You'd go, in spite of all that's past, To the children of that president. O oh, Charlie, Harry, Nimblewits, These eyes that night ne'er slept a wink, My path seemed honeycombed with pits, Nought could I do but think and think. But with the day my courage rose, Ne'er shall my boys, my boys, I cried, When Christmas morns their eyes unclose, Find empty stockings gaping wide. Then hewed and whacked and whittled I, The wife, the girls, and Chris took fire. They spun, sewed, cut, till by and by We made, at home, my pack entire. He handed me a bundle here. Now hoist me up, there, gently quick. Dear boys, don't look for much this year. Remember, Santa Claus is sick. End of the Hard Times in Elfland by Sidney Lanier From In the Yule Log Glow, Book 4 by Harrison S. Morris Recorded by Lucy Perry in Bath on November 29, 2013das kleine Mädchen mit den Schwefelhölzern bei Hans Christian Andersen Red in German This is a LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Das kleine Mädchen mit den Schwefelhölzern Es war fürchterlich kalt Es schneite und begann dunkler Abend zu werden Es war der letzte Abend im Jahre Neujahrsabend In dieser Kälte und in dieser Finsternis ging ein kleines, armes Mädchen mit bloßem Kopf und nackten Füßen auf der Straße. Es hatte freilich Pantoffeln gehabt, als sie von zu Hause wegging. Aber was half das? Es waren sehr große Pantoffeln. Ihre Mutter hatte sie zuletzt getragen, so groß waren sie. Diese verlor die Kleine, als sie sich beeilte, über die Straße zu gelangen, in dem zwei Wagen gewaltig schnell daherjagten. Der eine Pantoffel war nicht wieder zu finden, und mit dem anderen lief ein Knabe davon, der sagte, er könne ihn als Wiege benutzen, wenn er selbst einmal Kinder bekomme. Da ging nun das arme Mädchen auf den bloßen kleinen Füßen, die ganz rot und blau vor Kälte waren. In einer alten Schürze hielt sie eine Menge Schwefelhölzer und einen Bund trug sie in der Hand. Niemand hatte ihr während des ganzen Tages etwas abgekauft. Niemand hatte ihr auch nur einen Dreier geschenkt. Hungrig und halber Freund schlich sie einher und sah sehr gedrückt aus, die arme Kleine. Die Schneeflocken fielen in ihr langes, gelbes Haar, welches sich schön um den Hals lockte. Aber am Brach dachte sie freilich nicht. In einem Winkel zwischen Häusern, das eine sprang etwas weiter in die Straße vor als das andere, da setzte sie sich und kauerte sich zusammen. Die kleinen Füße hatte sie fest angezogen, aber es fror sie noch mehr, und sie wagte nicht nach Hause zu gehen, denn sie hatte ja keine Schwefelhölzer verkauft, nicht einen einzigen Dreier erhalten. Ihr Vater würde sie schlagen, und kalt war es daheim auch. Sie hatte nur das Dach gerade über sich, und da pfiff der Wind herein, obgleich Stroh und Lappen zwischen die größten Spalten gestopft waren. Ihre kleinen Hände waren vor Kälte fast erstarrt. Ach, ein Schwefelhölzchen könnte gewiss recht gut tun. Wenn sie es nur wagen dürfte, eins aus dem Bunde herauszuziehen, es gegen die Wand zu streichen und die Finger daran zu wärmen. Sie zog eins heraus. Ritsch, wie sprühte es, wie brannte es. Es gab eine warme, helle Flamme wie ein kleines Licht, als sie die Hand darum hielt. Es war ein wunderbares Licht. Es kam dem kleinen Mädchen vor, als sitze sie vor einem großen, eisernen Ofen mit Messingfüßen und einem messingenen Aufsatz. Das Feuer brannte ganz herrlich darin und wärmte schön. Die Kleine streckte schon die Füße aus, um auch diese zu wärmen. Da erlosch die Flamme, der Ofen verschwand. Sie saß mit einem kleinen Stumpf des ausgebrannten Schwefelholzes in der Hand. Ein neues wurde angestrichen, es brannte, es leuchtete, und wo der Schein desselben auf die Mauer fiel, wurde diese durchsichtig wie ein Flor. Sie sah gerade in das Zimmer hinein, wo der Tisch mit einem glänzend weißen Tischtuch mit feinem Porzellan gedeckt stand, und herrlich dampfte eine mit Pflaumen und Äpfeln gefüllte, gebratene Gans darauf. Und was noch prächtiger war, 
Die Gans sprang von der Schüssel herab, watschelte auf dem Fußboden hin mit Messer und Gabel im Rücken. Gerade auf das arme Mädchen kam sie zu. Da erlosch das Schwefelholz, und nur die dicke, kalte Mauer war zu sehen. Sie zündete ein neues an. Da saß sie unter einem der schönsten Weihnachtsbäume. Der war noch größer und aufgeputzter als der, welchen sie zu Weihnachten durch die Glastür bei dem reichen Kaufmann erblickt hatte. Viel tausend Lichter brannten auf den grünen Zweigen, und bunte Bilder wie die, welche die Ladenfenster schmückten, schauten zu ihr herab. Die Kleine streckte die beiden Hände in die Höhe. Da löschte Schwefelholz. Die vielen Weihnachtslichter stiegen höher und immer höher. Nun sah sie, dass es die kleinen Sterne am Himmel waren. Einer davon fiel herab und machte einen langen Feuerstreifen am Himmel. »Nun stirbt jemand«, sagte die Kleine, denn ihre alte Großmutter, welche die einzige war, die sie lieb gehabt hatte, die jetzt aber tot war, hatte gesagt. »Wenn ein Stern fällt, so steigt eine Seele zu Gott empor.« Sie strich wieder ein Schwefelholz gegen die Mauer, es leuchtete ringsumher, und im Glanze desselben stand die alte Großmutter, glänzend mild und lieblich da. »Großmutter«, rief die Kleine, »und nimm mich mit. Ich weiß, dass du auch gehst, wenn das Schwefelholz ausgeht, gleich wie der warme Ofen, der schöne Gänsebraten und der große, herrliche Weihnachtsbaum.« Sie strich eiligst den ganzen Rest der Schwefelhölzer, welche noch im Bunde waren. Sie wollte die Großmutter recht festhalten und die Schwefelhölzer erleuchteten mit solchem Glanz, dass es heller war als am lichten Tage. Die Großmutter war nie so schön, so groß gewesen. Sie hob das kleine Mädchen auf ihren Arm, und in Glanz und Freude flogen sie in die Höhe. Da fühlte sie keine Kälte, keinen Hunger, keine Furcht. Sie war bei Gott. Aber im Winkel am Hause saß in der kalten Morgenstunde das kleine Mädchen mit roten Wangen, mit lächelndem Munde, tot, erfroren am letzten Abend des alten Jahres. Der Neujahrsmorgen ging über die kleine Leiche auf, welche mit Schwefelhölzern dasaß, wovon ein Bund fast verbrannt war. Sie hat sich wärmen wollen, sagte man. Niemand wusste, was sie Schönes erblickt hatte, in welchem Glanze sie mit der alten Großmutter zur Neujahrsfreude eingegangen war. End of Das kleine Mädchen mit den Schwefelhölzern bei Hans Christian Andersen Red bei Ellie in Oktober 2013Here we carouse, singing like them, perched round the stem of the jolly old tree. Here let us sport, boys, as we sit, laughter and wit flashing so free. Life is but short. When we are gone, let them sing on round the old tree. Evenings we knew, happy as this, faces we miss, pleasant to see. Kind hearts and true, gentle and just, peace to your dust, we sing round the tree. Care like a dun lurks at the gate. Let the dog wait. Happy will be. Drink every one. Pile up the coals. Fill the red bowls round the old tree. Drain we the cup. Friend, art afraid? Spirits are laid in the Red Sea. Mantle it up. Empty it yet. Let us forget round the old tree. Sorrows begone. Life and its ills, duns and their bills, bid we to flee. Come with the dawn, blue devil sprite. Leave us tonight round the old tree. End of the Mahogany Tree by William Makepeace Thackeray. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Major Pendallus, A Christmas Story by Frank R. Stockton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. On December the 24th, 1880, I was standing in a little American country railway station in a state of perplexity. Near me, sitting in a chair by the stove, was a young lady, also in a state of perplexity. Facing us both stood the station master, who had been in a state of perplexity, but was getting out of it. "'Just you wait here ten minutes,' he said, 
and I'll see what I can do for you. And putting on a fur cap and an ulster, he went out of doors. The state of the case was this. Miss Weldon, the lady by the stove, was on her way to join a Christmas party at the house of her uncle, Mr. Dolliver, some seven miles from the station, and I, invited to the same house, had been delighted to meet her on the train. We were good friends, and had studied art together in Paris. When we left the city in a morning train, a little snow was beginning to fall, and as we journeyed northward we found the snowfall heavier and heavier, and we had arrived at this little village of Boynton at three o'clock in the afternoon, an hour behind time. From Boynton to the Dolliver house we were to go by a stagecoach, but the stage-driver had left more than an hour previously, hurrying away before his ordinary time of starting, for fear the road would be blocked up before he could get to his home a good twelve miles away, and assuring himself that there would be no passengers for him on such a day. It was reasonable enough that we should be perplexed, for we could not see, nor at first could the station-master see, how we were to get to our journey's end that day. If we would wait until next day, he told us, the stage-driver would be back in a sleigh. He said he would be sure to come for Christmas packages, if not for passengers. But we could not wait until next day. It would be better to return to the city in the next down train, if happily one should come. We could not hope that the Dollivers would send for us, for if they saw the stage pass without stopping, they would be sure we had not come by the train. The station-master was a good man, and did his best to get us out of our trouble. He had doubts about another train coming down that day. It was a branch road, was one track and he thought it would be a great pity if the Dollivers should be deprived of the company of two of their Christmas guests. A lot of them had come up the day before. Nobody in the village made a business of hiring out vehicles or carrying passengers, but an idea had struck the station-master, and he had gone out to see what he could do with it. In about a quarter of an hour he returned. "'Well, sir,' he said, "'there is just one thing you can do.' There isn't anybody in this village who will go to Dolliver's today, for there is no chance of getting back tonight. But the man who keeps the store here, Mr. Peter Chase, has got a horse and sleigh, and if you choose to hire that of him and do your own driving, I think you can get it if you are willing to pay him something extra, for he'll have to send a man over tomorrow with the stage driver to bring it back. And besides, in rough times like these, people always charge something extra. I put the matter before Miss Weldon, and she did not hesitate to say that rather than take the risk of being obliged to remain in the village, where there were no accommodations for strangers, she would take the risk of letting me drive her to the Dollivers. It is only seven miles, she said, and if the horse is good enough, I don't see what there is to happen. I tramped through the snow to Peter Chase's store, and quickly arranged with him for the hire of his horse and sleigh. Five dollars may seem a good deal, sir,' he said, for a trip like that, "'but this is a pretty deep snow, and we all ought to remember that Christmas comes but once a year. I'll have the sleigh round at the station in ten minutes.' In half an hour a little sleigh, drawn by a big brown horse, came up to the back door of the station. "'I would have been here sooner,' said Mr. Chase, "'but it was a good while before I could find the bells, and I knowed you wouldn't want to take a Christmas sleigh-ride without bells.' I did not complain of the delay, although I had been getting dreadfully impatient. The station-master had had a telegram from up the line, stating that a down-train with a snow-plough was on its way, and I was very much afraid that Miss Weldon would conclude to wait and take this train back to the city, so without loss of time we bundled in. The Christmas-minded Mr. Chase had brought two heavy fur robes, our valises were packed in behind, the sleigh being of the box variety, and we were ready. "'There is no mistake in the way,' said Mr. Chase. "'You go straight ahead until you come to the house.' 
which I know perfectly well, added Miss Weldon, and away we jingled. The snow was still falling, but we did not mind that, and now that we had started off, I was glad that Mr. Chase had waited to find the bells. Their merry little jingle suited my spirits well. A jolly sleigh ride with Clara Weldon was more enjoyment than I had counted on for this Christmas. A young man and a young woman, both of lively dispositions, good friends, fellow workers, and nothing more, are much more likely to have a merry time in a case like this than if they were a pair of lovers, or even if one of them were a lover. True love implies a certain seriousness, and is not infrequently conducive to demureness. The snow was deep on the road, and sometimes drifted, but the sleigh went through it well enough. The horse, however, probably not a very good traveller on the best of roads, made but slow progress. But although he was an animal of deliberate action, possessing, as Miss Weldon thought, an aesthetic turn of mind which made him object to destroy the virgin smoothness of the snow with his great hoofs, he was strong, and that was the main point. With reason to believe that we should safely reach our journey's end, it did not trouble me that we were making that journey slowly, and my companion appeared to be of my way of thinking. The beauty of the snow-decorated forests, fields, and hills was enough to make our artist heart satisfied, even if the horse should decline to do more than walk. It began to grow dark, and we had not reached the hospitable mansion to which we were bound, but there was a beautiful weirdness in the snow scenes softened by the dusky light, and our hearts and the bells were still merry. But as it grew darker and darker, we both began to wish that we stood in the light and warmth of the Dolliver house. I whipped the horse who made a few bounds through the snow, and then relapsed into his former trot. It was of no use to try to hurry him. Several times Miss Weldon had assured me that she was not in the least anxious, and that she was sure we should now reach the house in a very short time. I think she was about to say something of the kind again, when suddenly she exclaimed, in a voice that had a ring of hearty cheerfulness in it, very different from her previous expressions of thoughtful encouragement, "'Here it is! Didn't I tell you? We are at the very gate!' Sure enough, there was the gate with a lamp on one of the posts, and there, in the midst of its whitened grounds, was the house, its windows lighted, and a lamp on the piazza. When I pulled up to the door, I attempted to bound from the sleigh, but my bound was a poor one, for I found my legs were somewhat stiffened by the cold. As I helped Miss Weldon to alight, I could perceive she was not nearly so active as I had generally known her. The door opened before we had time to reach it, and an elderly woman with a Christmassy look about her, which was absolutely warming, stood in the broad portal. We stopped on the piazza before entering, stamping and shaking ourselves, for we were two figures of snow. "'Our valises are in the back of the sleigh,' I said, and to my surprise my teeth chattered a little as I spoke. "'I think the horse will stand until someone takes him.' We then went in. Suddenly Miss Weldon stopped and looked from right to left, and turning to the good woman she exclaimed, this is not Mr. Dolliver's house. Of course not, said the other. Did you think it was? Major Pendallus lives here. Miss Weldon and I looked at each other in dismay. We have made a mistake, I said. How much further on is it to the Dolliver place? It isn't farther on at all, the woman replied. It is not on this road at all. "'It is too bad,' I said. "'They told us at Boynton it was a straight road, and we could not miss it.' "'So it is. But three miles below here there is a fork that anybody might mistake, especially at night with the roads unbroken. But come in and get warm. You must be half frozen. 
I'll have a man throw a blanket over the horse. And with this she showed us into a large room with a wood fire blazing on the hearth. She pushed two chairs before the fire. Sit down, she said, and get a little warm. If I am not mistaken, this is Miss Clara Weldon. Yes, I thought so. It's been a long time since I have seen you. I am Mrs. Bardsley. I keep house for Major Pendallus. Excuse me for a moment. What a grand thing this fire is, said I. And who is Major Pendallus? I never saw him in my life, said Miss Weldon, following my example and drawing up closer to the fire. But I have often heard of him. He used to be in the army, I think, and now he has a stock farm and has all sorts of fine horses and cows. I wonder if he would be willing to send over to my uncle's. I can't bear to think of starting out again in that sleigh and with that horse. I was glad she did not include the driver in her objections, and said I hoped that the Major would be able to do something for us. But at the time I did not give much thought to the subject, for my whole soul was occupied in revelling in the genial heat. I had had no idea that I was so cold. In about five minutes the door opened, and a tall, broad-shouldered man, wearing a heavy pea-jacket and an unmistakable air of being the master of the house, entered the room. He was middle-aged, had side-whiskers and bright blue eyes. We both rose, and with outstretched hand he greeted Miss Weldon. "'Delighted to see you,' he said in a hearty tone. "'Mrs. Bardsley tells me you have lost your way, but that doesn't matter. I'll make that all right.' Then he turned towards me, and Miss Weldon introduced me. "'Ashmead?' he repeated as he grasped me by the hand. "'Yes,' I replied. "'Henry G. Ashmead.' As I spoke, he gave me a quick look, and seemed about to say something in reference to my name— but he checked himself and urged us to sit down again. "'What you must do now is to get warm, get warm,' he said, and he put two great logs on the fire. With a few quick questions and without sitting down, he made himself acquainted with the situation. For a moment he gazed down upon us, and then he said, "'The first thing to do, now that you are a little thawed, is to get off your coats and wraps.' "'That is hardly worth while,' I replied, "'for as soon as we are well warmed we must get on in some way or other to the Dolliver House.' "'Sir,' said Major Pendallus, "'there is no Dolliver House for you to-night. Here you are, and here you stay. It is three miles back to the main road, and then you would have two miles more to go, and before you reach the Dolliver House there is a long hollow.' and at this present moment the snow is probably drifted five feet. If you had taken the right road, you most likely would have been in that snowdrift now. I have sleighs and teams enough, and no doubt I could pull you through, but it is blowing now as well as snowing, and I am not going to let a young lady go out into a storm like this, especially when she has had already as much as she is able to stand of that sort of thing. "'Your bags will be brought in and your horse put in the stable. "'Mrs. Bardsley will take charge of Miss Weldon. "'I'll attend to you, sir, and supper will be ready in half an hour.' "'And without waiting for an answer, he left the room. "'We looked at each other and laughed. "'That is just what I hoped he would do,' said Miss Weldon. "'I have had all the slaying I want for this day.' "'Good!' I cried, throwing off my overcoat. "'I feared I might have to persuade you.' "'That is really absurd,' she said, "'as if the storm and Major Pendallus were not quite enough.' In five minutes Miss Weldon had been carried off by the beaming Mrs. Bardsley, while Major Pendallus conducted me to a bedroom on the ground floor, in which I found a crackling wood fire. The house was a large one, and seemed to be lighted from top to bottom. We three sat down to a big round supper table, 
and as might have been expected the meal was bountiful hot and most grateful and cheery to the two storm-beaten travellers who had eaten nothing since breakfast except an unattractive luncheon on the train our host did most of the talking and we were well content to let him do it you cannot imagine he burst out as soon as we were seated how glad i am to have you two people here i expected to spend this christmas eve absolutely alone and i should have felt that for i never did anything of the kind before and from a boy i have thought more of christmas eve than of christmas day there is less of a strain in it on christmas day you feel as if you ought to be awfully jolly because if you don't you won't have another chance for a year on christmas eve one can be jolly without thinking of it if there are any shortcomings they can be made up next day last year my niece was with me and we had plenty of company but now she is married and cleared out utterly gone to europe with her husband and intends to stay there but the storm has been good to me let me give you a piece of this chicken sir and some butter this is christmas butter especially made from the cream of two cows both granddaughters of the great cavalier george the major's anticipation of a truly jolly christmas eve was interfered with by miss weldon who declared shortly after nine o'clock that she was so fatigued by her day's experiences that she would be obliged to bid us good night when she had gone the major and i each lighted a cigar and drew up before the big fire in the parlour i can't help being disappointed said he for i intended to get up a lot of games and have mrs bardsley and her daughter in they are very respectable people and at christmas time we always have them in at the games but bed is the best place for miss weldon after what she has pulled through this day and i am so rejoiced to have you both in the house that i shan't grumble it doesn't matter in the least that when the sun set to-day i had never seen either of you nor you me i know who you are and you know who i am at least miss weldon knows and that's enough but you don't know me i said indeed i do he exclaimed slapping one of his spread-out knees and leaning toward me i know you in the best kind of a way i have one of your pictures now don't go and say you are not the artist henry g ashmead i am that man i replied i didn't doubt it said the major leaning back in his chair you look like it i am a bachelor sir and it takes a good deal to keep that sort of a man content and easy in his mind pictures and books help a lot in that way and i make it a point every year to buy a good picture i got one of yours last fall and i'm very fond of looking at it come with me and i'll show it to you the major then preceded me to a medium-sized room in the front of the house which he called his reading room it isn't a study said he for i never study and it isn't a library for it hasn't books enough for that but it is as good a room to read in as i know a fine light and always cool in summer there is the picture and he held up a lamp before one of my large landscapes i thought burnett owned that i exclaimed yes he did but he's been hard up lately and had to sell off part of his collection i snapped up that as soon as i saw it there are things in that picture that you seldom see in paintings that's timothy grass in that meadow and a cut about the end of june would make hay worth about twenty dollars a ton it's ready to cut now said he and from the looks of the leaves on the trees and the size of those mullein plants i should say it was in june that you took it i made my studies in june i replied good he cried i knew it there's no nonsense about that meadow such as you would see in most pictures no bushes and straggling briars or patches of red clover and orchard grass 
I'm a straightforward and practical man, and I like a straightforward and practical picture. Of course, you couldn't help the daisies, and no more can I in my own meadows. Now, then, said he, when we were again before the fire, you can see for yourself how I know you, and I can tell you that it delights me to have in my house the man who painted that picture. After a while, I'll brew a bowl of Regent's Punch, but it isn't late enough for that. We'll have a bachelor night of it. By next Christmas, I suppose, the young lady will put a veto on bachelor nights. Veto? said I. What do you mean? You will surely be married by next Christmas, he replied. Married? I exclaimed with a laugh. We have never thought of being married. The Major took his cigar from his mouth, put his hands upon his knees, leaned forward, and looked at me. Do you mean to say, sir, that you and Miss Weldon are not engaged to be married? Not at all, said I. We have known each other a long time, but we are friends and nothing more. Well, I'll be hanged, cried Major Pendallus, throwing away his cigar and rising abruptly from his chair. Then, standing with his back to the fire, he looked down upon me. Now I am disappointed. I surely thought you two were a team and a fine one. I had made up my mind to it, and now I am set back. I feel as if I were driving a big Percheron and a polo pony. I'm a practical common-sense man, and I don't mind asking practical common-sense questions. I have done that all my life, and though I have made a good many people mad, it has always been better for me in the end. Now, would you mind telling me if that young woman is engaged to somebody else, or if you are? Don't get angry. If anybody is angry, I ought to be. I was not in the least offended. There was an impetuous but kindly earnestness about the man which impressed me very agreeably. There are some people whose liberties are pleasant rather than otherwise. The Major was one of those people. I am not engaged, I said with a smile, and I have no reason to believe that she is. Major Pendallus thrust his hands into his trouser pockets, strolled to the other end of the large room, and then turning, came back and sat down. I believe, said he, that the man who lives alone does more thinking to the minute than other people. When she was pouring out the coffee tonight, and you were handing your cup to her, and both of you were laughing about the sugar, I stopped eating, and I said to myself, that is as perfect a match as I ever saw. And in regard to human beings, it is very seldom that I think that. And now you turn around and tell me that you and she go single. I could not help laughing at the serious way in which he discussed the subject. "'I am sorry to disappoint you,' said I. "'But Miss Weldon and I are not marrying people. For myself, I cannot afford matrimony.' "'That's what I once thought,' he said. "'And for thirty-five years I have regretted that I was foolish enough to think so.' It was plain that my host was a man of nervous temperament. He could not sit still while considering this subject evidently of deep interest to him. He now rose, folded his arms, and looked at me steadily for fully a minute. As he gazed at me, his eyes seemed to grow brighter and larger. It was my intention to make a business proposition to you founded on what you and Miss Weldon said about this part of the country and how much you liked it. I considered it one of the happiest thoughts I had ever had. What was it? I asked, a good deal amused, but careful not to show it. I shall be glad to hear it, whether I can accept it or not. All right, said the Major, seating himself with decision. You shall have it. 
I will make the proposition in the common-sense, straightforward manner in which I intended to make it. For over ten months I have been kicking and fuming at being obliged to live here in this lonely house. Tonight I said to myself over and over again, what would I give if these two would eat all their meals with me, would come here and live in this house? And then I said, why shouldn't they? He's a landscape painter, and they would want to live somewhere in the country, and are not likely to find any place more beautiful than this. Now, perhaps that's just what they want and what they're looking for, and the best thing you can do is to make them the offer without loss of time. While I was thinking of this, my spirits went up to about a hundred in the shade, but when you told me you were not an engaged couple, down they went. I don't know how far. What did you intend to offer? I asked. Offer? he said. Everything. I intended to put at your disposal, as soon after you married as you pleased, the handsomest room in the house, second floor front with a beautiful flower garden in summer directly under the side window. I would have given you the run of this house, reading room and everything, and made you feel at home. If the lady is a musician, I would have bought a new piano. If you are fond of riding or driving, my stables should have been at your service. I have to pay men to exercise the horses, and it would be a favour to me to have you do some of it. Moreover, I have a carriage house on the other side of my garden, which I do not use and I would have fitted it up as a studio for you, with a big north light and all conveniences. Then, again, if you would have liked to come here to spend your honeymoon, I would have vacated the place for a month and let you have it all to yourselves. For the accommodations I should have offered you, I should have charged you no more than what your living would cost me, certainly not over seven dollars a week each. For the rent of my studio— I should have asked you one landscape picture every year. I was most cheerfully impressed by the project thus laid before me. My dear sir, I exclaimed, you are generous indeed. Will you make me the same offer if I bring some other lady here as my wife? No, sir, cried the Major, striking his knee with his broad hand. No, sir, I will not. I know all about Miss Weldon, and I have formed a great fancy for her. I will run no risks with outside and unknown women. So saying, he rose abruptly to his feet, walked to a window, raised the shade, and looked out into the night. I remained gazing into the cheerful fire. The enthusiasm of this man had had a powerful effect upon me. I was actually thinking what a delightful thing it would be to marry Miss Weldon. It was not the first time that this thought had come into my mind, but it had always been promptly expelled. As I told my host, I was not a marrying man. At least I considered that my financial circumstances gave me no right to be one. But now the state of affairs seemed to be entirely changed. So far as pecuniary considerations were concerned, there was no reason why I should not be married to-morrow, and the perception of this fact set me in a glow. The Major now returned to the fire. "'Hello,' he cried. "'Your face looks as if you are getting converted.' "'It may be that I am,' I said. You are a powerful preacher. He stepped quickly towards me and clapped his hand upon my shoulder. Now, nah, he said, you are in the right road. Don't hesitate. Don't look to the right or the left. Don't stop to consider. Don't reason, but go straight ahead and ask that young woman to be your wife. The fact that you are beginning to feel converted shows that you want her. "'And, indeed, I should have a very small opinion of you if you didn't want her. "'Ask her to-morrow morning. "'Ask her here in this house, before you go into that crowd of Dolivers "'where you will have no chance at all. "'I'll see to it that you have every chance here.' 
Major, said I, rising, I have the greatest mind in the world to do it. You have put before me opportunities which I did not suppose to exist. You have stirred up feelings in me that I thought were long ago conquered and quieted. You have— Now, my dear boy, interrupted the Major, don't say another word. Go to your room while you are in this mind. Go to bed and go to sleep. Don't consider this or that or any other thing. Keep your mind on the one fact that you are going to propose to Miss Weldon in the morning. Above all, don't think about me. Don't imagine that perhaps I'm not going to suit your fancies. I will give you my word that if I don't suit or can't make myself suit, I'll clear out. I'll take the risk of all that. Very good, said I. I'll go to my room, for it is past country bedtime, and I'll keep my mind on the subject you have brought up before me. But what of that regent's punch you are going to brew? Not a drop, sir, not a drop, exclaimed the Major. When men want cheering up and have nothing to do afterward, a glass of punch on a winter night is a very good thing. But in a case like this, we want clear heads. Anybody can determine to marry almost anybody if he drinks enough punch. When I set out to drive a pair of horses in a storm or on a cold, chilly night, I never touch a drop of spirits. No matter how much I feel that I need warming up at such times, I want to be sharpened, not comforted. But when I get safely home, I mix myself a glass of something hot. Making up your mind at this time is much more important than driving any sort of horses in any kind of weather. The punch can wait until tomorrow, and if things turn out all right— I'll brew something out of the common, I assure you. In my bedroom that night I gave no time to deliberation. Before I bade the Major good night, I had made up my mind to propose to Miss Weldon. I was downstairs before breakfast the next morning, and I met the Major just coming in from a visit to his stables. Merry Christmas! he cried, and isn't this a glorious day, sun bright and sky clear. But the snow is about a foot deep on the level, and nobody knows how deep in the drifts. I have a Canadian in my employment who walks on snowshoes, and I have sent him across the country to the Dollivers to tell them where you are, and let them know that you will be there in the course of the afternoon. I'll send out some men with a double team of oxen and a snowplough to break the road, and after luncheon I'll drive you over myself. In the meantime, how are you going to spend the morning, sir? I laughed as I gazed into his earnest countenance. I am going to try to break a road into the region of matrimony, I replied. The Major's face shone like the morning sun. You're sound as a dollar! he exclaimed. After breakfast you two shall have this house to yourselves. I'll carry off Mrs. Bardsley and the rest of them to the Christmas present business in the big barn. I suppose you can get through in an hour. Oh, yes, I answered. Probably in less time. The Major was now called off, and I strolled into the reading room to look again at my picture. The room was full of the morning light, and as I turned to the wall on which my landscape hung, I stood with eyes and mouth open. The paper on the wall was one designed by Clara Weldon. I remembered when she was working on it in her studio. There was a tendril running through it which I had suggested. I clapped my hands and felt like bursting out with a shout of pure enjoyment, but I restrained myself. The breakfast bell rang, and as I went out, I closed the door behind me. Miss Weldon came down, refreshed and lovely, and as we exchanged Christmas salutations, I almost felt guilty in thinking of the conspiracy which we two men had hatched up against her, but I did not in the least swerve from my purpose. It was about an hour afterward, when Miss Weldon and I were sitting before a blazing fire in the parlour, 
that I declared my love for her, that I asked her to be my wife, and in the ardour which increased as I spoke, I told her everything. I laid before her the whole glowing picture which Major Pendallus had painted for me. When I began to speak, she looked at me in a quizzical way, as if she were amused at the sudden outcropping of my passion. But afterwards she began to listen with interest, as if it were due to me to give serious consideration to a matter which I urged so warmly, odd as it might be that I happened to be urging it just then. But when I told her what the Major had been talking about, her face flushed with indignation. "'It is a shame!' she exclaimed, "'that that man should disgust me in such a way. What right has he to meddle with my affairs or give advice concerning me? If I can do it, I will leave this house this instant.' "'You cannot do it,' I said, "'and I beg you will restrain your anger until I explain the case.' Major Pendallus takes a great interest in me on account of my work. You remember what he said at breakfast about my picture. He has taken— I don't care anything about his interest in you, she interrupted. I am thinking about myself. He has no right to take any interest in me, to discuss me. It is the most unwarrantable thing, the most— Please, do not say anything more against him, I implored. I first want you to look at my picture. It is one of the few you have not seen. I don't want to see anything he owns, she said sharply. But I beg of you to come and look at this, because I painted it. You may never have another chance, and I very much want you to see it. She had a kind heart, and angry as she was, she accompanied me to the reading room. As we stood before the picture, her eyes wandered away from it and over the wall. Then she turned and looked at me, and I looked at her, but said nothing. "'Do you suppose,' she asked presently, "'that he knew I designed this paper?' "'I am positive he does not,' I replied, "'for if he had known it he would certainly have mentioned it to me. And, beside, it is almost impossible that he should know it. "'It is wonderful,' she said in a softer tone. "'What do you make of it?' "'I make this,' I replied. "'The soul of that man is in sympathy with yours and with mine. "'The things we do touch his tastes and his sensibilities.' He covers his wall with your paper, and he hangs my picture upon it. He does not know either of us, but his soul is in sympathy with us. I think you can hardly say that he has no right to take an interest in you. She looked at me and smiled. That is all very pretty, she said, but rather sentimental. Not a bit too much so. I exclaimed. Clara, I think you cannot any longer be angry with our host, and having set him aside, will you not consider me? And consent to be a background to your work? she asked. There was a bright sparkle in her eye, which made me feel justified in gently closing the door. When Major Pendallus returned from the big barn, where, according to his custom, he had been making Christmas presents to all his people, he found Clara and me in the parlour. He approached us in a somewhat hesitating way, and as I looked around at him, I could see an expression on his countenance which looked like a fear that he had come back before I had gotten through with the business of the morning, or perhaps before I had begun it. But as we both rose to meet him, I still holding Clara's hand, all doubt vanished from his handsome, honest, weather-browned face. "'I know it!' he cried as he looked from one to the other of us. "'I know it! You needn't tell me anything!' And he stretched out a hand to each of us. "'This is a glorious Christmas!' 
he said. A glorious Christmas! It was plain he wanted to say a good deal, but could not find words. But Clara allowed no embarrassing silence. I have been very angry with you, Major, she said, with the kindest of smiles upon her still slightly flushed face. He looked at her inquiringly. It was because you were making all sorts of arrangements for me without my knowing a word about them. Oh, that was because he didn't understand about the wallpaper, I said. If he had known about that. About what? exclaimed Major Pendallus. We two laughed, and then we took him into the reading room. When all was explained to him, he exclaimed, Upon my word! And then, with his hands thrust deep into the pockets of his short coat, he turned about and deliberately gazed upon the four walls of the room. Truly, he cried, I can't take it in. To think that the two years I have been sitting in this room, surrounded by these warm, bright, delicate colours, these flowers of spring, these soft leaves, and these graceful spirals, this general impression of blossomy air, and then to think that you did it, I can't comprehend it. Why, I'll tell you, madam, when I went with my niece to a great city store where they had thousands of patterns of wallpaper, I picked out this one in ten minutes, and although there were a half-dozen others she fancied, I would have none but this for my reading room. It is the flowers and air of spring, I said, and I want to have it always around me. I thought I liked you, madam, on account of what I had heard of you, and because of looking at you and listening to you. But that wasn't all. No, that wasn't all. There was a moisture in Clara's eyes as she held out her hand to him. It is most marvellous and most charming, I said, and I can see only one objection to the state of affairs. The picture should have been Clara's and the background mine. Not a bit of it, exclaimed the Major. The picture can be taken down, it can be stolen. Lots of things can happen to it, and it occupies only a little space after all. But that beautiful wall is there, and it is here, and all around us, and here it will stay. It will last out my lifetime. And if any accidents happen to it, I've got a lot more of it upstairs. A servant now entered with a letter which had been brought over from the Dollivers by the man in snowshoes. It was written to Clara, and she read it to us. Our friends were evidently overjoyed that we had not remained in the city as they had supposed, and that we would soon be with them. They insisted that Major Pendallas should come over with us and spend the night. They had a large party of friends at the house, and were having a jolly time. "'Oh, I'll go,' said the Major. "'I intended to go anyway. But as to jolly times, the times they are having there are no more to compare with what we are having here than an ashman's donkey is fit to run a three-mile heat with my coat sapling. But we'll help to make them jolly. I'll take over the big silver punch bowl that I won four years ago and have not used yet, for I have never had people enough here to make it worth while. We'll christen the bowl on this happy day, and you, madam, shall have the first glass out of it. And now, continued the host, looking from the one to the other, before we do any more, or say any more, or think of anything else, I want you to tell me this. Are you two going to accept my proposition and coming to live with me? I don't say anything about winter time, because that may be asking too much, but in the time of the year you would want to live in the country, anyway. My dear Major, said Clara, we have been talking about your proposition, and I don't see how we can help accepting it. Good, cried the Major. Good, better, best. I remarked before that this is a glorious Christmas, and I repeat the statement. Look, you, the sun is beaming out of doors almost as brightly as we are beaming in here. 
there is a broad path cut to the stables and i want to show you a sorrel mare with the most beautiful tail and mane you ever saw i'm going to have her put into training to carry a lady and she is to be at your service madam whenever you want her and as for you sir there are my stables and if a beautiful country and fine horses help to make people happy i think you will have no fault to find early in the afternoon the major drove us over to the dollivers behind a pair of magnificent cleveland bays the grand action and spirit of the powerful animals fired by the delight of being out of doors on this sparkling winter day would have made clara tremble she said under ordinary circumstances but with the major holding the reins she felt as safe as if she were dashing through the white caps with an old cape cod skipper at the tiller that was a grand old christmas night at the dolliver house our hostess who was soon informed of what had happened in the morning urged that our engagement should be made known and when the punch bowl was christened and the first cupful of the major's wonderful brew was presented by him to clara there was an outburst of congratulation which deeply stirred the hearts of three of us and now said major pendallus let us drink the health of the blessed storm of christmas eve eighteen hundred and eighty and we drank it end of major pendallus a christmas story by frank r stockton recording by ruth golding christmas two thousand and thirteen Old Christmas by Mary Howitt. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Christmas. Now, he who knows Old Christmas, he knows a white of worth, for he's as good a fellow as any on the earth. He comes warm cloaked and coated, and buttoned to the chin, and ere he is a nigh the door. We ope to let him in. He comes with voice most cordial. It does one good to hear. For all the little children he asks each passing year. His heart is warm and gladsome, not like your griping elves, who, with their wealth in plenty, think only of themselves. He tells us witty stories. He sings with might and main. We ne'er forget his visit till he comes back again. With laurel green and holly we make the house look gay. We know that it will please him. It was his ancient way. Oh, he's a rare old fellow. What gifts he gives away. There's not a lord in England could equal him today. Good luck unto old Christmas. Long life now let us sing. He is more kind unto the poor than any crowned king. End of Old Christmas by Mary Howitt from In the Yule Log Glow, Book 4, by Harrison S. Morris, read by Lucy Perry, in Bath, on November 29th, 2013. The Perfect Reader, from Plum Pudding, by Christopher Morley, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perfect Reader by Christopher Morley On Christmas Eve, while the perfect reader sits in his armchair immersed in a book, so absorbed that he has let the fire go out, I propose to slip gently down the chimney and leave this tribute in his stocking. It is not a personal tribute, I speak on behalf of the whole fraternity of writers, this word of gratitude and envy. No one who has ever done any writing, or has any ambition toward doing so, can ever be a perfect reader. Such a one is not disinterested. He reads, inevitably, in a professional spirit. He does not surrender himself with complete willingness of enjoyment. He reads to see how the other fellow does it, 
to note the turn of a phrase, the cadence of a paragraph, carrying on a constant subconscious comparison with his own work. He broods constantly as to whether he himself, in some happy conjecture of quick mind and environing silence, and the perfect impulse, might have written something like that. He is, poor devil, confessedly selfish. On every page he is aware of his own mind running with him, tingling him with needle-pricks of conscience, for the golden chapters he has never written. And so his reading is, in a way, the perfection of exquisite misery, and his writing also. When he writes, he yearns to be reading. When he reads, he yearns to be writing. But the perfect reader, for whom all fine things are written, knows no such delicate anguish. When he reads, it is without any arrière-pensée, any twinging consciousness of self. I like to think of one perfect reader of my acquaintance. He is a seafaring man, and this very evening he is in his bunk, at sea, the day's tasks completed. Over his head is a suitable electric lamp. In his mouth is a pipe that has fine wire dark mahogany sheen that resides upon excellent briar of many years' service. He has had, though I speak only by guess, a rummer of hot toddy to celebrate the greatest of all evenings. At his elbow is a porthole, brightly curtained with a scrap of clean chintz, and he can hear the swash of the seas along his ship's tall side. And now he is reading. I can see him reading. I know just how his mind feels. Oh, the perfect reader! There is not an illusion that he misses. In all those lovely printed words he sees the subtle secrets that a lesser soul would miss. He, bless his heart, is not thinking how he himself would have written it. His clear, keen, outreaching mind is intent only to be one in spirit with the invisible and long-dead author. I tell you, if there is anywhere a return of the vanished, it is then, at such moments, over the tilted book held by the perfect reader. And how quaint it is that he should diminish himself so modestly. Of course, he says, I'm only a reader, and I don't know anything about writing. Why, you adorable creature, you are our court of final appeal. You are the one we come to, humbly, to know whether, anywhere in our miserable efforts to set out our unruly hearts in parallel lines, we have done an honest thing. What do we care for what most of the critics say? They, we know only too well, are not criticising us, but unconsciously themselves. They skew their own dreams into their comment, and blame us for not writing what they once wanted to. You we can trust, for you have looked at life largely and without pettifogging qualms. The parallel lines of our eager pages meet at infinity, that is, in the infinite understanding and judgment of the perfect reader. The enjoyment of literature is a personal communion. It cannot be outwardly instilled. The utmost the critic can do is read the marriage service over the reader and the book. The union is consummated, if at all, in secret. But now and then there comes up the aisle a new perfect reader, and all the ghosts of literature wait for him, starry-eyed, by the altar, and as long as there are perfect readers, who read with passion, with glory, and then speed to tell their friends, there will always be, ever and anon, a perfect writer. And so, dear perfect reader, a Merry Christmas to you and a new year of books worthy your devotion. When you revive from that book that holds you in spell, and find this little note on the cold hearth, I hope you may be pleased. End of The Perfect Reader by Christopher Morley Read by Carol Box The Pink Sweet Meat by Susan Coolidge Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Only three pairs of stockings were left in the shop. It was a very little shop indeed, scarcely larger than a stall. 
Job Took, to whom it belonged, was not rich enough to indulge in the buying of any superfluous wares. Every spring he laid in a dozen dozen of thin stockings, a bale of cheap handkerchiefs, a gross of black buttons, a gross of white, a little stationery, and a few other small commodities. In the autumn he added a dozen dozen of thick stockings, and a box full of mittens and knitted comforters. Besides these he sold penny papers and homemade yeast made by Mrs. Took. If the stock of wearables grew scant toward midwinter, Job rejoiced in his heart, but by no means made haste to replenish it. He just laid aside the money needed for the spring outfit, and lived on what remained. Thus it went year after year. Trade was sometimes a little better, sometimes a little worse, but whichever way it was, Job grew no richer. He and his old wife lived along somehow without coming on the parish for support and with this very moderate amount of prosperity they were content this year of which i write the supply of winter stockings had given out earlier than usual the weather had been uncommonly cold since october which may have been the reason certain it is that here at michaelmas with december not yet come in only three pairs of stockings were left in the little shop job took had told his wife only the week before, that he almost thought he should be forced to lay in a few dozen more. Folks seemed so eager to get him. But since he said that, no one had asked for stockings, as it happened, and Job, thinking that trade was, after all, pretty well over for the season, had given up the idea of replenishing his stock. One of the three pairs of stockings was a big pair of dark mixed gray. One pair, a little smaller, was white and the third, smaller still, and dark blue in color, was about the size for a child of seven or eight years old. Job Took had put up the shutters for the night, and had gone to bed. The stockings were talking together in the quiet darkness, as stockings will when left alone. One pair had been hung in the window. It had got down from its nail, and was now straddling carelessly with one leg on either side of the edge of the box in which the others lay as a boy might on the top of a stile. This was the big gray pair. "'Our chances seem to be getting slim,' he said gloomily. "'That is more than you seem,' replied the white stockings, in a tart voice. "'Your ankles are as thick as ever, and your mesh looks to me coarser than usual to-night.' "'There are worse things in the world than thickness,' retorted the gray stockings angrily. "'I'm useful. At any rate, I am.' while you have no wear in you i should say that you would come to darning about the second wash if not sooner is that my fault said the white pair beginning to cry no it's your misfortune but people as unfortunate as you are should mind their p's and q's and not say disagreeable things to those who are better off pray don't quarrel put in the little blues who are always peacemakers think of our situation the last survivors of twelve dozen we ought to be friends but as you say matters are getting serious with us of course we are all thinking about the same thing yes about the christmas and the chimney corner sighed the white pair what a dreadful thing it would be if we went to the rag bag never having held a christmas gift i could not get over such a disgrace my father my grandfather, all my relations had their chance. Some of them were even hung a second time. Yes, Christmas is woven into our substance, said the gray stockings. The old skeins and the revelings tell the story to the new wool, the story of the Christmas time. The very sheep in the fields know it. For my part, he added proudly, I should blush to lie in the same ash heap even with an odd stocking who had died under the disgrace of never being hung up for christmas and i will never believe that my lifelong dream is to be disappointed why will you use such inflated language snapped the white pair you were only woven last july as late as may you were running around the meadow on a sheep's back very well i don't dispute it i may not be as old as methuselah but long or short my life is my life and my dream is my dream 
and you have no call to criticize my expressions miss thundered the big pair there you are again said the little blues i do wish you wouldn't dispute now let us talk about our chances what day of the month is it the twenty-seventh of november said the gray stockings who because they hung over the penny papers in the window always knew the exact date little more than four weeks to the holidays said the white pair dolorously how i wish someone would come along and put us out of suspense and being bought mightn't do that suggested the little blues you might be taken by a person who had two pairs of stockings and the others might be chosen to be hung up such things do happen oh they wouldn't happen to me i think said the white pair vaingloriously as it happened the three pairs of stockings were all sold the very day after this conversation and all to one and the same person this was mrs wendt an englishwoman married to a dutch shipwright she had lived in holland for some years after her marriage but now she and her husband lived in london they had three children the stockings were very much pleased to be bought when job took rolled them up in paper and tied a stout pack thread round them they nestled close and squeezed each other with satisfaction besides the joy of being sold was a joy of keeping together and knowing about each other's adventures the first of these adventures was not very exciting it consisted in being laid away in the back part of a bureau drawer and carefully locked in now what is this for questioned the white stockings are we to stay here always yes that is just what i should like to know grumbled the big greys why of course not who ever heard of stockings being put away for always said the wise little blues wait patiently and we shall see i think it is some sort of a surprise but day after day passed and nothing happened surprising or otherwise till even the philosophical little blue stockings began to lose heart and hope at last one evening they heard the key click in the lock of the drawer a stream of light flashed into their darkness and they were seized and drawn forth well mother let us see thy purchase truly fine hosen they are said jacob went whose english was rather foreign yes replied his wife good handsome stockings they are and the children will be glad for their old ones are worn out the big pair is for wilhelm as thou knowest those must hang to the right of the stove the big gray pair cast a triumphant glance at his companions as he found himself suspended on a stout nail this was something like life the white are for greta and these small ones for little jan ah they are nice gifts indeed said mrs went rubbing her hands a fine christmas they will be for the children the stockings glowed with pleasure not only were they hung up to contain presents but they themselves were christmas presents this was promotion indeed hast thou naught else demanded jacob went of his wife no great things a kerchief for greta this comforter for wilhelm for the little one mittens that is all but it was not quite all for after her husband had gone to bed mrs went a tender look on her motherly face sought out a small screwed-up paper and with the air of one who is a little ashamed of what she is doing dropped into each stocking something made of sugar they were not sugar almonds they were not salem gibraltars which delightful confections are unfamiliar to london shops but irregular lumps of a nondescript character which were crumbly and sweet and would be sure to please those who do not often get a taste of candy it was of little jan that his mother had thought when she bought the sweet meats and for his sake she had yielded to the temptation though she looked upon it as an extravagance there were three of the sweetmeats two white one pink and the pink one went into jan's stockings mrs went had not said anything about them to her husband well this is satisfactory said the gray pair when mrs went had left the room and he was sure of not being overheard here we are all hanging together on christmas eve my dream is accomplished mine isn't said the white pair plaintively i always hoped that i should hold something valuable like a watch 
or a pair of earrings. It is rather a come-down to have nothing but a bit of candy inside, and a pocket handkerchief pinned to my leg. I don't half like it. It gives me an uncomfortable pricking sensation, like a stitch in the side. It's just as well for you to get used to it, put in the gray. It doesn't prick as much as a darning needle, I fancy, and you'll have to get accustomed to that before long, as I've remarked before. I'm the only one who has a pink sweetmeat, said the little blues, who couldn't help being pleased. And I'm for a real child. Wilhelm and Greta are more than half grown up. Real children are very hard on their stockings, I've always heard, retorted the white pair, who never could resist the temptation to say a disagreeable thing. Well, that may be, but it is all in the future. This one night is my own, and I mean to enjoy it replied the contented little blues. So the night went, and now it was the dawn of Christmas. With the first light the door opened softly, and a little boy crept into the room. This was Jan. When he saw the three pairs of stockings hanging by the stove, he clapped his hands together, but softly, lest the noise should wake the others. Then he crossed the room on tiptoe, and looked hard at the stockings. He soon made sure which pair was for himself, but he did not take them down immediately, only stood with his hands behind his back, and gazed at them with two large, pleased eyes. At last he put his hand up and gently touched the three, felt the little blue pair, gave it a pat, and finally unhooked it from its nail. Then he sat down on the floor, and began to put them on. His toe encountering an obstacle, he pulled the stocking off again, put his hand in, and extracted the pink sweetmeat, with which he was so pleased that he laughed aloud. That woke up the others, who presently came in. "'Ah, little rogue that thou art, always the first to awaken,' said his mother, pleased at his pleasure. "'See, mother, see what I found,' cried. "'It is good, sweet. I have tasted a crumb already. Take some of it, mother.' But Mrs. Vent shook her head. No, she said, I do not care for sugar. That is for little folks like thee. Eat it thyself, Jan. It was her saying this, perhaps, which prevented Wilhelm and Greta from making the same offer. At least, I hope so. Certain it is that neither of them made it. Greta ate hers up on the spot, with the frank greediness of a girl of twelve who does not often get candy. Wilhelm buttoned his up in his trousers pocket. All three made haste to put on the new stockings. The three pairs had only time to hastily whisper as they were separated. Tonight, perhaps, we may meet again. The pink sweetmeat went into the pocket of Jan's jacket, and he carried it about with him all the morning. He did not eat it, because once eaten it would be gone, and it was a greater pleasure to have it to look forward to than to enjoy it at the moment. Jan was a thrifty little boy as you perceive. Being Christmas, it was of course an idle day. Jacob Went never knew what to do with such. There was his pipe, and there was beer to be had, so in default of other occupation he amused himself with these. Mrs. Went had her hands full with the dinner, and was frying sausages and mixing Yorkshire pudding all the morning. Only Greta went to church. She belonged to a parish school, where they gave Christmas prizes, and by no means intended to lose her chance. But, apart from that, she really loved church-going, for she spoke English, and understood it better than either of the other children. Wilhelm went off on errands of his own. Little Jan spent the morning in admiring his stockings, and in wrapping and unwrapping his precious sweetmeat, and taking it out of his pocket, and putting it in again. "'Why dost thou not eat it, dear?' asked his mother, as she lifted the frying-pan from the stove. But he answered, oh not yet when once it is eaten it is over i will wait how long wilt thou wait she asked jan said bashfully i don't know in truth he had not made up his mind about the sweetmeat only he felt instinctively that he did not want to hurry and shorten his pleasure dinner over he went out for a walk every now and then as he marched along his hand would steal into his pocket to finger his precious candy and make sure that it was safe. It was a gray afternoon, but not snowing or raining. 
Hyde Park was not too far away for a walk, and Jan went there. The serpentine was skimmed over with ice, just strong enough to bear boys, and quite a little crowd was sliding or skating upon it. Jan could skate very well. He had learned in Holland, but he made no attempt to join the crowd. He was rather shy of English boys, for they sometimes laughed at his Hollander clothes, or his Dutch accent, and he did not like to be laughed at. So he strolled away, past the serpentine and the skaters, and watched the riders in the row for a while. There were not a great many, for people who ride are apt to be out of London at the Christmas time. But there were some pretty horses, and one fair little girl on a pony who took Jan's fancy very much. He stood for a long time watching her trot up and down, and the idea occurred to him that he would like to give her his sweetmeat. He even put his hand into his pocket and half pulled it out, but the little girl did not look his way, and presently her father, with whom she was riding, spoke to her, and she turned her horse's head and trotted off through the marble arch. Jan dropped the sugar plum again into his pocket and felt as if his sudden fancy had been absurd. And indeed, I think the little girl would have been surprised and puzzled what to do had he carried out the intention. After the pony and his little mistress had departed, Jan lost his interest in the riders and walked away across the park. Once he stopped to look at a dear little dog with a blue collar, who seemed to have lost his master, for he was wandering about by himself and smelling everybody and everything he met as if to recover a lost trail. Jan called him. He came up in a very friendly way, and allowed himself to be patted, and once more the sweetmeat was in danger, for Jan had taken it out with the intention of dividing it with his new friend, when a whistle was heard which the little dog evidently recognized, and he darted off at once to join his master. So again the pink sweetmeat was put back into Jan's pocket, and he walked on. He had gone quite a distance when he saw a number of people collected round the foot of a tree. A ladder was set against one of the lower branches, and a man had climbed up nearly to the top of the tree. Jan, like a true boy, lost no time in joining the crowd. But at first he could not make out what was going on. The boughs were thick. All that he could see was a man's back high up overhead, and what he was doing he could not guess. A benevolent-looking old gentleman stood near, and Jan heard him exclaim with great excitement, "'There! He's got him! No, he's not! But it was a close shave!' "'Got what, sir?' he ventured to ask. "'Why, the rook, to be sure!' Then, seeing that Jan still looked puzzled, he took the trouble to explain. "'You see that rook up there, my lad, don't you?' Jan had not seen any rook at all. Well, it is caught in some way. How, I can't tell you. But it can't get away from the tree. It has been there three days, they say. And all that time the other rooks have brought food to it, and kept it from starving. Now someone has gone up to see what is the difficulty, and, if possible, to set the poor thing free. Thank you, sir, said Jan. And the old gentleman looked at him kindly, and said to himself, a very civil, tidy little lad. I like his face. Jan had now become deeply interested in what was going on. He stood on tiptoe and stretched his neck, but all he could see was the man's back and one of his feet, and now and then the movement of a stick with which the man seemed to be trying to hit something. At last there was a great plunge and a rustling of branches, and people began to hurrah. Jan hurrahed too though he still saw nothing very clearly. But it is easier to shout when other boys shout, if you happen to be a boy, than it is to keep still. Slowly the man in the tree began to come down. He had only one hand to help himself with now, for the other held the heavy rook. We in America do not know what rooks are like, but in England they are common enough. They are large black birds, something like our crows, but they look wiser and are a good deal bigger. As the man neared the ground, everyone in the crowd could see what had been the matter with the rook. A kite-string, caught among the tree branches, had tangled his legs and held him fast. He had pulled so hard in his efforts to escape 
that the string had cut into one of his legs and half broken it. It was stiff and bleeding, and the rook could neither fly nor hop. People searched in their pockets, and one little girl, who had a half biscuit, began to feed the rook, who, for all the kindly efforts of his friends, seemed to be half famished. The poor thing was too weak to struggle or be frightened, and took the crumbs eagerly from the girl's hand. Jan thought of his sweetmeat, and took it out for the third time. Everybody was crowding round the man who held the rook, and he could not get near. A very tall policeman stood in front of him. Jan pulled his arm, and when he turned, handed him the sweetmeat, and said in his soft foreign English, For the bird, sir. Thank you, my dear, said the policeman. He had not understood what Jan said, and, in an abstracted way, with his eyes still fixed on the rook, he bit the pink sweetmeat in two, and swallowed half of it a mouthful. Fortunately Jan did not see this, for the policeman's back was turned to him. But observing that the man made no attempt to go forward, he pulled his sleeve for the second time, and again said, For the bird, I said, sir. This time the policeman heard, and taking one step forward, he held the remaining half of the sweetmeat out to the rook, who, having by this time grown used to being fed, took the offered dainty greedily. Jan saw the last pink crumb vanish into the long beak, but he felt no regret. His heart had been touched by the suffering of the poor bird, and he was glad to give what he could to make it forget those painful days in the tree. So that was the end of the pink sweetmeat, or not quite the end. The kind old gentleman to whom Jan had spoken had noticed the little transaction with the policeman. He was shrewd as well as kind. He guessed by Jan's clothes that he was a working man's son, to whom sweets were not an everyday affair, and the generous act pleased him. So he put his hand into his pocket, pulled out half a crown, and watching his opportunity, dropped it into Jan's pocket. Quite empty now that the sweetmeat was gone. Then, with a little chuckle, he walked away, and Jan had no suspicion of what had been done to him. Gradually the crowd dispersed, Jan among the rest walking briskly, for he wanted to get home and tell his mother the story. It was not till after supper that he discovered the half-crown, and then it seemed to him like a sort of dream, as if fairies had been at work, and turned the pink sweetmeat into a bit of silver. That night the three pairs of stockings had another chance for conversation. The blue ones and the gray ones lay close together on the floor of the room where Jan slept with his brother, and the white ones, which Greta had carelessly dropped as she jumped into bed, were near enough the half-open door to talk across the sill. "'It has been an exciting day,' said the white pair. "'My girl got a Kebbles Christian year at her school. It was the second best prize.' It is a good thing to belong to respectable people who take prizes. Only one thing was painful to me. She wriggled her toes so with pleasure that I felt as if I were coming to an end in one of my points. Well, you probably are, remarked the big gray. Yes, now that I examine, I can see the place. One stitch has parted already, and there is quite a thin spot. You know, I always predicted that you would be in the rag bag before you knew it. "'Oh, don't say such dreadful things,' pleaded the little blues. "'Mrs. Wendt will mend her, I am sure, and make her last. "'What did your girl do with her sweetmeat?' "'Ate it up directly, of course. "'What else should one do with a sweetmeat?' snapped the white pair crossly. "'Oh, dear, my toe feels dreadfully ever since you said that. "'Quite neuralgic.' Oh, "'My boy was not so foolish as to eat his sweetmeat.' said the big gray stockings. Only girls act in that way. Without regard to anything but their greedy appetites, he traded his with another boy, and he got a pocket knife for it, three screws, and a harmonica. There. Was the knife new? asked the blue. Could the harmonica play any music? demanded the white. No. The harmonica is out of order inside somehow, but perhaps the my boy can mend it. And the knife isn't new, quite old, in fact, and its blade is broken at the end. Still, it's a knife, and Wilhelm thinks he can trade it off for something else. And now for your adventures. What did your boy do with his sweetmeat, Little Blues? Did he eat it or trade it? It is eaten, 
replied the blue stockings cautiously eaten then of course he ate it why don't you speak out if he ate it say so if he didn't who did well nobody ate the whole of it and my boy didn't eat any it was divided between two persons or rather between one person and and a, a thing that is not a person bless me what are you talking about i never heard anything so absurd in my life persons and things that are not persons said the white pair what do you mean yes what do you mean what is the use of beating about the bush in this way remonstrated the big gray pair who did eat the sweetmeat say plainly half of it was eaten by a policeman and the other half by a rook replied the little blues in a meek voice ho 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 roared the gray stockings while the white pair joined in with a shrill giggle that beats all half by a policeman and half by a rook a fine way to dispose of a christmas sweetmeat your boy must be a fool little blues not a fool at all said the blue pair indignantly now just listen to me your girl ate hers up at once and forgot it your boy traded his away and what has he got a broken knife and a harmonica that can't play music i don't call those worth having my boy enjoyed his sweetmeat all day he had more pleasure in giving it away than if he had eaten it ten times over besides he got half a crown for it an old gentleman slipped it into his pocket because he was pleased with his kind heart i saw him do it half a crown ejaculated the white pair with amazement well that is something like admitted the big gray stockings your boy did the best of the three i admit the little blue said no more presently the others fell asleep but she lay and watched jan as he rested peacefully beside his brother with his wonderful treasure the silver coin clasped tight in his hand he smiled in his sleep as though his dreams were pleasant even if he had no half crown still he would have done the best she whispered to herself at last then the clock struck twelve and the day after christmas was begun end of the pink sweet meat by susan coolidge read by greg giordano the sad shepherd by henry van dyke read in english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the sad shepherd by henry van dyke 1 darkness out of the valley of gardens where a film of new-fallen snow lay smooth as feathers on the breast of a dove the ancient pools of solomon looked up into the night sky with dark tranquil eyes wide open and passive reflecting the crisp stars and the small round moon the full springs overflowing on the hillside melted their way through the field of white in winding channels and along their course the grass was green even in the dead of winter but the sad shepherd walked far above the friendly valley in a region where ridges of gray rock welted and scarred the back of the earth like wounds of half-forgotten strife and battles long ago the solitude was forbidding and disquieting the keen air that searched the wanderer had no pity in it and the myriad glances of the night were curiously cold his flock straggled after him the sheep weather-beaten and dejected followed the path with low heads nodding from side to side as if they had traveled far and found little pasture the black lop-eared goats leaped upon the rocks restless and ravenous tearing down the tender branches and leaves of the dwarf oaks and wild olives they reared up against the twisted trunks and crawled and scrambled along the boughs it was like a company of gray downcast friends and a troop of merry little black devils following the sad shepherd afar off he walked looking on the ground paying small heed to them now and again when the sound of pattering feet and panting breath 
and the rustling and rending among the copses fell too far behind, he drew out his shepherd's pipe and blew a strain of music, shrill and plaintive, quavering and lamenting through the hollow night. He waited while the little troops of grey and black scuffled and bounded and trotted near to him. Then he dropped the pipe into its place again and strode forward, looking on the ground. The fitful, shivery wind that rasped the hilltop fluttered the rags of his long mantle of Tyrian blue, torn by thorns and stained by travel. The rich tunic of striped silk beneath it was worn thin, and the girdle about his loins had lost all its ornaments of silver and jewels. His curling hair hung down dishevelled under a turban of fine linen, in which the gilt threads were frayed and tarnished, and his shoes of soft leather were broken by the road. On his brown fingers the places of the vanished rings were still marked in white skin. He carried not the long staff, nor the heavy nail-studded rod of the shepherd, but a slender stick of carved cedar, battered and scratched by hard usage, and the handle, which must once have been of precious metal, was missing. He was a strange figure for that lonely place and that humble occupation, a branch of faded beauty from some royal garden, tossed by rude winds into the wilderness, a pleasure craft adrift, buffeted and broken on rough seas. But he seemed to have passed beyond caring. His young face was frayed and threadbare as his garments. The splendor of the moonlight flooding the wild world meant as little to him as the hardness of the rugged track which he followed. He wrapped his tattered mantle closer around him and strode ahead, looking on the ground. As the path dropped from the summit of the ridge toward the valley of mills, and passed among huge broken rocks, three men sprang at him from the shadows. He lifted his stick, but let it fall again, and a strange ghost of a smile twisted his face as they gripped him and threw him down. "'You are rough beggars,' he said. "'Say what you want. You are welcome to it.' "'Your money, dog of a courtier,' they muttered fiercely. Give us your golden collar, Herod's hound, quick, or you die. The quicker the better, he answered, closing his eyes. The bewildered flock of sheep and goats, gathered in a silent ring, stood at gaze while the robbers fumbled over their master. This is a stray dog, said one. He has lost his collar. There is not even the price of a mouthful of wine on him. Shall we kill him and leave him for the vultures? "'What have the vultures done for us?' said another, "'that we should feed them. "'Let us take his cloak and drive off his flock, "'and leave him to die in his own time.' "'With a kick and a curse they left him. "'He opened his eyes and lay quiet for a moment, "'with his twisted smile, watching the stars. "'You creep like snails,' he said. "'I thought you had marked my time tonight, "'but not even that is given to me for nothing.' I must pay for all, it seems. Far away, slowly scattering and receding, he heard the rustling and bleating of his frightened flock as the robbers, running and shouting, tried to drive them over the hills. Then he stood up and took the shepherd's pipe, a worthless bit of reed, from the breast of his tunic. He blew again that plaintive, piercing air, sounding it out over the ridges and distant thickets. It seemed to have neither beginning nor end, a melancholy, pleading tune that searched for ever after something lost. While he played, the sheep and the goats, slipping away from their captors by roundabout ways, hiding behind the laurel bushes, following the dark gullies, leaping down the broken cliffs, came circling back to him, one after another. And as they came, he interrupted his playing, now and then, to call them by name. When they were nearly all assembled, he went down swiftly toward the lower valley, and they followed him, panting. At the last crook of the path on the steep hillside, a straggler came after him along the cliff. He looked up and saw it outlined against the sky. Then he saw it leap, and slip, and fall beyond the path into a deep cleft. "'Little fool,' he said, "'fortune is kind to you. You have escaped from the big trap of life. What? You are crying for help. You are still in the trap. 
then I must go down to you, little fool, for I am a fool, too. But why I must do it, I know no more than you know. He lowered himself quickly and perilously into the cleft, and found the creature with its leg broken and bleeding. It was not a sheep, but a young goat. He had no cloak to wrap it in, but he took off his turban and unrolled it, and bound it around the trembling animal. Then he climbed back to the path, and strode on at the head of his flock, carrying the little black kid in his arms. There were houses in the valley of the mills, and in some of them lights were burning, and the drone of the millstones, where the women were still grinding, came out into the night like the humming of drowsy bees. As the women heard the pattering and bleating of the flock, they wondered who was passing so late. One of them, in a house where there was no mill but many lights, came to the door and looked out laughing, her face and bosom bare. But the sad shepherd did not stay. His long shadow and the confused mass of lesser shadows behind him drifted down the white moonlight, past the yellow bars of lamplight that gleamed from the doorways. It seemed as if he were bound to go somewhere, and would not delay. Yet with all his haste to be gone, it was plain that he thought little of where he was going. For when he came to the foot of the valley, where the paths divided, he stood between them, staring vacantly, without a desire to turn this way or that. The imperative of choice halted him like a barrier. The balance of his mind hung even, because both scales were empty. He could act, he could go, for his strength was untouched, but he could not choose, for his will was broken within him. The path to the left went up toward the little town of Bethlehem, with huddled roofs and walls in the silhouette along the double-crested hill. It was dark and foreboding as a closed fortress. The sad shepherd looked at it with indifferent eyes. There was nothing there to draw him. The path to the right round through rock-strewn valleys toward the Dead Sea. But rising out of that crumpled wilderness, a mile or two away, the smooth white ribbon of a chariot road lay upon the flank of a cone-shaped mountain and curled in loops toward its peak. There the great cone was cut squarely off, and the leveled summit was capped by a palace of marble, with round towers at the corners and flaring beacons along the walls. And the glow of an immense fire, hidden in the central courtyard, painted a false dawn on the eastern sky. All down the clean-cut mountain slopes, on terraces and blind arches, the lights flashed from lesser pavilions and pleasure houses. It was the secret orchard of Herod and his friends, their trysting place with the spirits of mirth and madness. They called it the Mountain of the Little Paradise. Rich gardens were there, and the cool water from the pools of Solomon plashed in the fountains, and trees of the knowledge of good and evil fruited blood-red and ivory-white above them, and smooth, curving, glistening shapes, whispering softly of pleasure, lay among the flowers and glided behind the trees. All this was now hidden in the dark. Only the strange bulk of the mountain, a sharp, black pyramid, girded and crowned with fire, loomed across the night, a mountain once seen, never to be forgotten. The sad shepherd remembered it well. He looked at it with the eyes of a child who has been in hell. It burned him from afar. Turning neither to the right nor to the left, he walked without a path straight out upon the plain of Bethlehem, still whitened in the hollows and on the sheltered side of its rounded hillocks by the veil of snow. He faced a wide and empty world, to the west in sleeping Bethlehem, to the east in flaring Herodium, the life of man was infinitely far away from him. Even the stars seemed to withdraw themselves against the blue-black of the sky. They diminished and receded till they were like pinholes in the vault above him. The moon in mid-heaven shrank into a bit of burnished silver, hard and glittering, immeasurably remote. The ragged, inhospitable ridges of Tekoa lay stretched in mortal slumber along the horizon, and between them he caught a glimpse of the sunken lake of death, darkly gleaming in its deep bed. There was no movement, no sound, on the plain where he walked, except the soft padding feet of his dumb, 
obsequious flock. He felt an endless isolation strike cold to his heart, against which he held the limp body of the wounded kid, wondering the while, with a half-contempt for his own foolishness, why he took such trouble to save a tiny scrap of the worthless tissue which is called life. Even when a man does not know or care where he is going, if he steps onward he will get there. In an hour or more of walking over the plain, the sad shepherd came to a sheepfold of grey stones with a rude tower beside it. The fold was full of sheep, and at the foot of the tower a little fire of thorns was burning, around which four shepherds were crouching, wrapped in their thick woolen coats. As the stranger approached, they looked up, and one of them rose quickly to his feet, grasping his knotted club. But when they saw the flock that followed the sad shepherd, they stared at each other and said, It is one of us, a keeper of sheep. But how comes he here in this raiment? It is what men wear in king's houses. No, said the one who was standing, it is what they wear when they have been thrown out of them. Look at the rags. He may be a thief and a robber with his stolen flock. "'Salute him when he comes near,' said the oldest shepherd. "'Are we not four to one? "'We have nothing to fear from a ragged traveller. "'Speak him fair. "'It is the will of God, and it costs nothing.' "'Peace be with you, brother,' cried the youngest shepherd. "'May your mother and father be blessed.' "'May your heart be enlarged,' the stranger answered, "'and may all your families be more blessed than mine, "'for I have none.' A homeless man, said the old shepherd, has either been robbed by his fellows or punished by God. I do not know which it was, answered the stranger. The end is the same, as you see. By your speech you come from Galilee. Where are you going? What are you seeking here? I was going nowhere, my masters, but it was cold on the way there, and my feet turned to your fire. Come, then, if you are a peaceable man, and warm your feet with us. Heat is a good gift. Divide it, and it is not less. But you shall have bread and salt, too, if you will. May your hospitality enrich you. I am your unworthy guest. But my flock. Let your flock shelter by the south wall of the fold. There is good picking there, and no wind. Come you, and sit with us. So they all sat down by the fire, and the sad shepherd ate of their bread, but sparingly, like a man to whom hunger brings a need, but no joy in the satisfying of it. And the others were silent for a proper time, out of courtesy. Then the oldest shepherd spoke. My name is Sadok, the son of Eliezer, of Bethlehem. I am the chief shepherd of the flocks of the temple, which are before you in the fold. These are my sister's sons, Jotham, and Shama, and Nathan. Their father, Elkanah, is dead, and but for these I am a childless man. My name, replied the stranger, is Amiel, the son of Jokanan, of the city of Bethsaida, by the Sea of Galilee, and I am a fatherless man. It is better to be childless than fatherless, said Zadok, yet it is the will of God that children should bury their fathers. When did the blessed Jokanan die? I know not whether he be dead or alive. It is three years since I looked upon his face or had word of him. You are an exile, then. Has he cast you off? It was the other way, said Emil, looking on the ground. At this the shepherd Shama, who had listened with doubt in his face, started up in anger. Pig of a Galilean, he cried despiser of parents, breaker of the law. When I saw you coming, I knew you for something vile. Why do you darken the night for us with your presence? You have reviled him who begot you. Away, or we stone you. Emile did not answer or move. A twisted smile passed over his bowed face again as he waited to know the shepherd's will with him, even as he had waited for the robbers. But Zadok lifted his hand. Not so hasty, Shama ben Elkana. You also break the law by judging a man unheard. The rabbis have told us that there is a tradition of the elders, 
a rule as holy as the law itself, that a man may deny his father in a certain way without sin. It is a strange rule, and it must be very holy, or it would not be so strange. But this is the teaching of the elders. A son may say of anything for which his father asks him, a sheep, or a measure of corn, or a field, or a purse of silver, it is korban, a gift that I have vowed unto the Lord. And so his father shall have no more claim upon him. Have you said korban to your father, Emile ben Jokanan? Have you made a vow unto the Lord? I have said korban, answered Emile, lifting his face, still shadowed by that strange smile. But it was not the Lord who heard my vow. Tell us what you have done, said the old man sternly, for we will neither judge you nor shelter you unless we hear your story. There is nothing in it, replied Emil indifferently. It is an old story, but if you are curious, you shall hear it. Afterward you shall deal with me as you will. So the shepherds, wrapped in their warm cloaks, sat listening with grave faces and watchful, unsearchable eyes. While Emile, in his tattered silk, sat by the sinking fire of thorns, and told his tale with a voice that had no room for hope or fear, a cool, dead voice that spoke only of things ended. 2. Night Fire In my father's house I was the second son. My brother was honored and trusted in all things. He was a prudent man and profitable to the household. All that he counseled was done. All that he wished he had. My place was a narrow one. There was neither honor nor joy in it, for it was filled with daily tasks and rebukes. No one cared for me. My mother sometimes wept when I was rebuked. Perhaps she was disappointed in me but she had no power to make things better. I felt that I was a beast of burden, fed only in order that I might be useful, and the dull life irked me like an ill-fitting harness. There was nothing in it. I went to my father and claimed my share of the inheritance. He was rich. He gave it to me. It did not impoverish him, and it made me free. I said to him, Corban, and shook the dust of Bethsaida from my feet. I went out to look for mirth and love and joy and all that is pleasant to the eyes and sweet to the taste. If a God made me, thought I, he made me to live, and the pride of life was strong in my heart and in my flesh. My vow was offered to that well-known God. I served him in Jerusalem, in Alexandria, in Rome, for his altars are everywhere, and men worship him openly or in secret. My money and youth made me welcome to his followers, and I spent them both freely as if they could never come to an end. I clothed myself in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. The wine of Cyprus and the dishes of Egypt and Syria were on my table. My dwelling was crowded with merry guests. They came for what I gave them, their faces were hungry, and their soft touch was like the clinging of leeches. To them I was nothing but money and youth, no longer a beast of burden, a beast of pleasure. There was nothing in it. From the richest fare my heart went away empty, and after the wildest banquet my soul fell drunk and solitary into sleep. Then I thought, power is better than pleasure. If a man will feast and revel, let him do it with the great. They will favor him and raise him up for the service that he renders them. He will obtain place and authority in the world and gain many friends. So I joined myself to Herod. When the sad shepherd spoke this name, his listeners drew back from him as if it were a defilement to hear it. They spat upon the ground and cursed the Idumean who called himself their king. A slave! Jotham cried, a bloody tyrant and a slave from Edom, a fox, a vile beast who devours his own children. God burn him in Gehenna. The old Zadok picked up a stone and threw it into the darkness, saying slowly, I cast this stone upon the grave of the Idumean, the blasphemer, the defiler of the temple. 
God send us soon the Deliverer, the Promised One, the True King of Israel. Emile made no sign, but went on with his story. Herod used me well, for his own purpose. He welcomed me to his palace and his table, and gave me a place among his favorites. He was so much my friend that he borrowed my money. There were many of the nobles of Jerusalem with him, sad ducies, and proselytes from Rome and Asia, and women from everywhere. The law of Israel was observed in the open court, when the people were watching, but in the secret feasts there was no law but the will of Herod, and many deities were served, but no god was worshipped. There the captains and the princes of Rome consorted with the high priest and his sons by night, and there was much coming and going by hidden ways. Everybody was a borrower or a lender, a buyer or a seller of favors. It was a house of diligent madness. There was nothing in it. In the midst of this whirling life a great need of love came upon me, and I wished to hold someone in my inmost heart. At a certain place in the city, within closed doors, I saw a young slave girl dancing. She was about fifteen years old, thin and supple. She danced like a reed in the wind, but her eyes were weary as death, and her white body was marked with bruises. She stumbled, and the men laughed at her. She fell, and her mistress beat her, crying out that she would fain be rid of such a heavy-footed slave. I paid the price and took her to my dwelling. Her name was Tamar. She was a daughter of Lebanon. I robed her in silk and broidered linen. I nourished her with tender care so that beauty came upon her like the blossoming of an almond tree. She was a garden enclosed, breathing spices. Her eyes were like doves behind her veil. Her lips were a thread of scarlet. Her neck was a tower of ivory, and her breasts were as two fawns which fed among the lilies. She was whiter than milk, and more rosy than the flower of the peach, and her dancing was like the flight of a bird among the branches. So I loved her. She lay in my bosom as a clear stone that one has bought and polished and set in fine gold at the end of a golden chain. Never was she glad at my coming, or sorry at my going. Never did she give me anything except what I took from her. There was nothing in it. Now whether Herod knew of the jewel that I kept in my dwelling, I cannot tell. It was sure that he had his spies in all the city, and himself walked the streets by night in a disguise. On a certain day he sent for me, and had me into his secret chamber, professing great love toward me, and more confidence than in any man that lived. So I must go to Rome for him, bearing a sealed letter and a private message to Caesar. All my goods would be left safely in the hands of the king, my friend, who would reward me double. There was a certain place of high authority at Jerusalem, which Caesar would gladly bestow on a Jew who had done him a service. This mission would commend me to him. It was a great occasion, suited to my powers. Thus Herod fed me with fair promises, and I ran his errand. There was nothing in it. I stood before Caesar and gave him the letter. He read it and laughed, saying that a prince with an incurable hunger is a servant of value to an emperor. Then he asked me if there was nothing sent with the letter. I answered that there was no gift, but a message for his private ear. He drew me aside, and I told him that Herod begged earnestly that his dear son, Antipater, might be sent back in haste from Rome to Palestine, for the king had great need of him. At this Caesar laughed again. To bury him, I suppose, said he, with his brothers, Alexander, and Aristobulus. Truly, it is better to be Herod's swine than his son. Tell the old fox he may catch his own prey. With this he turned from me, and I withdrew unrewarded, to make my way back, as best I could with an empty purse, to Palestine. I had seen the Lord of the world. There was nothing in it. Selling my rings and bracelets, I got passage on a trading ship for Joppa. There I heard that the king was not in Jerusalem, at his palace of the upper city, but had gone with his friends to make merry for a month on the mountain of the little paradise. On that hilltop over against us, 
where the lights are flaring tonight, in the banquet hall where couches are spread for a hundred guests, I found Herod. The listening shepherds spat upon the ground again, and Jotham muttered, May the worms that devour his flesh never die. But Zadok whispered, We wait for the Lord's salvation to come out of Zion. At this the sad shepherd, looking with fixed eyes at the firelit mountain far away, continued his story. The king lay on his ivory couch, and the sweat of his disease was heavy upon him, for he was old, and his flesh was corrupted. But his hair and his beard were dyed and perfumed, and there was a wreath of roses on his head. The hall was full of nobles and great men, the sons of the high priest were there, and the servants poured their wine in cups of gold. There was a sound of soft music, and all the men were watching a girl who danced in the middle of the hall, and the eyes of Herod were fiery, like the eyes of a fox. The dancer was Tamar. She glistened like the snow on Lebanon, and the redness of her was ruddier than a pomegranate, and her dancing was like the coiling of white serpents. When the dance was ended, her attendants threw a veil of gauze over her, and she lay among her cushions, half covered with flowers, at the feet of the king. Through the sound of clapping hands and shouting, two slaves led me behind the couch of Herod. His eyes narrowed as they fell upon me. I told him the message of Caesar, making it soft, as if it were a word that suffered him to catch his prey. He stroked his beard softly, and his look fell on Tamar. I have caught it, he murmured. By all the gods, I have always caught it. And my dear son, Antipater, is coming home of his own will. I have lured him. He is mine. Then a look of madness crossed his face, and he sprang up, with frothing lips, and struck me. What is this? he cried. A spy, a servant of my false son, a traitor in my banquet hall. Who are you? I knelt before him, protesting that he must know me, that I was his friend, his messenger, that I had left all my goods in his hands, that the girl who had danced for him was mine. At this his face changed again, and he fell back on his couch, shaken with horrible laughter. Yours, he cried. When was she yours? What is yours? I know you now, poor madman. You are Emile, a crazy shepherd from Galilee, who troubled us some time since. Take him away, slaves. He has twenty sheep and twenty goats among my flocks at the foot of the mountain. See to it that he gets them, and drive him away. I fought against the slaves with my bare hands, but they held me. I called to Tamar, begging her to have pity on me, to speak for me, to come with me. She looked up with her eyes like doves behind her veil, but there was no knowledge of me in them. She laughed lazily, as if it were a poor comedy, and flung a broken rose branch in my face. Then the silver cord was loosened within me, and my heart went out, and I struggled no more. There was nothing in it. Afterward I found myself on the road with this flock. I led them past Hebron to the south country, and so by the vale of Eshcol, and over many hills beyond the pools of Solomon, until my feet brought me to your fire. Here I rest on the way to nowhere. He sat silent, and the four shepherds looked at him with amazement. It is a bitter tale, said Shama, and you are a great sinner. I should be a fool not to know that, answered the sad shepherd, but the knowledge does me no good. You must repent, said Nathan, the youngest shepherd, in a friendly voice. How can a man repent, answered the sad shepherd, unless he has hope? But I am sorry for everything, and most of all for living. Would you not live to kill the fox Herod, asked Jotham fiercely. Why should I let him out of the trap? answered the sad shepherd. Is he not dying more slowly than I could kill him? You must have faith in God, said Zadok, earnestly and gravely. He is too far away. Then you must have love for your neighbor. 
he is too near. My confidence in man was like a pool by the wayside. It was shallow, but there was water in it, and sometimes a star shone there. Now the feet of many beasts have trampled through it, and the jackals have drunken of it, and there is no more water. It is dry, and the mire is caked at the bottom. Is there nothing good in the world? There is pleasure, but I am sick of it. There is power, but I hate it. There is wisdom, but I mistrust it. Life is a game, and every player is for his own hand. Mine is played. I have nothing to win or lose. You are young. You have many years to live. I am old, yet the days before me are too many. But you travel the road. You go forward. Do you hope for nothing? I hope for nothing, said the sad shepherd. Yet if one thing should come to me, it might be the beginning of hope. If I saw in man or woman a deed of kindness without a selfish reason, and a proof of love gladly given for its own sake only, then I might turn my face toward that light. Till that comes, how can I have faith in God whom I have never seen? I have seen the world which he has made, and it brings me no faith. There is nothing in it. Amael ben Jokanan, said the old man sternly, you are a son of Israel, and we have had compassion on you according to the law. But you are an apostate, an unbeliever, and we can have no more fellowship with you, lest a curse come upon us. The company of the desperate brings misfortune. Go your way and depart from us, for our way is not yours. So the sad shepherd thanked them for their entertainment, and took the little kid again in his arms, and went into the night, calling his flock. But the youngest shepherd, Nathan, followed him a few steps, and said, There is a broken field at the foot of the hill. It is old and small, but you may find shelter there for your flock, where the wind will not shake you. Go your way with God, brother, and see better days. Then Amiel went a little way down the hill, and sheltered his flock in a corner of the crumbling walls. He lay among the sheep and the goats with his face upon his folded arms, and whether the time passed slowly or swiftly he did not know, for he slept. He waked as Nathan came running and stumbling across the scattered stones. "'We have seen a vision,' he cried, "'a wonderful vision of angels. Did you not hear them? They sang loudly of the hope of Israel.' We are going to Bethlehem to see this thing which has come to pass. Come you, and keep watch over our sheep while we are gone. Of angels I have seen and heard nothing, said Amiel, but I will guard your flock with mine, since I am in debt to you for bread and fire. So he brought the kid in his arms, and the weary flock straggling after him, to the south wall of the great fold again, and sat there by the embers at the foot of the tower, while the others were away. The moon rested like a ball on the edge of the western hills, and rolled behind them. The stars faded in the east, and the fires went out on the mountain of the little paradise. Over the hills of Moab a great flood of dawn rose slowly, and arrows of red shot far up before the sunrise. The shepherds returned full of joy, and told what they had seen. It was even as the angel said unto us, said Shama, and it must be true, the king of Israel has come, the faithful shall be blessed. Herod shall fall, cried Jotham, lifting his clenched fist toward the dark-peaked mountain. Burn, black Idumean, in the bottomless pit where the fire is not quenched. Zadok spoke more quietly. We found the newborn child of whom the angels told us, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The ways of God are wonderful. His salvation comes out of darkness, and we trust in the promised deliverance. But you, a mild ben Jokanan, except you believe, you shall not see it. Yet since you have kept our flocks faithfully, and because of the joy that has come to us, I give you this piece of silver to help you on your way. But Nathan came close to the sad shepherd and touched him on the shoulder with a friendly hand. Go you also to Bethlehem, he said in a low voice. 
for it is good to see what we have seen, and we will keep your flock until you return. I will go, said a mile, looking into his face, for I think you wish me well. But whether I shall see what you have seen, and whether I shall ever return, I know not. Farewell. 3. Dawn The narrow streets of Bethlehem were waking to the first stir of life as the sad shepherd came into the town with the morning and passed through them like one walking in his sleep. The courtyard of the great Khan and the open rooms around it were crowded with travellers, rousing them from their night's rest and making ready for the day's journey. In front of the stables, half hollowed in the rock beside the inn, men were saddling their horses and their beasts of burden, and there was much noise and confusion. But beyond these, at the end of the line, there was a deeper grotto in the rock, which was used only when the nearer stalls were full. At the entrance of this an ass was tethered, and a man of middle age stood in the doorway. The sad shepherd saluted him and told him his name. "'I am Joseph, the carpenter of Nazareth,' replied the man. "'Have you also seen the angels of whom your brother shepherds came to tell us?' "'I have seen no angels,' answered Emile, "'nor have I any brothers among the shepherds. "'But I would fain see what they have seen.' "'It is our first-born son,' said Joseph, "'and the Most High has sent him to us. "'He is a marvellous child. "'Great things are foretold of him. "'You may go in, but quietly, "'for the child and his mother Mary are asleep.' "'So the sad shepherd went in quietly. "'His long shadow entered before him, "'for the sunrise was flowing into the door of the grotto. "'It was made clean and put in order, "'and a bed of straw was laid in a corner on the ground.' The child was asleep, but the young mother was waking, for she had taken him from the manger into her lap, where her maiden veil of white was spread to receive him, and she was singing very softly as she bent over him in wonder and content. Emile saluted her, and kneeled down to look at the child. He saw nothing different from other young children. The mother waited for him to speak of angels, as the other shepherds had done. The sad shepherd did not speak, but only looked and as he looked, his face changed. You have suffered pain, and danger, and sorrow for his sake, he said gently. They are past, she answered, and for his sake I have suffered them gladly. He is very little and helpless. You must bear many troubles for his sake. To care for him is my joy, and to bear him lightens my burden. He does not know you. He can do nothing for you. But I know him. I have carried him under my heart. He is my son and my king. Why do you love him? The mother looked up at the sad shepherd with a great reproach in her soft eyes. Then her look grew pitiful as it rested on his face. You are a sorrowful man, she said. I am a wicked man, he answered. She shook her head gently. I know nothing of that, she said, but you must be very sorrowful, since you are born of a woman, and yet you ask a mother why she loves her child. I love him for love's sake, because God has given him to me. So the mother Mary leaned over her little son again, and began to croon a song as if she were alone with him. But Emile was still there, watching and thinking, and beginning to remember. It came back to him that there was a woman in Galilee who had wept when he was rebuked, whose eyes had followed him when he was unhappy, as if she longed to do something for him, whose voice had broken and dropped silent while she covered her tear-stained face when he went away. His thoughts flowed swiftly and silently toward her and after her like rapid waves of light. There was a thought of her bending over a little child in her lap, singing softly for pure joy, and the child was himself. There was a thought of her lifting a little child to the breast that had borne him as a burden and a pain, to nourish him there as a comfort and a treasure, and the child was himself. There was a thought of her watching and tending and guiding a little child from day to day, from year to year, 
putting tender arms around him, bending over his first wavering steps, rejoicing in his joys, wiping away the tears from his eyes, as he had never tried to wipe her tears away. And the child was himself. She had done everything for the child's sake, but what had the child done for her sake? And the child was himself. That was what he had come to, after the night fire had burned out, after the darkness had grown thin, and melted in the thoughts that pulsed through it like rapid waves of light. And that was where he had come to in the early morning, himself, a child in his mother's arms. Then he arose and went out of the grotto softly, making the threefold sign of reverence, and the eyes of Mary followed him with kind looks. Joseph of Nazareth was still waiting outside the door. "'How was it that you did not see the angels?' he asked. "'Were you not with the other shepherds?' "'No,' answered Emile. "'I was asleep. "'But I have seen the mother and the child. "'Blessed be the house that holds them.' "'You are strangely clad for a shepherd,' said Joseph. "'Where do you come from?' "'From a far country,' replied Emile. "'From a country that you have never visited.' "'Where are you going now?' asked Joseph. "'I am going home,' answered Emile, "'to my mother's and my father's house in Galilee.' "'Go in peace, friend,' said Joseph. And the sad shepherd took up his battered staff and went on his way rejoicing. End of The Sad Shepherd, A Christmas Story by Henry Van Dyke Read for LibriVox by Marianne Spiegel Christmas, 2013Shadow, a Christmas Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Negro convict, awake, lay on his back in the log barracks. Wearied forms stretched out in slumber in long lines to the right and left of him. A chain ran from his shackles, as from theirs, to a stout beam holding him prisoner. He was only a boy when the shackles were riveted on his ankles, his crime an error born of ignorance and lack of moral training. Six years had passed since, dazed and terrified, he had been led from the courthouse, and at twenty he still owed the state of Alabama fourteen years of servitude. Life for him had been fierce and full of agony down in the black darkness of coal mines he had labored until accident made him useless and gave him back to daylight and the great green world above life then settled into the dull routine of the camp and a hostler's duties the darkness behind him a nightmare the days of his lost freedom a dream the freedom to come was too far away for his imagination to compass from the right and left of him came the deep breathing of tired men. Sleep with the convict is rest in the full and perfect significance of the word, and he plunges into it after his coarse evening meal as into a tide. That which kept the boy awake was necessarily something novel. It was not pain, had he not felt the lash and the crush of falling coal, nor sorrow, for behind him, among the faraway Georgia hills, was a cabin about which as a child he had played, as all children play, and the sad, undying memory of it shut out all other sorrows. Nor was it a mere yearning for freedom, that had long since given place to dull, unlifting despair. All these, sorrow, pain, and despair, had been the companions of his solitude in many a night of gloom, keeping watch as he slept. The strange new companion of his solitude, from whose divine presence this night all others withdrew, was hope. As he lay, the darkness fell away beyond the radiance of his visitor, 
and three faces shone out as clearly as the white cloudlets in the blue of summer skies sunshine moonbeam and starlight stood by his side sunshine moonbeam and starlight when all the branches and departments of the state government refugeed into the highlands away from the fever and beyond the vexations of quarantine the convicts came to Watumpka, and on days when the prison commissioner came to inspect the camp with him were the three each less than a dozen years of age and sunshine was the youngest of them all take care of them shadow he said to the hostler convict and the black boy with the memory of his own white folks far away filling his heart with joy took care of them proudly and gratefully six years had passed since he had looked on childhood take care of them ay if necessary he would lay down his life for them instead he rigged up swings of plough-lines marked off hopscotch diagrams for their little feet and taught them how to ride on the back of a superannuated mule he filled their hours with excitement and pleasure and when they wearied of exercise lying in the shade of a great oak he touched their hearts with the story of his misfortunes he drew for them graphic pictures of his terrible life in the coal-mines of the men who work where eternal darkness reigns and the accidents in which lives go out like the light of snuffed candles and looking over the hills he told too of that cabin where he was born of his mammy at the wash-tub singing hymns that linger now as the voices of dead slaves on old plantations and of the little miss and her child friends who came down to the big white house in the summer and thence to the gin house to play in the heaped-up cotton not a line of it all was gone from his memory not a picture was blurred and sunshine moonbeam and starlight touched by the divine pity which is eloquent in the hearts of women old and young looked into the sad black face of their friend good-bye shadow they said when the quarantine was lifted and they had come for the last time good-bye we are going to get you out by christmas only you must promise to be good always will you and shadow with tears on his cheeks from eyes long dry pledged himself before the good god looking down on them his messengers to be perfect for ever and for ever and the memory of it all filled the darkness with a flood of beauty as though sunshine moonbeam and starlight were indeed by his side not for a moment had he doubted them so hope furled her wings above him on christmas eve and he lay waiting with wide-opened eyes sunshine moonbeam and starlight where were they the floor vibrated under the convict's head a lantern flashed and a guard stood over him one word broke the silence one word his own name shadow it was the day before christmas and nothing had been accomplished for shadow freeing a convict was not the trivial matter imagined the commissioner besieged and wearied out of discretion after many laughing refusals referred the little petitioners to the governor they knew the governor almost daily they saw him pass on their block and sometimes he laid a hand on a curly head in passing but he never transacted business outside his office he said never and always he smiled and passed along they must come and see him he said but the governor was never in when they called timidly at least he was never in sight then their last day of grace arrived and they charged capitol hill once more terrace and portico fell quickly before their assault the historic spot where jefferson davis delivered his inaugural over the cradle of the great confederacy and launched the war which was to end in freedom for all the black people was simply space to be crossed and they crossed it they carried their advance into the governor's room 
they came without ceremony and with the red of their country's flag on their cheeks its blue within their eager eyes and within their parted lips its gleaming white they stormed his great chair planted their victorious arms about him and demanded an unconditional surrender the governor seemed to yield they made a transient summer in the still cold room and awoke a youth that long had slept within his heart a youth full of romance and of love romance love are not these born ever under the sunshine and moonbeams and starlight the governor seemed to yield he stroked each curly head and learned each name he remembered when their respective parents were married he knew more about them than did the little ones themselves then the crash came pardon a convict no the man had not surrendered the smiling face faded into a grave cold face the governor they knew had vanished and a new governor grave courteous and firm but not nearly so nice had taken his place but in the sunshine the ice is melted at last and in the moonbeams and the light of the stars love finds a way reason was powerless refusal impotent the illogical trinity sat on his knees and the arms of his chair and admitted all that he urged to be true they agreed with him in his conception of a governor's duty they even recognized the claims of good public policy to be against them and when he had finished they put their arms about him and asked mercy for their friend shadow it would not be so bad said sunshine if we hadn't promised and the governor laughed how potent is innocence how weak at times is wisdom driven from his positions one by one the beleaguered governor took refuge behind the judicial ermine shadow had been placed in prison by the judge the judge was really the man to be seen it would never do for the governor arbitrarily to reverse the action of the judge and then he sighed a great sigh of relief why had he not thought of that before give us a letter to the judge then said sunshine sturdily and she handed him his pen point reversed good said the governor yes he is the man you should see do you know the judge yes they knew the judge almost daily they saw him pass on their block and sometimes he too laid a hand on their heads in passing but they had never thought of asking his help in getting shadow out if the judge says you may let him go said sunshine with a tremulous little note in her voice will you do it aha exclaimed the governor with apparent irrelevancy and yet it was pertinent and relevant it meant this little aha spoken to himself and the thoughts within him that the logic of the situation had hemmed him in he must say yes or admit that he had been insincere then he remembered that a great murder trial was on and approaching its close and that even a telephone message could hardly make its way into the courthouse so dense was the crowd yes he answered guardedly if the judge says i may i shall have to do something for shadow but he added pitying their situation you cannot see the judge to-day he is engaged in trying a man for his life and hopes to get through before christmas the three answered not serenely they went forth a friendly irishman in a police uniform was at the foot of the steps dreaming daydreams perhaps of the childer at home his smiling face was an invitation and they asked him the way to the courthouse courthouse he said Good house and why should the likes of ye babies that ye are be hunting for the court house they are trying a man for his life said sunshine getting her logic mixed and we have a message to the judge from the governor the irishman glanced at the official envelope and whistled and is it important he said 
it may get a man out of prison said sunshine if we can get there in time it's get there in time ye will said the irishman if i have to carry the last darlin of ye in me arms and on me ed come along wid me every corridor every foot of courtroom space was occupied with excited men and the way was blocked over the murmur of their voices rang the voice of the defendant's attorney as he pleaded for his client's life a whisper ran through the crowd the irishman started it they looked with wonder on the three dainty messengers and opened a path for them message from the governor what could it mean the tension was at its highest pitch the sheriff lifting his hand at the entrance to the bar waited until the judge's gavel fell and repeated the whisper aloud a message from the governor your honor and up the aisle trudged the children while a strange silence settled over the great throng and in open contempt of court they climbed up to the judge and presented their credentials all talking while the bewildered official read the message a smile dawned on his stern face which echoed in silence from the crowd if such things can be while he wiped his glasses suspend for five minutes he said to the lawyer who had been speaking the lawyer suspended willingly and his unchanging gaze fixed on the children kept the eyes of every juror riveted there with the children by his side the judge examined a record handed up by the clerk and did the governor send you to me with the note he asked as he turned the pages yes sir said sunshine and he laughed too oh he laughed did he the judge laughed too i see hmm, i see and then he read from the record twenty years for robbery and he was a boy when it occurred he shook his head yes the sentence was too severe too severe when his youth is considered his pen swept across the governor's note a few times he smiled grimly a path opened up through the throng and sunshine moonbeam and starlight fading from the scene left justice at work in the chill and gloom the state lost its case when the counsel for the defence resumed with the words children like those my friends await their father's homecoming this christmas eve but they knew nothing of this thirty minutes after leaving the governor's room they entered stormily gleefully and planted their victorious colours over the citadel and its vanquished custodian he learned their story in amazement and looked with comic gravity on their flushed faces the republican form of government is a failure he said at length the infantry has usurped the executive and suspended the judiciary and may we tell shadow he is free asked sunshine yes let freedom be his christmas present the child's eyes swam in softer light write it down for me please again she handed him the pen this time point foremost the little hand trembling with excitement and taking his pen the chief executive wrote this the strangest sweetest gentlest public document that ever issued from alabama's capital dear sunshine i have looked into the case of your friend shadow from crenshaw county and am inclined to think that his sentence is too severe his term is twenty years from september twenty three eighteen ninety three i have about made up my mind to cut his sentence to less than one-third you can let shadow know this and save this letter to show if needed he had three mighty nice girls to beg for him and you see i am giving him off more than four years for each girl your friend the governor late that night sunshine's father succeeded in getting connection by telephone with wetumpka and shadow was brought into the superintendent's office do you know who this is shadow the child's voice annihilated space as it annihilated opposition miss sunshine well shadow the governor says you will be free in the morning and i am so glad 
back over the wires came a great voice shouting it was the wordless expression of a soul whose chains had been broken asunder and to whom the whole beautiful world came back as a christmas gift was there ever such a gift one other sound came to the listening child the sound of a falling telephone receiver sunshine turned away with her eyes full of tears the city clock rang out clearly through the night upon the first stroke of twelve clapping her hands she cried aloud it is christmas shadow is free end of shadow a christmas story by harry stillwell edwards read by david wales shakespeare's christmas gift to queen bess in the year fifteen ninety six by anna benison mcmahon read in english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain one at the mermaid thus raleigh thus immortal sydney shone illustrious names in great eliza's days thomas edwards the numberless diamond-shaped window-panes of the mermaid tavern were twinkling like so many stars in the chill december air of london it is the last meeting of the mermaid club for the year fifteen ninety six and not a member is absent as they drop in by twos and threes and gather in groups about the room it is plain that the expectation is on tiptoe they call each other by their christian names and pledge healths some are young handsome fastidious in person and dress others are bohemian in costume speech and action all wear knee breeches and nearly all have pointed beards he of the harsh fighting face of the fine eye and coarse lip and the shaggy hair whom they call ben although one of the youngest is yet plainly one of the leaders both for wit and for wisdom that grave and handsome gentleman whose lordly bearing and princely dress mark his high rank is another favourite he has written charming poems has fought gallantly on many fields has voyaged widely on many seas has founded colonies in distant america is a favourite of the queen but in this mermaid club his chief glory is that he is its founder and leader the one whose magnetism and personal charm has summoned and cemented in friendship all these varied elements at last the all-important matter of the yearly christmas play at court has been settled the master of the revels has chosen from the rich stores of his manuscripts the midsummer night's dream graciously adding that for wit and mirth it is like to please her majesty exceedingly a high honour indeed for its author for not then as now were plays written primarily for the recreation and approval of the audience of the theatre true the public stage was fostered and attracted its daily audience but rather as a dress rehearsal its main purpose being to train the players for the court presentations at one of her majesty's palaces the secret spur to both players and playwright was the hope of being among the chosen for the festivities at richmond whitehall or greenwich as the queen might fancy to hold her court disappointment soreness jealousy not seldom followed the award of the coveted distinction but not so on this occasion for now the successful candidate is one of the youngest and best beloved of this jolly coterie and their pride in him is shown by the eagerness with which they await his coming to read to them the changes in the manuscript of his play since its former presentation ah hear the burst of applause that greets his late arrival a high-browed sandy-haired man of thirty-two lithe in figure of middle height with a smile of great sweetness yet sad withal on his face one may read the lines of recent sorrow 
and all know that he has returned but recently to london from the mournful errand which took him to his stratford home the burial of his dearly beloved and only son hamnet the plaudits for the author of the most successful play of the season romeo and juliet which was then taking the town by storm at the curtain theatre were little heeded by the grief-stricken father as he urged his horse over the rough roads of the four days journey arriving just too late for a parting word from dying lips but private sorrows are not for those who are called to public duties a writer must trim his pen not to his own mood but to the mood of the hour and queen elizabeth old in years but ever young in her love of fun and frolic and flattery must be made to forget the heaviness of time and the infirmities of age if she may no longer take part in outdoor sports the hunting the hawking the bear-baiting she still may command processions fetes masks and stage plays it pleases her now to see this wonderful fairy piece of which she has heard so much since two years ago it graced the nuptials of the earl of derby does she not remember also that pretty impromptu verse of the author when acting the part of king in another man's play two years ago at greenwich did she not twice drop her glove near his feet in crossing the stage and how happily had he responded to the challenge true to the character as well as to the metre of his part he had picked up the glove presenting it to its owner with the words and though now bent on this high embassy yet stoop we to take up our cousin's glove seats were taken the manuscript is opened and the club becomes a green-room conference the play is not to be recast entirely the changes from the early version being mainly to introduce certain touches to flatter the royal ears and to suit it to the more elaborate equipment of the whitehall stage quill in hand the reader as he proceeds crosses out from his manuscript everything that clogs the movement or detracts from the playfulness giving free rein to his luxuriant imagination he scatters the choicest flowers of fancy to create a vivid and animated picture the lovers meet and part with pretty rhymes and repartee the hard-handed men the tradesmen and tinkers bring their clumsy efforts to serve the wedding feast the fairies graceful lovely enchanting dance amid the fragrance of enamelled meadows his fellow writers feel the charm no one of them can do work in so many kinds nor of such kind in each they recognize their master they are under his magic spell the familiar stories from plutarch and chaucer and ovid take on a new meaning the very holly on the walls seems alive with the fairy folk as indeed it should be according to the pretty old superstition that elves and fairies hover about all christmas fetes hence branches are hanging in hall and bower in order that these invisible guests may hang in each leaf and cling on every bough the holly its prickly leaves symbolic of the crown of thorns and its red berries of the blood of christ banishes the ivy and other greens and becomes the popular favourite that it has since remained for christmas decoration a responsive audience truly roars of laughter greet the rollicking humour of the clowns and their rude burlesque of things theatrical but longest and loudest is the applause over the new touches those portions that have been written in to please the court and the queen to remodel a play written for a marriage celebration so that it shall seem to praise the virginity of the queen were surely no slight task but it has been accomplished though the scene is laid in greece yet the play is full of the english life that all know so well merry england and not classic greece has given the poet the picture of the sweet country schoolgirls working at one flower warbling one song growing together like a double cherry 
of england is the picture of the hounds with ears that sweep away the morning dew from england all this outdoor woodland life the clowns play and the clowns themselves bottom with his inimitable conceit and his fellows snug quince and the rest english is all puck's fairy lore the cowslips tall the red-hipped humble-bee oberon's bank the pansy love in idleness and all the lovely imagery of the verse english is the whole scenic background and the wood near athens is plainly the stratford boy's idealized memory of the weir break that he knows so well mayhap in very truth on some midsummer night the young poet even then of imagination all compact did indeed dream a dream or see a vision like unto this bringing it from stratford to london partly written but foregoing its completion for labor that would find readier acceptance at the theatre however that may be certain it is that this is a red-letter night at the mermaid the genius of gentle will has taken a new point of departure and shines as it has not shown before either in his making over of other men's plays or in his few original works he has conquered a new realm of art the phantoms of the fairy world for the first time have been endowed with a genuine and sustained dramatic interest small wonder that no one ventures to interrupt as the pages are turned even at the close only one the selinus faced ben offers a criticism being well versed in classic lore he protests against the characterization of theseus duke of athens saying it is too modern and has in fact nothing of the antique or grecian in its composition but he is overruled speedily and as the meeting breaks up one of the younger fellows whispers to another shakespeare was sent us from heaven but johnson from college two at the queen's palace those flights upon the banks of thames that so did take eliza and our james ben jonson it is christmas night lords ladies and ambassadors have been summoned to whitehall palace to witness the play for which author actors and artists of many kinds have been working so industriously during the past few weeks the banqueting hall with a temporary stage at one end has been converted into a fine auditorium facing the stage and beneath her canopy of state sits queen elizabeth in ruff and farthingale her hair loaded with crowns and powdered with diamonds while her sharp smile and keen glance take note of every incident nearest her person and evidently the chief favorite of the moment is the man who has long been considered the adonis of the court he is now also its hero having but recently returned from the wars in spain where his gallantry and promptitude at cadiz have won new glories for her majesty in five short years more his head will come to the block by decree of this same majesty but this no one can foresee and all voices now unite in praises for the brave and generous essex another conspicuous favorite is a blue-eyed pink-cheeked young fellow of twenty-three whose scarcely perceptible beard and moustache and curly auburn hair falling over his shoulders and halfway to his waist would suggest femininity except for his martial manner and tall figure his resplendent attire is notable even in this gorgeously arrayed company his white satin doublet has a broad collar edged with lace and embroidered with silver thread the white trunks and knee-breeches are laced with gold the sword-belt embroidered in red and gold is decorated at intervals with white silk bows purple garters embroidered in silver thread fasten the white stockings below the knee as one of the handsomest of elizabeth courtiers and also one of the most distinguished for birth wealth and wit he would be a striking figure at any time but to-night he has the added distinction of being the special friend and munificent patron of the author of the play that they have come to witness 
To him had been dedicated the author's first appeal to the reading public, a poem called Venus and Adonis, published some three years since. Also a certain sugared sonnet, privately circulated, protesting, For to no other pass my verses tend than of your graces and your gifts to tell and through the patronage of this man the gracious earl of southampton the actor author was first brought to the queen's notice finally leading to the present distinction at her hands but now the stage compels attention the silk curtains are withdrawn disclosing a setting of such elaboration and illusion as never before has been witnessed by sixteenth-century eyes never before has the frugal elizabeth consented to such an expenditure for costumes properties lights and music in vain the audience awaits the coming of the author he is behind the scenes an anxious and watchful partner with the machinist in securing the proper working of these new mechanical appliances and the smoothness of the scene shifting the queen is a connoisseur in these matters and there must be no bungling the stage is divided horizontally between the roof and floor the upper part concealed from the audience while the lower section represents the interior of a royal palace at athens three soundings of the cornet announce the opening of the play with its stately dialogue in which theseus duke of athens and hippolyta queen of the amazons anticipate their approaching nuptials Aegeus enters with his daughter Hermia to bring complaint to the duke that she will not marry Demetrius, the husband he has selected for her, but is bewitched with love for Lysander. The duke reasons with Hermia, but the maiden is still obdurate, and demands to know the worst that may befall if she refuses to wed Demetrius. The duke pronounces sentence, Either to die the death, or to abjure for ever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun, for I to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon, thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage but earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows lives and dies in single blessedness the tributes to the maiden pilgrimage and single blessedness win from the queen's countenance a glow which age has had no power to diminish the highway to favour with the virgin queen as every courtier and every writer knows lies through praises of her voluntary state of celibacy thus threatened hermia is urged by lysander to a clandestine marriage if thou lovest me then steal forth thy father's house to-morrow night and in the wood a league without the town where i did meet thee once with helena to do observance to a morn of may there will i stay for thee hermia hearing these words feels her heart leap with joy she tries to answer soberly in the same measure used by her lover but as her words become impassioned she breaks into rhyme my good lysander i swear to thee by cupid's strongest bow by his best arrow with a golden head by the simplicity of venus doves by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves and by that fire which burned the carthage green when the false trojan under sail was seen by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever woman spoke in that same place thou hast appointed me to-morrow truly will i meet with thee a scene of homely prose follows the tradesmen and tinkers of athens are planning to turn actors and to play pyramus and thisbe for the duke's wedding feast it is full of local hits which are not lost upon the audience in the practical jokes the melodrama the ranting bombast and bottom's ambition to play a tyrant's vein they recognize a satire 
on the amateur theatricals of the trades guilds, the clownish horseplay of the moralities so called. These crude plays, once so popular, have become the jest of an audience who pride themselves on a drama of higher ideals and greater art. A sudden fall of the upper curtain, and the lower stage is concealed, the upper one breaking upon the view of the delighted spectators and announcing Act Two of the play. It is a night scene in a wood near Athens, mossy banks and green trees, clouds and twinkling stars in the heavens, forms of fairies sitting about like hummingbirds or resting in nodding fern leaves. They sing in quick short rhymes, suiting the tempo to their actions. Met we on hill, in dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margent of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. Over hill, over dale, through flood, through fire, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire, I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to dew her orbs upon the green. The fairy queen and king appear, engaged in a very human quarrel. Titania, like any mortal woman, is little disposed to yield to the demands of her lord and master, one of her cherished treasures. They part in anger, and Oberon summons Puck, the art mischief maker, and sets on foot the punishment of the rebellious lady. The audience, easy believers in spells, magic, and witchcraft, are in full sympathy with Puck's mission to secure the potion whose magic power will create love or cause infidelity and hatred. Never had poetry been fuller of imagery, or sweeter in verification, than in the lines spoken by Oberon, nor had Queen Elizabeth ever received a more graceful compliment. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory, and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea-maid's music. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed his love-shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts, but I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votaress passed on in maiden meditation fancy-free. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk-white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower." Mark the queen's flushed cheek and parted lips. The mermaid on the dolphin's back is no fancy picture, but an exact description of one of the pageants at the festivities in her honour at Kenilworth. Although twenty years have passed, memory still loves to linger about those days when she visited her favourite, the fascinating Earl of Leicester, on her royal progress before state policy and private pique had combined to create strife and alienation. From memory also was the verse picture painted. The lad of eleven, who had made light of the fifteen miles between Kenilworth and Stratford, by tearing across ditch and hedge and meadow, could not easily forget the sights of that memorable day. Little then could he foresee the present hour. But rightly now does he judge that these reminiscences of the olden days will please Her Majesty. Rightly also does he judge that the ridiculous situations between the lovers will not be displeasing. A queen whose whole reign has been marked by warfare against the marriage of her courtiers and her clergy, whose own mother's marriage had been so unhappy, will sympathize with Puck when he says of the lovers, those things do best please me that fall out preposterously. Or, Lord, what fools these mortals be! A mad frolic now begins in Fairyland. 
Puck stirs up all sorts of complications by squeezing the magic flower juice on the wrong eyes, with such sad results that Titania falls in love with the weaver Bottom, with the ass's head on his shoulders. The two friends, Hermia and Helena, rail at each other over the seeming desertion of their lovers. But in the morning, the spell having been removed and each lover restored to his proper relations, the rivals become once more true friends. The fairy king and queen also have become reconciled, and prepare to celebrate the double wedding of the mortals with sports and revels throughout their fairy kingdom. The fifth act restores the lower stage and the palaces of Theseus. His wedding festivities have begun. The hard-handed men of Athens perform their crude interlude, made all the more grotesque by the awkwardness of Francis Flute, the bellows-mender. In the character of Thisbe, it is his part to fall upon the sword and die, thus ending the play. Imagine the delight of the courtly auditors when the clumsy man in the part of the disconsolate lady falls not upon the blade, but upon the scabbard of the unfamiliar weapon but laughter and applause are arrested by the appearance of a bright transparent cloud it reaches from heaven to earth and borne in upon it with music and with song are oberon titania and their elfin train the cloud parts and puck steps forth to speak the epilogue if we shadows have offended think but this and all is mended that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. The Christmas play is over, but not over the Christmas fun. Lords and ladies are but human, and have devised a stately dance, in which they themselves participate until nearly sunrise, the queen herself joining at times, and never so happy as when assured of her wondrous majesty and grace. Did they, did any one, at this Christmas play of three hundred years ago, feel the full charm and glory of this immortal creation of the poet did its lines ring in their ears the next day and the next and the next did they foresee how its rhythm would dance down the ages and abide in these present days and in this present speech of ours but this is something that i your truthful reporter cannot answer three an old-time christmas carol sung to the queen in the presence at whitehall fifteen ninety six i sing of a maiden that is machaelus king of all kings to her son she chess he came all so still there his mother was as dew in april that falleth on the grass he came all so still to his mother's bower as dew in april that falleth on the flower he came all so still, there his mother lay, as dew in April that falleth on the spray. Mother and maiden was never none but she, well may such a lady God's mother be. The End End of Shakespeare's Christmas Gift to Queen Bess in the year 1596 by Anna Berenson McMahon Read by David Wales Stephen Scarridge's Christmas by Frank R. Stockton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cottage. Twas Christmas Eve. An adamantine sky hung dark and heavy over the white earth. The forests were connescent with frost and the great trees bent as if they were not able to sustain the weight of snow and ice with which the young winter had loaded them. In a by-path of the solemn woods there stood a cottage that would not perhaps have been noticed in the decreasing twilight, had it not been for a little wisp of smoke that feebly curled from the chimney, apparently intending every minute to draw up its attenuated tail and disappear. Within, around the hearth whereon the dying embers sent up that feeble smoke, there gathered the family of Arthur Tyrrell, himself, his wife, a boy and a girl. 
twas christmas eve a damp air rushed from the recesses of the forest and came an unbidden guest into the cottage of the tyrrells and it sat on every chair and lay upon every bed and held in its chilly embrace every member of the family all sighed father said the boy is there no more wood that i may replenish the fire no my son bitterly replied the father his face hidden in his hands i brought at noon the last stick from the woodpile the mother at these words wiped a silent tear from her eyes and drew her children yet nearer the smouldering coals the father rose and moodily stood by the window gazing out upon the night a wind had now arisen and the dead branches strewed the path that he soon must take to the neighbouring town but he cared not for the danger his fate and heart were alike hard mother said the little girl shall i hang up my stocking to-night tis christmas eve a damascus blade could not have cut the mother's heart more keenly than this question no dear she faltered you must wear your stockings there is no fire and your feet uncovered will freeze the little girl sighed and gazed sadly upon the blackening coals but she raised her head again and said but mother dear if i should sleep with my legs outside the clothes old santa claus might slip in some little things between the woollen and my skin could he not dear mother mother is weeping sister said the boy press her no further the father now drew around him his threadbare coat put upon his head his well-brushed straw hat and approached the door where are you going this bitter night dear father cried his little son he goes then said the weeping mother to the town disturb him not my son for he will buy a mackerel for our christmas dinner a mackerel, a mackerel! cried both the children and their eyes sparkled with joy the boy sprang to his feet you must not go alone dear father he cried i will accompany you and together they left the cottage the town the streets were crowded with merry faces and well-wrapped-up forms snow and ice it is true lay thick upon the pavements and roofs but what of that bright lights glistened from every window bright fires warmed and softened the air within the houses while bright hearts made rosy and happy the countenances of the merry crowd without in some of the shops great turkeys hung in placid obesity from the bending beams and enormous bowls of mincemeat sent up delightful fumes which mingled harmoniously with the scents of the oranges the apples and the barrels of sugar and bags of spices in others the light from the chandeliers struck upon the polished surface of many a new wheelbarrow sled or hobby horse or lighted up the placid features of recumbent dolls and the demoniacal countenances of wildly jumping jacks the crop of marbles and tops was almost more than could be garnered boxes and barrels of soldiers stood on every side tin horns hung from every prominence and boxes of wonders filled the counters while all the floor was packed with joyous children carrying their little purses beyond there stood the candy stores those earthly paradises of the young where golden gumdrops rare cream chocolate variegated mint stick and enrapturing mixtures spread their sweetened wealth over all available space to these and many other shops and stores and stalls and stands thronged the townspeople rich and poor even the humblest had some money to spend upon this merry christmas eve a damsel of the lower orders might here be seen hurrying home with a cheap chicken here another with a duck and here the saving father of a family bent under the load of a turkey and a huge basket of auxiliary good things everywhere cheerful lights and warm hearthstones bright and gay mansions cosy and comfortable little tenements happy hearts rosy cheeks and bright eyes 
nobody cared for the snow and ice while they had so much that was warm and cheering it was all the better for the holiday what would christmas be without snow an inevitable entrance through these joyous crowds down the hilarious streets where the happy boys were shouting and the merry girls were hurrying in and out of the shops came a man who was neither joyous hilarious merry nor happy it was stephen scarridge the landlord of so many houses in that town he wore an overcoat which though old was warm and comfortable and he had fur around his wrists and his neck his hat was pushed down tight upon his little head as though he would shut out all the sounds of merriment which filled the town wife and child he had none and this season of joy to all the christian world was an annoying and irritating season to his unsympathetic selfish heart oh, oh he said to himself as one after another of his tenants loaded down with baskets and bundles hurried by each wishing him a merry christmas oh, oh there seems to be a great ease in the money market just now oh, oh, oh they all seem as flush as millionaires there's nothing like the influence of holiday times to make one open his pockets <laughs> it's not yet the first of the month tis true but it matters not i'll go and collect my rents to-night while all this money is afloat oh, oh. <laughs> and so old scarridge went from house to house and threatened with expulsion all who did not pay their rents that night some resisted bravely for the settlement day had not yet arrived and these were served with notices to leave at the earliest legal moment others paid up their dues with many an angry protest while some poor souls had no money ready for this unforeseen demand and stephen scarridge seized whatever he could find that would satisfy his claim thus many a poor weeping family saw the turkey or the fat goose which was to have graced the christmas table carried away by the relentless landlord the children shed tears to see their drums and toys depart and many a little memento of affection intended for a gift upon the morrow became the property of the hard-hearted stephen it was nearly nine o'clock when scarridge finished his nefarious labour he had converted his seizures into money and was returning to his inhospitable home with more joyous light in his eye than had shone there for many a day when he saw arthur tyrrell and his son enter the bright main street of the town oh ho said stephen has he too come to spend his christmas money he the poor miserable penniless one i'll follow him so behind the unhappy father and his son went the skulking scarridge past the grocery store and the markets with their rich treasures of eatables past the toy shops where the boy's eyes sparkled with the delight which disappointment soon washed out with a tear past the candy shops where the windows were so entrancing that the little fellow could scarcely look upon them on past all these to a small shop at the bottom of the street where a crowd of the very poorest people were making their little purchases went the father and his son followed by the evil-minded scarriage when the tyrrells went into the shop the old man concealed himself outside behind a friendly pillar lest any of these poor people should happen to be his tenants and return him the damage he had just done to them but he very plainly saw arthur tyrrell go up to the counter and ask for a mackerel when one was brought costing ten cents he declined it but eventually purchased a smaller one the price of which was eight cents the two cents which he received as change were expended for a modicum of lard and father and son then left the store and wended their way homeward the way was long but the knowledge that they brought that which would make the next day something more like christmas than an ordinary day made their steps lighter 
and the path less wearisome. They reached the cottage and opened the door. There, by a rushlight on a table, sat the mother and the little girl, arranging greens wherewith to decorate their humble home. To the mute interrogation of the mother's eyes, the father said, with something of the old fervour in his voice, Yes, my dear, I have got it, and he laid the mackerel on the table. The little girl sprang up to look at it, and the boy stepped back to shut the door. But before he could do so, it was pushed wide open, and Scarriage, who had followed them all the way, entered the cottage. The inmates gazed at him with astonishment, but they did not long remain in ignorance of the meaning of this untimely visit. "'Mr. Tyrrell,' said Scarriage, taking out of his pocket a huge memorandum-book, and turning over the pages with a swift and practised hand. I believe you owe me two months' rent. Let me see. Yes, here it is. Eighty-seven and a half cents. Two months at forty-three and three-quarters cents per month. I should like to have it now, if you please. And he stood with his head on one side, his little eyes gleaming with a yellow maliciousness. Arthur Tyrrell arose. His wife crept to his side, and the two children ran behind their parents. Sir, said Tyrrell, I have no money. To your worst. No money, cried the hard-hearted Stephen. That story will not do for me. Everybody seems to have money to-night, and if they have none, it is because they have willfully spent it. But if you really have none— and here a ray of hope shot through the hearts of the Tyrrell family. You must have something that will bring money, and that I shall seize upon. Aha! Uh -huh. I will take this. And he picked up the Christmas mackerel from the table where Arthur had laid it. Tis very little, said Scarriage, but it will at least pay me interest. Wrapping it in the brown paper which lay under it, he thrust it into his capacious pocket, and without another word went out into the night. Arthur Tyrrell sank into a chair, and covered his face with his hands. His children, dumb with horror and dismay, clung to the rounds of his chair, while his wife, ever faithful in the day of sorrow as in that of joy, put her arm around his neck, and whispered in his ear, "'Cheer up, dear Arthur. All may yet be well. Have courage. He did not take the lard.' What always happens. Swiftly homeward through the forest walked the triumphant scarriage, and he reached his home an hour before midnight. He lived alone in a handsome house, which he had seized for a debt, an old woman coming every day to prepare his meals and do the little housework that he required. Opening his door with his latch-key, he hurried upstairs, lighted a candle, and seating himself at a large table in a spacious room in the front of the house, he counted over the money he had collected that evening, entered the amounts in one of the great folios which lay upon the table, and locked up the cash in a huge safe. Then he took from his pocket the mackerel of the Tyrrell family. He opened it, laid it flat upon the table before him, and divided it by imaginary lines into six parts. Here, said he to himself, are breakfasts for six days. I would it were a week. I like to have things square and even. Had that man bought the ten-cent fish that I saw offered him, there would have been seven portions. Well, perhaps I can make it do, even now. Let me see. A little off here, and the same off this. So... At this moment something very strange occurred. The mackerel, which had been lying split open upon its back, now closed itself gave two or three long-drawn gasps, and then, heaving a sigh of relief, it flapped its tail, rolled its eyes a little, 
and deliberately wriggling itself over to a pile of ledgers sat up on its tail and looked at scarriage this astounded individual pushed back his chair and gazed with all his eyes at the strange fish but he was more astounded yet when the fish spoke to him would you mind said the mackerel making a very wry face getting me a glass of water i feel all of a parch inside scarriage mumbled out some sort of an assent and hurried to a table near by where stood a pitcher and a glass and filling the latter he brought it to the mackerel will you hold it to my mouth said the fish stephen complying the mackerel drank a good half of the water there it said that makes me feel better i don't mind brine if i can take exercise but to lie perfectly still in salt water makes one feel wretched you don't know how hungry i am have you any worms convenient worms cried stephen why what a question no i have no worms well said the fish somewhat petulantly you must have some sort of a yard or garden go and dig me some dig them cried stephen do you know it's winter and the ground's frozen and the worms too for that matter i don't care anything for all that said the mackerel go you and dig some up frozen or thawed it is all one to me i could eat them anyway the manner of the fish was so imperative that stephen scarriage did not think of disobeying but taking a crowbar and a spade from a pile of agricultural implements that lay in one corner of the room and which had at various times been seized for debts he lighted a lantern and went down into the little back garden there he shovelled away the snow and when he reached the ground he was obliged to use the crowbar vigorously before he could make any impression on the frozen earth after a half hour's hard labour he managed by most carefully searching through the earth thrown out of the hole he had made to find five frozen worms these he considered a sufficient meal for a fish which would scarcely make seven meals for himself and so he threw down his implements and went into the house with his lantern his five frozen worms and twice as many frozen fingers when he reached the bottom of the stairs he was certain that he heard the murmur of voices from above he was terrified the voices came from the room where all his treasures lay could it be thieves extinguishing his lantern and taking off his shoes he softly crept up the stairs he had not quite closed the door of the room when he left it and he could now look through an opening which commanded a view of the whole apartment and such a sight now met his wide-stretched eyes in his chair his own armchair by the table there sat a dwarf whose head as large as a prize cabbage was placed upon a body so small as not to be noticeable and from which depended a pair of little legs appearing like the roots of the before-mentioned vegetable on the table busily engaged in dusting a day-book with a pen-wiper was a fairy no more than a foot high and as pretty and graceful as a queen of the ballet viewed from the dress circle the mackerel still leaned against the pile of ledgers and oh horror upon a great iron box in one corner there sat a giant whose head had he stood up would have reached the lofty ceiling a chill colder than the frosty earth and air outside could cause ran through the frame of stephen scarriage as he crouched by the crack of the door and looked upon these dreadful visitors and their conversation of which he could hear distinctly every word caused the freezing perspiration to trickle in icy globules down his back he has gone to get me some worms said the mackerel and we might as well settle it all before he comes back 
For my part, I'm very sure of what I have been saying. Oh, yes, said the dwarf. There can be no doubt about it at all. I believe in every word. Of course it is so, said the fairy, standing upon the day-book, which was now well dusted. Everybody knows it is. It couldn't be otherwise, said the giant, in a voice like thunder among the pines. We're all agreed upon that. They're mighty positive about it, whatever it is, thought the trembling Stephen, who continued to look with all his eyes and to listen with all his ears. Well, said the dwarf, leaning back in the chair and twisting his little legs around each other until they looked like a rope's end, let us arrange matters. For my part, I would like to see all crooked things made straight just as quickly as possible. So would I, said the fairy, sitting down on the day-book, and crossing her dainty satin-covered ankles, from which she stooped to brush a trifle of dust. I want to see everything nice and pretty and just right. As for me, said the mackerel, I am somewhat divided, in my opinion, I mean. But whatever you all agree upon will suit me, I'm sure. Then, said the giant, rising to his feet and just escaping a violent contact of his head with the ceiling, let us get to work, and while we're about it, we'll make a clean sweep of it. To this the others all gave assent, and the giant, after moving the mackerel to one corner of the table and requesting the fairy to stand beside the fish, spread all the ledgers and day-books and cash and bill and memorandum-books upon the table and opened them all at the first page. Then the dwarf climbed up on the table and took a pen, and the fairy did the same, and they both set to work as hard as they could to take an account of Stephen Scarridge's possessions. As soon as either of them had added up two pages, the giant turned over the leaves, and he had to be very busy about it, so active was the dwarf, who had a splendid head for accounts, and who had balanced the same head so long upon his little legs that he had no manner of difficulty in balancing a few ledgers. The fairy, too, ran up and down the columns as if she were dancing a measure in which the only movements were forward one and backward one, and she got over her business nearly as fast as the dwarf. As for the mackerel, he could not add up, but the fairy told him what figures she had to carry to the next column, and he remembered them for her, and thus helped her a great deal. In less than half an hour, the giant turned over the last page of the last book, and the dwarf put down on a large sheet of foolscap the sum total of Stephen Scarridge's wealth. The fairy read out the sum and the woeful listener at the door was forced to admit to himself that they had got it exactly right. "'Now then,' said the giant, "'here is the rent list. Let us make out the schedule.' In twenty minutes the giant, the dwarf, and the fairy, the last reading out the names of Stephen's various tenants, the giant stating what amounts he deemed the due of each one, and the dwarf putting down the sums opposite their names, had made out the schedule, and the giant read it over in a voice that admitted of no inattention. Hurrah! said the dwarf. That's done, and I'm glad. And he stepped lightly from the table to the arm of the chair, and then down to the seat, and jumped to the floor, balancing his head in the most wonderful way as he performed these agile feats. Yes, said the mackerel, it's all right, though to be sure I'm somewhat divided. Oh, we won't refer to that now, said the giant. Let bygones be bygones. As for the fairy, she didn't say a word, but she just bounced on the top of the day-book that she had dusted and which now lay closed near the edge of the table and she danced such a charming little fantasy that everybody gazed at her with delight. 
the giant stooped and opened his mouth as if he expected her to whirl herself into it when she was done and the mackerel was actually moved to tears and tried to wipe his eyes with his fin but it was not long enough and so the tears rolled down and hardened into a white crust on the green baize which covered the table the dwarf was on the floor and he just stood still on his little toes as if he had been a great top dead asleep even stephen though he was terribly agitated thought the dance was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen at length with a whirl which made her look like a snowball on a pivot she stopped stock still standing on one toe as if she had fallen from the sky and had stuck upright on the day book bravo bravo cried the dwarf and you could hear his little hands clapping beneath his head hurrah cried the giant and he brought his great palms together with a clap that rattled the window panes like the report of a cannon very nice very nice indeed said the mackerel though i'm rather div oh no you're not cried the fairy making a sudden joyful jump at him and putting her little hand on his somewhat distorted and certainly very ugly mouth you're nothing of the kind and now let's have him in here and make him sign do you think he will do it said she turning to the giant that mighty individual doubled up his great right fist like a trip hammer and he opened his great left hand as hard and solid as an anvil and he brought the two together with a sounding wang yes said he i think he will in that case said the dwarf we might as well call him i sent him after some worms said the mackerel but he has not been all this time getting them i should not wonder at all if he had been listening at the door all the while we'll soon settle that said the dwarf walking rapidly across the room his head rolling from side to side but still preserving that admirable balance for which it was so justly noted when he reached the door he pulled it wide open and there stood poor stephen scarridge trembling from head to foot with the five frozen worms firmly grasped in his hands come in said the giant and stephen walked in slowly and fearfully bowing as he came to the several personages in the room are those my worms said the mackerel if so put them in my mouth one at a time there not so fast they are frozen sure enough but do you know that i believe i like them this way the best i never tasted frozen ones before by this time the dwarf had mounted the table and opening the schedule stood pointing to an agreement written at the bottom of it while the fairy had a pen already dipped in the ink which she held in her hand as she stood on the other side of the schedule now sir said the giant just take your seat in your chair take that pen in your hand and sign your name below that agreement if you've been listening at the door all this time as i believe you have you have heard the contents of the schedule and therefore need not read it over stephen thought no more of disobeying than he did of challenging the giant to a battle and he therefore seated himself in his chair and taking the pen from the fairy wrote his name at the bottom of the agreement although he knew that by that act he was signing away half his wealth when he had written his signature he laid down the pen and looked around to see if anything more was required of him but just at that moment something seemed to give way in the back of his neck his head fell forward so as to nearly strike the table and he awoke there was no longer a schedule a fairy a dwarf or a giant 
in front of him was the mackerel, split open and lying on its back. It was all a dream. For an hour Stephen Scarridge sat at his table, his face buried in his hands. When at last his candle gave signs of spluttering out, he arose, and with a subdued and quiet air he went to bed. What must occur? The next morning was bright, cold, and cheering, and Stephen Scarridge arose very early, went down to the large front room where his treasures were kept, got out his cheque-book, and for two hours was busily employed in writing. When the old woman who attended to his household affairs arrived at the usual hour, she was surprised at his orders to cook for his breakfast the whole of a mackerel which he handed her. When he had finished his meal, at which he ate at least one half of the fish, he called her up into his room. He then addressed her as follows. Margaret, you have been my servant for seventeen years. During that time I have paid you fifty cents per week for your services. I am now convinced that the sum was insufficient. You should have had at least two dollars, considering you only had one meal in the house. As you would probably have spent the money as fast as I gave it to you, I shall pay you no interest upon what I have withheld. But here is a cheque for the unpaid balance, $1,326. Invest it carefully, and you will find it quite a help to you. Handing the paper to the astounded woman, he took up a large wallet stuffed with cheques and left the house. He went down into the lower part of the town with a countenance full of lively fervour and generous light. When he reached the quarter where his property lay, he spent an hour or two in converse with his tenants, and when he had spoken with the last one, his wallet was nearly empty and he was followed by a wildly joyful crowd who would have brought a chair and carried him in triumph through the town had he not calmly waved them back. When the concourse of grateful ones had left him, he repaired to the house of Philip Weaver, the butcher, and hired his pony and spring-cart. Then he went to Ambrose Smith, the baker, at whose shop he had stopped on his way down town, and inquired if his orders had been filled. Although it was Christmas morning, Ambrose and his seven assistants were all as busy as bees, but they had not yet been able to fill said orders. In an hour, however, Ambrose came himself to a candy store, where Stephen was treating a crowd of delighted children, and told him all was ready and the cart loaded. At this Stephen hurried to the baker's shop, mounted the cart, took the reins, and drove rapidly in the direction of the cottage of Arthur Tyrrell. When he reached the place it was nearly one o'clock. Driving cautiously as he neared the house, he stopped at a little distance from it and tied the horse to a tree. Then he stealthily approached a window and looked in. Arthur Tyrrell sat upon a chair in the middle of the room, his arms folded and his head bowed upon his breast. On a stool by his left side sat his wife, her tearful eyes raised to his sombre countenance. Before her father stood the little girl, leaning upon his knees and watching the varied expressions that flashed across his face. By his father's right side, his arm resting upon his parent's shoulder, stood the boy, a look of calm resignation far beyond his years, lighting up his intelligent face. T'was a tableau never to be forgotten. Able to gaze upon it but a few minutes, Stephen Scarridge pushed open the door and entered the room. His entrance was the signal of consternation. The wife and children fled to the farthest corner of the room, while Arthur Tyrrell arose and sternly confronted the intruder. "'Ha!' 
said he you have soon returned you think that we can be yet further despoiled proceed take all that we have there is yet this and he pointed to the two cents worth of lard which still lay upon the table no no faltered stephen scarridge seizing the hand of arthur tyrrell and warmly pressing it keep it keep it tis not for that i came but to ask your pardon and to beg your acceptance of a christmas gift pardon for having increased the weight of your poverty and a gift to celebrate the advent of a happier feeling between us having said this stephen paused for a reply arthur tyrrell mused for a moment then he cast his eyes upon his wife and his children and in a low but firm voice he said i pardon and accept that's right cried scarridge his whole being animated by a novel delight come out to the cart you and your son and help me bring in the things while mrs t and the girl set the table as quickly as possible the cart was now brought up before the door and it was rapidly unloaded by willing hands from under a half dozen new blankets which served to keep the other contents from contact with the frosty air stephen first handed out a fine linen tablecloth and then a basket containing a dinner set of queensware third class seventy-eight pieces with soup tureen and pickle dishes and a half dozen knives and forks rubber handled and warranted to stand hot water when the cloth had been spread and the plates and dishes arranged arthur tyrrell and his son aided now by the wife and daughter brought in the remaining contents of the cart and placed them on the table while with a bundle of kindling which he had brought and the fallen limbs which lay all about the cottage scarridge made a rousing fire on the hearth when the cart was empty and the table fully spread it presented indeed a noble sight at one end a great turkey at the other a pair of geese a duck upon one side and a pigeon pie upon the other cranberries potatoes white and sweet onions parsnips celery bread butter beets pickled and buttered pickled cucumbers and walnuts and several kinds of sauces made up the first course while upon a side table stood mince pies apple pies pumpkin pies apples nuts almonds raisins and a huge pitcher of cider for dessert it was impossible for the tyrrell family to gaze unmoved upon this bounteously spread table and after silently clasping each other for a moment they sat down with joyful thankful hearts to a meal far better than they had seen for years at their earnest solicitation mr scarridge joined them when the meal was over and there was little left but empty dishes they all arose and scarridge prepared to take his leave but before i go said he i would leave you with a further memento of my good feeling and friendship uh, you know my hillsdale farm in the next township oh yes cried arthur tyrrell is it possible that you will give me a position there i make you a present of the whole farm said scarridge there are two hundred and forty-two acres sixty of which are in timber large mansion house two good barns and cow and chicken houses a well covered in an orchard of young fruit trees and a stream of water flowing through the place the estate is well stocked with blooded cattle horses etc and all necessary farming utensils possession immediate without waiting for the dumbfounded tyrrell to speak scarridge turned quickly to his wife and said here madam is my christmas gift to you in this package you will find shares of the new york central and hudson sixes of eighty three of the fort wayne guaranteed 
and of the St. Paul's, preferred. Also, bonds of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western second mortgage, and of the Michigan 7% war loan. In all, these amount to $9,082. But to preclude the necessity of selling at a sacrifice for immediate wants, I have taken the liberty of placing in the package $1,000 in greenbacks. And now, dear friends, adieu. But the grateful family could not allow this noble man to leave them thus. Arthur Tyrrell seized his hand and pressed it to his bosom, and then, as if overcome with emotion, Mrs. Tyrrell fell upon her benefactor's neck, while the children gratefully grasped the skirts of his coat. With one arm around the neck of the still young, once beautiful and now fast improving Mrs. Tyrrell, Stephen Scarridge stood for a few minutes, haunted by memories of the past. Then he spoke. Once, said he, his voice trembling the while, once I too loved such a one. But it is all over now, and the grass waves over her grave. Farewell, farewell, dear friends. And dashing away a tear, he tore himself from the fervent family and swiftly left the house. Springing into the cart, he drove rapidly into the town, a happy man. Did you ever read a story like that before? End of Stephen Scarridge's Christmas by Frank R. Stockton Recording by Ruth Golding Christmas 2013Toinen jouluaatto by Sakarias Topelius. Read in Finnish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Parahin emmi. Äitini kun äitilles nyt kirjoittaapi. Lohista juustoist tietysti. Niin kirjoitanpa minäkin. Yhdessä sekin mennä saapi. Mä toivon hyvin vointia, hauskuutta sulle yhtä myötä. Meillä joululuvan saatua, toint ollut monta laatua, on leikitty, on tehty työtä. Jo jouluaatton aikaisin, silmissä meillä ei ollut unta. Huusimme, tulpas joulukin, ja päivä olkin ikävin, ja sitten alkoi sataa lunta. Vaan vuoteelta me oitistaan, iloisna ylös keikahdimme, ja äiti puuhas toimissaan, ja renkimatti niskassaan myttyä kantoi, huomasimme. Nyt kirkastettiin hopeat ja pestiin posliinitkin kaikki. Tuvasta tuoksui suloisat, vehnäisten hajut ihanat, ja tortut paistoi vanha maikki. Ol aamupuoli pitkä niin, ja iltapäivä samanlainen. Yhäti juostiin puuhattiin, kuin milloin ovi aukaistiin, niin ilo syntyi kaikuvainen. Mut ovi pantiin lukkohon. Avaimen reijäst tirkistimme. Se tavattoma nahdas on, ja selvän saanti mahdoton, me kokeemme tok uudistimme. Jo ovi aukes vihdoinkin, salissa seisoi joulukuusi. Säteili valo ihanin, oksissa loisti tähdetkin, aiottiin alkaa leikki uusi. Vaan siellä seisoi lasta kuus, ne tulleet oli jostain kaukaa. Niil enkelin oli ihanuus ja vienous ja iloisuus, ne oli kuusi orporaukkaa. Iloisna lapset lauloivat, olimme kaikki riemuissamme. Betlehemistä kertoivat, jos pieni Jeesus, sanoivat, ois meidän jouluvieraanamme. Koht ovi aukes naristen, ja joulupukki astui tuosta. Mokoma suursarvinen ja kookas harmaa turkkinen, taa äidin roosa aikoi juosta. Hän kysyi niin kuin torvella, et äreällä äänellänsä, on olleet lapset siivoja? Niin ja näin, vaan vihdoinpa hän mumisi jotain mielissänsä. Hän meni, palasi jällehen, ja Roosaltakin loppui pelko. Se oli Matin kokoinen, mutta mikä pukiksi teki sen, siitä ei nyt vielä ollut selko. Ja nytkös mytyt tukut jo, toisensa perään saliin kulki. Yksi ensin, toinen, kolmas, 
No, jo taas, jo taaskin kummako, jos ilo oikein puhkes julki. Kuin peltokanat lensimme, luimme kirjoitukset kaikin, paketin tyhjän löysimme, mut sormus oli minulle ja tanssipojan roosa saikin. Nyt oikein mytyt sinkuivat helmasta vanhan joulupukin, ne kaikki kovin mieluisat ja tavattoman arvoisat, osamme niistä saimme kukin. Ol ihmeen kaunis kuusikin ja paljon myöskin jouluruokaa, ja niistä puuro herkkuisin, me lähetimme niillekin puutteessa, jotka raukat huokaa. Me kiittäkäämme Jumalaa kaikista armolahjoistansa, on jouluaamu juhlivaa, kun varhain kellot kaikuaa ja kirkkoon rientää harras kansa. Kauniisti siellä urut soi, ja juhlallinen kaik on toimi. Te maala käsitätte, oi, sen rauhan, minkä joulu toi, paremmin kuin sun siskos toini. End of toinin jouluaatto, pai Sakarias Topelius. The Truth of God by Mary Roberts Reinhardt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. Now the day of the birth of our Lord dawned that year gray and dreary, and a Saturday. But, despite the weather, in the town at the foot of the hill there was rejoicing, as befitted so great a festival. The day before a fat steer had been driven to the public square, and there dressed and trussed for the roasting. The light of morning falling on his carcass revealed around it great heaps of fruits and vegetables, for the year had been prosperous. But the young overlord sulked in his castle at the cliff-top, and bit his nails. From Thursday evening of each week to the morning of Monday, Mother Church had decreed peace, a truce of God. Three full days out of each week his men-at-arms polished their weapons and grew fat. Three full days out of each week his grudge against his cousin, Philip of the Black Beard, must feed on itself. His dark mood irritated the Bishop of Tours, who had come to speak of certain scandalous things which had come to his ears. Charles heard him through. "'She took refuge with him,' he said violently, when the Bishop had finished. She knew what hate there was between us, yet she took refuge with him. The question is, said the bishop mildly, why she should have been driven to refuge. A gentle lady, a faithful wife. Deus! The young seigneur clapped his fist on the table. You know well the reason. A barren woman. She had borne you a daughter but Charles was far gone in rage and out of hand. The bishop took his offended ears to bed and left him to sit alone by the dying fire with bitterness for company. Came into the courtyard at midnight the Christmas singers from the town, the blacksmith rolling a great bass, the crockery seller who sang falsetto, and a fool of the village who had slept overnight in a manger on the holy eve a year before and had brought from it not wit but a voice from heaven a miracle of miracles. The men-at-arms in the courtyard stood back to give them space. They sang with eyes upturned, with full-throated vigor, albeit a bit warily, with an anxious glance now and then toward those windows beyond which the young lord sulked by the fire. The light of light divine, true brightness undefiled, he bears for us the shame of sin, a holy, spotless child. They sang to the frosty air. When neither money nor burning faggot was flung from the window they watched, they took their departure, relieved if unrewarded. In former years the lady of the castle had thrown them alms, but times had changed. Now the gentle lady was gone, and the seigneur sulked in the hall. With the dawn Charles the Fair took himself to bed, and to him, pattering barefoot along stone floors, came Clotilda, the child of his disappointment. "'Are you asleep?' One arm under his head, he looked at her without answer. "'It is the anniversary of the birth of our Lord,' she ventured. "'Today he is born. I thought—' 
she put out a very small, cold hand, but he turned his head away. Back to your bed, he said shortly. Where is your nurse to permit this? The child's face fell. Something she had expected, some miracle, perhaps, a softening of the Lord her father, so that she might ask of him a Christmas boon. The bishop had said that Christmas miracles were often wrought, and she herself knew that this was true. Had not the fool secured his voice, so that he who had been but lightly held became the village troubadour, and slept warm and full at night? She had gone to the bishop with this the night before. If I should lie in a manger all night, she said, standing with her feet well apart and looking up at him, would I become a boy? The bishop tugged at his beard. A boy, little maid? Would you give up your blue eyes and your soft skin to be a roistering lad? My father wishes for a son, she had replied, and the cloud that was over the castle shadowed the bishop's eyes. It would not be well, he replied, to tamper with the works of the Almighty. Pray rather for this miracle, that your father's heart be turned toward you and toward the lady, your mother. So during much of the night she had asked this boon steadfastly, but clearly she had not been heard. Back to your bed, said her father, and turned his face away. She went as far as the leather curtain which hung in the doorway, and there she turned. Why do they sing? she had asked the bishop, of the blacksmith and the others, and he had replied into his beard, to soften the heart of heart. So she turned in the doorway, and sang in her reedy little voice, much thinned by the cold, sang to soften her young father's heart. To the light of light divine, true brightness undefiled, he bears for us the shame of sin, a holy, spotless child. But the song failed. Perhaps it was the wrong hour, or perhaps it was because she had not slept in the manger and brought forth the gift of voice. Blood of the martyrs, shouted her father, and raised himself on his elbow. Are you mad? Get back to your bed. I shall have a word with someone for this. Whether it had softened him or not, it had stirred him, so she made her plea. It is his birthday. I want to see my mother. Then she ducked under the curtain and ran as fast as she could back to where she belonged. Terror winged her feet. She had spoken a forbidden word. All sleep was gone from Charles the Fair. He lay on his elbow in his bed and thought of things that he wished to forget of the wife he had put away because in eight years she had borne him no son, of his great lands that would go to his cousin, Philip of the Blackbeard, whom he hated, of girls in the plain who wooed him with soft eyes and whom he passed by, of a Jew who lay in a dungeon beneath the castle because of usury and other things. After a time he slept again, but lightly, for the sun came in through the deep, unshaded window and fell on his face and on the rushes that covered the floor. And in his sleep the grimness was gone, and the pride. And his mouth, which was sad, contended with the firmness of his chin. Clotilda went back to her bed, and tucked her feet under her to warm them. In the next room her nurse lay on a bed asleep, with her mouth open. Outside in the stone corridor a page slept on a skin, with a corner over him against the draught. She thought things over while she warmed her feet. It was clear that singing did not soften all hearts. Perhaps she did not sing very well. But the bishop had said that after one had done a good act, one might pray with hope. She decided to do a good act, and then pray to see her mother. She would pray also to become a boy so that her father might care for her. But the bishop considered it a little late for such a prayer. She made terms with the Almighty, sitting on her bed. I shall do a good act, she said, on this the birthday of thy son, and after that I shall ask for the thing thou knowest of. After much thinking, she decided to free the Jew, and being, after all, her father's own child, she acted at once. It was a matter of many cold stone steps and much fumbling with bars. 
but Guilem, the jailer, had crept up to the hall and lay sleeping by the fire, with a dozen dogs about him. It was the time of the truce of God, and vigilance was relaxed. Also Guilem was in love with the girl of the village, and there was talk that the seigneur, in his loneliness, had seen that she was beautiful. So Guilem slept to forget, and the Jew lay awake because of rats and anxiety. The Jew rose from the floor when Clotilda threw the grating open, and blinked at her with weary and gentle eyes. "'It is the birthday of our Lord,' said Clotilda, "'and I am doing a good deed so that I may see my mother again. But go quickly.' Then she remembered something the bishop had said to her, and eyed him thoughtfully as he stared at her. "'But you do not love our Lord.' The Jew put out his foot quietly so that she could not close the grating again, but he smiled into her eyes. "'Your Lord was a Jew,' he said. This reassured her. It seemed to double the quality of mercy. She threw the door wide, and the usurer went out cautiously, as if suspecting a trap. But patches of sunlight, barred with black, showed the way clear. He should have gone at once, but he waited to give her the blessing of his people. Even then, having started, he went back to her. She looked so small in that fearsome place. If there is something you wish, little maid, and I can secure it for you. I wish but two things, she said. I wish to be a boy, only I fear it is too late for that. The bishop thinks so. And I wish to see my mother. And these being beyond his gift, and not contained in the pack he had fastened to his shoulders. He only shook his head and took his cautious way toward freedom. Having tried song and a good deed, Clotilda went back again to her room, stepping over the page who had curled himself up in a ball, like a puppy, and still asleep. She crossed her hands on her breast and raised her eyes as she had been taught. Now, O oh Lord, she said, I have tried song, and I have tried a good deed. I wish to see my mother. Perhaps it was merely coincidence that the level rays of the morning sun just then fell on the crucifix that hung on the wall, and that although during all the year it seemed to be of but wood and with closed eyes, now it flashed as with light, and the eyes were open. He was one of your people, she said to the crucifix, and by now he is down the hill. 2. Now it was the custom on the morning of the holy day for the seigneur to ride his finest stallion to the top of the hill, where led a steep road down to the town. There he dismounted, surrounded by his people, guests and soldiers, smaller visiting nobility, the household of the castle, and, the stage being set as it were, and the village waiting below, it was his pleasure to give his charger a great cut with the whip and send him galloping, unridden down the hill. The horse was his who caught it. Below waited the villagers, divided between terror and cupidity. Above waited the castle folk. It was an amusing game for those who stood safely along the parapet and watched, one that convulsed them with merriment. Also, it improved the quality of those horses that grazed in the plain below. This year it was a great grey that carried Charles out to the road that clung to the face of the cliff. Behind him on a donkey, reminder of the humble beast that had borne the Christ into Jerusalem, rode the bishop. Saddled and bridled was the grey, with a fierce head and great shoulders, a strong beast for strong days. The men-at-arms were drawn up in a double line, weapons at rest. From the place below rose a thin grey smoke where the fire kindled for the steer. But the crowd had deserted and now stood, eyes upraised to the castle, and to the cliff road where waited boys and men ready for their desperate emprise, clad in such protection of leather as they could afford against the stallion's hoofs. Two people only remained by the steer, an aged man, almost blind, who tended the fire, and the girl Joan, whom Guilem slept to forget. "'The seigneur has ridden out from the gates, father,' she said. The color mounted to her dark cheeks. She was tall and slender, unlike the peasant girls of the town, almost noble in her bearing, a rare flower that Charles, in his rage and disappointment, would pick for himself. And were you not undutiful, he mumbled, you would be with him now, 
and looking down on this rabble. She did not reply at once. Her eyes were fixed on the frowning castle, on the grim double line of men-at-arms, at the massive horse and its massive rider. "'I, too, should be up there,' whined the old man. "'Today, instead of delivering Christmas dues, I should be receiving them. But you—' He swung on her, malevolently. "'You must turn great ox-eyes toward Guilham, whose most courageous work is to levy tribute of a dungeon.' She flushed. "'I am afraid, father. He is a hard man.' "'He is gentle with women.' "'Gentle?' Her eyes were still upraised. "'He knows not the word. When he looks at me there is no liking in his eyes. I am... frightened.' The overlord sat his great horse and surveyed the plain below. As far as he could see, and as far again in every direction, was his domain, paying him the tithe of fat cattle and heaping granaries. As far as he could see, and as far again, was the domain that, lacking a man-child, would go to Philip, his cousin. The bishop, who rode his donkey without a saddle, slipped off and stood beside the little beast on the road. His fingers absently traced the dark cross on its back. Idiots, snarled the overlord out of his distemper as he looked down into the faces of his faithful ones below. Fools, and sons of fools! Thy beast would suit them better, Bishop, than mine. Then he flung himself insolently out of the saddle. There was little of Christmas in his heart, God knows. Only hate and disappointment, and thwarted pride. A great day, my lord, said the Bishop. Peace over the land, the end of a plentiful year. Bah! The end of a plentiful year, repeated the bishop tranquilly. This day of his birth, a day for thanksgiving, and for goodwill. Bah! said the overlord again, and struck the grey a heavy blow. So massive was the beast, so terrific the pace at which it charged down the hill that the villagers scattered. He watched them with his lip curling. See, he said, Brave men and true. Watch, father, how they rally to the charge. And when the creature was caught, and a swaying figure clung to the bridle, By the cross, the fool has him. A fine heritage for my cousin Philip, a village with its bravest man, a simpleton. The fool held on, swinging. His arms were very strong, and as is the way with fools and those that drown, many things went through his mind. The horse was his. He would go adventuring along the winter roads, adventuring and singing. The townspeople gathered about him with sheepish praise. From adult he had become a hero. Many have taken the same step in the same space of moments, the line being but a line and easy to cross. The denouement suited the grim mood of the overlord. It pleased him to see the smug villagers stand by while the fool mounted his steed. Side by side from the parapet, he and the bishop looked down into the town. "'The birthday of our lord, bishop,' he said, "'with fools on blooded horses and the courage of the townspeople in their stomachs.' "'The birthday of our lord,' said the bishop tranquilly, "'with a lad mounted who has heretofore trudged afoot.' and with the hungry fed in the marketplace. Now it had been in the mind of the bishop that the day would soften Charles's grim humor, and that he might speak to him as man to man, but Charles was not softened. So the bishop gathered up his courage. His hand was still on the cross on the donkey's back. You are young, my son, and have been grievously disappointed. I, who am old, have seen many things, and this I have learned. Two things there are that, next to the love of God, must be greatest in a man's life. Not war, nor slothful peace, nor pride, nor yet a will that would bend all things to its end. The overlord scowled. He had found the girl Joan in the market square, and his eyes were on her. One, said the bishop, is the love of a woman. The other is a child. The donkey stood meekly, with hanging head. A woman, repeated the bishop. 
You grow rough up here on your hillside. Only a few months since the lady your wife went away, and already order has forsaken you. The child, your daughter, runs like a wild thing, without control. Our holy church deplores these things. Will holy church grant me another wife? Holy church, replied the bishop gravely, would have you take back, my lord, the wife whom your hardness drove away. The seigneur's glance turned to the east, where lay the castle of Philip, his cousin. Then he dropped brooding eyes to the square below, where the girl Joan assisted her father by the fire, and moved like a mother of kings. "'You wish a woman for the castle, father,' he said. "'Then a woman we shall have. Holy Church may not give me another wife, but I shall take one, and I shall have a son.' The child Clotilda had watched it all from the window. Because she was very high, the thing she saw most plainly was the cross on the donkey's back. Far out over the plain was a moving figure which might or might not have been the Jew. She chose to think it was. One of your people, she said toward the crucifix, I have done a good deed. She was a little frightened, for all her high head. Other Christmases she and the lady her mother had sat hand in hand and listened to the roistering. They are drunk, Clotilda would say, but her mother would stroke her hand and reply, They but rejoice that our Lord is born. So the child Clotilda stood at her window and gazed to where the plain stretched as far as she could see and as far again. And there was her mother. She would go to her and bring her back, or perhaps failing that, she might be allowed to stay. Here no one would miss her. The odor of cooking food filled the great house. Loud laughter, the clatter of mug on board. Her old nurse was below, decorating a boar's head with berries and a crown. Because it was the truce of God and a festival, the gates stood open. She reached the foot of the hill safely. Stragglers going up and down the steep way regarded her without suspicion. So she went through the square past the roasting steer, and by a twisting street into the open country. When she stopped to rest, it was to look back with wistful eyes toward the frowning castle on the cliff. For a divided allegiance was hers. Passionately as she loved her mother, her indomitable spirit was her father's heritage, his fierceness was her courage, and she loved him as the small may love the great. The fool found her at the edge of the river. She had forgotten that there was a river, he was on his great horse, and he rode up by the child and looked down at her. "'It was I who captured him,' he boasted. "'The others ran, but I caught him, so.' He dismounted to illustrate. "'It is not because you were brave that you captured him.' "'Then why?' He stood with his feet wide apart, looking down at her. "'It is because you have slept in a manger on a holy eve.' "'I,' he responded, but that was a matter of courage, too. There were many strange noises. Also, in the middle of the night came Our Lady herself, and said to me, Hereafter thou shalt sing with the voice of an angel. I should like to see Our Lady, said the child wistfully. Also, pursued the fool, she gave me power over great beasts. See, he fears me while he loves me and indeed there seemed some curious kinship between the horse and the lad, perhaps because the barrier of keen human mind was not between them. "'Think you,' said the little maid, "'if I slept where you did, she would appear to me. I would not ask much, only to be made a lad like you, and, perhaps, to sing. But I am a simpleton. Instead of wit I have but a voice, and now a horse.' A lad like you, she persisted, so that my father would love me, and my mother might come back again? Better stay as you are, said the fool. Also, there will be no holy eve again for a long time. It comes but once a year. Also, it is hard for men who must either fight or work in the fields. I, he struck his chest, I shall do neither, and I shall cut no more wood. I go adventuring." Clotilda rose and drew her grey cloak around her. "'I am adventuring, too,' she said. "'Only I have no voice and no horse. 
May I go with you? The boy was doubtful. He had that innate love and tenderness that is given to his kind instead of other things. But a child. I will take you, he said at last, rather heavily. But where, little lady? To my mother, at the castle of Black Philip. And when his face fell, for Philip was not named the Black only for his beard. She loves singing. I will ask you to sing before her. That decided him. He took her before him on the gray horse, and they set off. Two valiant adventurers, a troubadour and a lady, without food or sufficient clothing, but with high courage and a song. And because it was the truce of God, the children went unharmed, encountering no greater adventure than hunger and cold and aching muscles. Robbers skulked in their fastnesses, and their horses pawed the ground. Murder, rapine, and pillage slept that Christmas day under the shelter of the cross. The fool, who ached for adventure, rather resented the peace. "'Wait until Monday,' he said from behind her on the horse. "'I shall show you great things.' But the little maid was cold by that time, and beginning to be frightened. "'Monday you may fight,' she said. "'Now I wish you would sing.' So he sang until his voice cracked in his throat. Because it was Christmas, and because it was freshest in his heart, he sang mostly what he and the blacksmith and the crockery seller had sung in the castle yard. The light of light divine, true brightness undefiled. He bears for us the shame of sin, a holy, spotless child. They lay that night in a ruined barn with a roof of earth and stones. Clotilda eyed the manger wistfully, but the holy eve was past and the day of miracles would not come for a year. Toward morning, however, she roused the boy with a touch. "'She may have forgotten me,' she said. "'She has been gone since the spring. She may not love me now.' "'She will love you. It is the way of a mother to keep on loving. "'I am still a girl. You are still her child.' Seeing that she trembled, he put his ragged cloak about her, and talked to comfort her, although his muscles ached for sleep. He told her a fable of the countryside, of that abbot who, having duly served his God, died and appeared at the heavenly gates for admission. A slave of the Lord, he replied, when asked his name, but he was refused. So he went away and labored seven years again at good deeds and returned. A servant of the Lord, he called himself, and again he was refused. Yet another seven years he labored, and came in all humility to the gate. A child of the Lord, said the abbot, who had gained both wisdom and humility, and the gates opened. 3. All that day came peasants up the hill with their Christmas dues, of one fowl out of eight, of barley and wheat. The courtyard had assumed the appearance of a great warehouse, those that were prosperous came a-riding, hissing geese and chickens and grain in bags across the saddle. The poor trudged afoot. Among the latter came the girl Joan of the market square. She brought no grain but fowls only, and of these but two. She took the steep ascent like a thoroughbred, muscles working clean under glowing skin, her bosom rising evenly, treading like a queen among the clutter of peasants. And when she was brought into the great hall, her head went yet higher. It pleased the young seigneur to be gracious. But he eyed her much as he had eyed the great horse that morning before he cut it with the whip. She was but a means to an end. Such love and tenderness as were in him had gone out to the gentle wife he had put away from him, and had died of Clotilda. So Charles appraised her and found her, although but a means, very beautiful. Only the bishop turned away his head. Joan, said Charles, do you know why I have sent for you? The girl looked down, but, although she quivered, it was not with fright. I do, sire. Something of a sardonic smile played around the seigneur's mouth. The butterfly came too quietly to the net. We are but gloomy folk here, rough soldiers and few women. It has been in my mind— 
here he saw the bishop's averted head and scowled. What had been in his mind he forgot. He said, I would have you come willingly, or not at all. At that she lifted her head and looked at him. You know I will come, she said. I can do nothing else. But I do not come willingly, my lord. You are asking too much. The bishop turned his head, hopefully. Why? You are a hard man, my lord. If she meant to anger him, she failed. They were not soft days. A man hid such tenderness as he had under grimness, and prayed in the churches for phlegm. I am a fighting man. I have no gentle ways. Then a belated memory came to him. I give no tenderness, and ask for none. But such kindness as you have, lavish on the child Clotilda. She is much alone. With the mention of Clotilda's name came a vision. Instead of this splendid peasant wench, he seemed to see the graceful and drooping figure of the woman he had put away, because she had not borne him a son. He closed his eyes, and the girl, taking it for dismissal, went away. When he opened them, there were only fire and the dogs about it, and the bishop, who was preparing to depart. "'I shall not stay, my lord,' said the bishop. "'The thing is desecration. No good can come from such a bond. It is Christmas, and the truce of God, and yet you do this evil thing.' So the bishop went, muffled in a cloak, and mantled with displeasure. And with him, now that Clotilda had fled, went all that was good and open to the sun, from the grey castle of Charles the Fair. At evening Joan came again, still afoot, but now clad in her best. She came alone, and the men at the gates, instructed, let her in. She gazed around the courtyard with its burden of grain that had been crushed out of her people below, with its loitering soldiers and cackling fowls, and she shivered as the gates closed behind her. She was a good girl, as the times went, and she knew well that she had been brought up the hill as the stallion that morning had been driven down. She remembered the cut of the whip, and in the twilight of the courtyard she stretched out her arms toward the little town below, where the old man, her father, lived in semi-darkness, and where on that Christmas evening the women were gathered in the churches to pray. Having no seasonable merriment in himself, Charles surrounded himself that night with cheer. A band of wandering minstrels had arrived to sing. The great fire blazed. The dogs around it gnawed the bones of the Christmas feast. But when the troubadours would have sung of the nativity, he bade them in a great voice to have done. So they sang of war, and, remembering his cousin Philip, his eyes blazed. When Joan came, he motioned her to a seat beside him, not on his right, but on his left and there he let her sit without speech. But his mind was working busily. He would have a son, and the king would legitimize him. Then let Philip go hang. These lands of his, as far as the eye could reach, and as far again, would never go to him. The minstrels sang of war, and of his own great deeds, but there was no one of them with so beautiful a voice as that of the fool, who could sing only of peace, and the fool was missing. However, their songs soothed his hurt pride. This was he, these things he had done. If the bishop had not turned sour and gone, he would have heard what they sang. He might have understood, too, the craving of a man's warrior soul for a warrior son, for one to hold what he had gathered at such cost. Back always to this burning hope of his. Joan sat on his left hand, and went hot and cold, hot with shame, and cold with fear. So now, his own glory as a warrior commencing to pall on him, Charles would have more tribute, this time as Lord of Peace. He would celebrate this day of days, and at the same time throw a sop to Providence. He would release the Jew. The troubadours sang louder, fresh liquor was passed about, Charles waited for the Jew to be brought. He remembered Clotilda, then. She should see him do this noble thing. Since her mother had gone, she had shrunk from him. Now let her see how magnanimous he could be. He, the seigneur, 
who held life and death in his hands, would this day give, not death, but life. Being not displeased with himself, he turned at last toward Joan and put a hand over hers. You see, he said, I am not so hard a man. By this Christian act shall I celebrate your arrival. But the Jew did not come. The singers learned the truth and sang with watchful eyes. The seigneur's anger was known to be mighty, to strike close at hand. Gwillem, the jailer, had been waiting for the summons. News had come to him late in the afternoon that had made him indifferent to his fate. The girl Joan, whom he loved, had come up the hill at the overlord's summons. So, instead of raising an alarm, Gwillem had waited sullenly. Death, which yesterday he would have blenched to behold, now beckoned him. When he was brought in, he stood with folded arms and asked no mercy. "'He is gone, my lord,' said Gwillem, and waited. He did not glance at the girl. "'Gone,' said Charles. Then he laughed such laughter as turned the girl cold. "'Gone, earth-clod! How now! Perhaps you, too, wish to give a hostage to fortune, to forestall me in mercy?' He turned to the girl beside him. "'You see,' he said, "'to what lengths the spirit of this holy day extends itself. Our friend here!' Then he saw her face and knew the truth. The smile set a little on his lips. "'Why, then,' he said to the jailer, "'such mercy should have its reward.' He turned to Joan. "'What say you? Shall I station him at your door, sweet lady, as a guard of honor? Things went merrily after that, for Gwillem drew a knife and made, not for the seigneur, but for Joan. The troubadours feared to stop singing without a signal, so they sang through white lips.' The dogs gnawed at their bones, and the seigneur sat and smiled, showing his teeth. Guilhem, finally unhanded, stood with folded arms and waited for death. "'This is the time of the truce of God,' said the seigneur softly, and, knowing that death would be a boon, sent him off unhurt. The village, which had eaten full, slept early that night. Down the hill at nine o'clock came half a dozen men at arms on horseback and clattering through the streets. Word went about quickly. Great oaken doors were unbarred to the news. The child Clotilda is gone, they cried through the streets. Up and arm, the child Clotilda is gone. Joan, deserted, sat alone in the great hall, for the seigneur was off, riding like a madman, flying through the market square, he took the remains of the great fire at a leap. He had but one thought. The Jew had stolen the child. Therefore, to find the Jew. In the blackest of the night he found him, sitting by the road, bent over his staff. The eyes he raised to Charles were haggard and weary. Charles reined his horse back on his haunches, his men-at-arms behind him. "'What have you done with the child?' "'The child?' "'Out with it!' cried Charles, and flung himself from his horse. If the Jew were haggard, Charles was more so, hard-bitten of terror, pallid to the lips. "'I have seen no child. That is,' he hastened to correct himself, seeing Charles's face in the light of a torch, "'I was released by a child, a girl. I have not seen her since.' He spoke with the simplicity of truth. In the light of the torches, Charles's face went white. "'She released you,' he repeated slowly. "'What did she say?' "'She said, "'It is the birthday of our Lord,' repeated the Jew, slowly, out of his weary brain. "'And I am doing a good deed.' "'Is that all?' The Jew hesitated. "'Also,' she said, "'But you do not love our Lord.' Charles swore under his breath. "'And you?' "'I said but little. I—' "'What did you say?' "'I said that her lord was also a Jew. "'He was fearful of giving offence, so he hastened to add, "'It was by way of comforting the child. "'Only that, my lord.' "'She said nothing else.' "'The seigneur's voice was dangerously calm. 
the Jew faltered. He knew the gossip of the town. She said, she said she wished two things, my lord, to become a boy and to see her mother. Then Charles lifted his face to where the stars were going dim before the uprising of the dawn, and where, as far away as the eye could reach, and as far again, lay the castle of his cousin Philip of the black beard. And the rage was gone out of his eyes. For suddenly he knew that, on that feast of mother and child, Clotilde had gone to her mother, as unerringly as an arrow to its mark. And with the rage died all the passion and pride. In the eyes that had gazed at Joan over the parapet, and that now turned to the east, there was reflected the dawning of a new day. The castle of Philip the Black lay in a plain, for as much as a mile in every direction the forest had been sacrificed against the loving advances of his cousin Charles. Also about the castle was a moat in which swam noisy geese and much litter. When, shortly after dawn, the sentry at the drawbridge saw a great horse with a double burden crossing the open space, he was but faintly interested. A belated peasant with his Christmas dues, perhaps. But when, on the lifting of the morning haze, he saw that the horse bore two children, and one a girl, he called another man to look. Troubadours, by sound, said the newcomer, for the fool was singing to cheer his lack of breakfast. Coming empty of belly, as come all troubadours. But the sentry was dubious. Minstrels were a slothful lot, adverse to the chill of early morning. And when the pair came nearer and drew up beyond the moat, the soldiers were still at a loss. The fool's wandering eyes and tender mouth bespoke him no troubadour, and the child rode with him head high like a princess. "'I have come to see my mother,' Clotilda called, and demanded admission, clearly. Here were no warriors, but a fool and a child. So they let down the bridge and admitted the pair, but they raised the bridge at once again against the loving advances of Philip's cousin Charles. But once in the courtyard, Clotilda's courage began to fail her. Would her mother want her? Prayer had been unavailing, and she was still a girl. And, at first, it seemed as though her fears had been justified, although they took her into the castle kindly enough, and offered her food which she could not eat, and plied her with questions which she could not answer. "'I want my mother,' was the only thing they could get out of her. Her little body was taut as a bowstring, her lips tight. They offered her excuses. The lady mother slept. Now she was rising and must be clothed, and then at last they told her, because of the haunted look in her eyes. She is ill, they said. Wait but a little, and you shall see her. Deadly despair had Clotilda in its grasp with that announcement. These strange folk were gentle enough with her, but never before had her mother refused her the haven of her outheld arms. Besides, they lied. Their eyes were shifty. She could see in their faces that they kept something from her. Philip, having confessed himself overnight, by candlelight, was at mass when the pair arrived. Three days one must rot of peace, and those three days, to be not entirely lost, he prayed for success against Charles, and for another thing that lay close to his heart, but not for both together, since that was not possible. He knelt stiffly in his cold chapel and made his supplications, but he was not too engrossed to hear the drawbridge chains and to pick up his ears to the clatter of the grey horse. So, having been communicated, he made short shift of what remained to be done and got to his feet. The abbot, whose offices were finished, had also heard the drawbridge chains and let him go. When Philip saw Clotilda, he frowned and then smiled. He had sons, but no daughter, and he would have set her on his shoulder, but she drew away haughtily. So Philip sat in a chair and watched her with a curious smile playing about his lips. Surely it were enough to make him smile, that he should play host to the wife and daughter of his cousin Charles. Because of that, and of the thing that he had prayed for, and with a twinkle in his eyes, Black Philip alternately watched the child, and from a window the plane which was prepared against his cousin. 
and, as he had expected, at ten o'clock in the morning came Charles and six men-at-arms, riding like demons, and jerked up their horses at the edge of the moat. Philip, still with the smile under his black beard, went out to greet them. "'Well met, cousin,' he called. "'You ride fast and early.' Charles eyed him with feverish eyes. "'Truce of God!' he said, sulkily, from across the moat. And then, "'We seek a runaway, the child Clotilda.' "'I shall make inquiry,' said Philip, veiling the twinkle under his heavy brow. "'In such a season many come and go.' But in his eyes Charles read the truth, and breathed with freer breath. They lowered the drawbridge again with a great creaking of windlass and chain, and Charles with his head up rode across. But his men-at-arms stood their horses squarely on the bridge so that it could not be raised, and Philip smiled into his beard. Charles dismounted stiffly. He had been a knight in the saddle, and his horse staggered with fatigue. In Philip's courtyard, as in his own, were piled high the Christmas ties. A good year, said Philip agreeably, and indicated the dues. Peaceful times, eh, cousin? But Charles only turned to see that his men kept the drawbridge open, and followed him into the house. Once inside, however, he turned on Philip fiercely. I am not here out of my own desire. It appears that both my wife and child find sanctuary with you. Tut, said Philip good-naturedly. It is the Christmas season, man, and a Sunday. We will not quarrel as to the why of your coming. Where is she? Your wife or Clotilda? Now all through the early morning Charles had longed for one as for the other, but there was nothing of that in his voice. Clotilda, he said. I shall make inquiry if she has arrived, mumbled Philip into his beard and went away. So it came about that Charles was alone when he saw the child, and caught her up in his hungry arms. As for Clotilda, her fear died at once in his embrace. When Philip returned, he found them thus, and coughed discreetly. So Charles released the child, and put her on her feet. "'I have,' said Philip, "'another member of your family under my roof, as to whom you have made no inquiry. "'I have secured that for which I came,' said Charles haughtily but his eyes were on Philip, and a question was in them. Philip, however, was not minded to play Charles's game, but his own, and that not too fast. In that event, cousin, he replied, let the little maid eat, and then take her away. And since it is a Sunday, and the truce of God, we can drink to the Christmas season. Even quarreling dogs have intervals of peace. So, perforce, because the question was still in his heart, if not in his eyes, Charles drank with his cousin and enemy, Philip. But with his hand in that small hand of Clotilda's, which was so like her mother's. Philip's expansiveness extended itself to the men-at-arms, who still sat woodenly on the drawbridge. He sent them hot liquor, for the day was cold, and at such intervals as Charles's questioning eyes were turned away, he rubbed his hands together furtively as a man with a secret. "'A prosperous year,' said Philip. Charles grunted. "'We shall have snow before night,' said Philip. "'Huh,' said Charles, and glanced toward the sky, but made no move to go. "'The child is growing.' To this Charles made no reply whatever, and Philip bleated on. "'Her mother's body,' he said, "'but your eyes and hair, cousin.' Charles could stand no more. He pushed the child away and rose to his feet. Philip, to give him no tithe of advantage, rose too. Now, said Charles squarely, where is my wife? Is she hiding from me? Then Philip's face must grow very grave, and his mouth set in sad lines. She is ill, Charles. I would have told you sooner, but you lacked interest. Charles swallowed to steady his voice. How... Ill. A short and violent illness, said Philip. All of last night the women have been with her, and this morning. He glanced toward the window. I was right, as you see, cousin. It is snowing. Charles clutched him by the arm and jerked him about. 
"'What about this morning?' he roared. "'Snow on Christmas,' mused Philip, "'prophesies another prosperous year.' Then, having run his quarry to earth, he showed mercy. "'Would you like to see her?' Charles swallowed again, this time his pride. "'I doubt if she cares to see me.' "'Probably not,' said Philip. "'Still a few words. She is a true woman, and kindly. Also, it is a magnanimous season. But you must tread softly, and speak fair. This is no time for a high hand.' Charles, perforce, must promise mildness. He made the concession with poor grace, but he made it. And in Philip's eyes grew a new admiration for this hulking cousin and enemy, who ate his pride for a woman. At the entrance to an upper room where hung a leather curtain, he stood aside. Softly, he said through his beard, No harsh words. Send the child in first. So Philip went ponderously away, and left Charles to cool his heels and wait. As he stood there sheepishly, he remembered many things with shame. Joan, and the violence of the last months, and the bishop's averted head. For now he knew one thing, and knew it well. The lady of his heart lay in that quiet room beyond, and the devils that had fought in him were dead of a Christmas peace. Little cries came to him, Clotilda's soft weeping, and another voice that thrilled him, filled with the wooing note that is in a mother's voice when she speaks to her child. But it was a feeble voice, and its weakness struck terror to his soul. What was this thing for which he had cast her away, now that he might lose her? His world shook under his feet. His cousin and enemy was, willy-nilly, become his friend, his world, which he had thought was his own domain, as far from his castle as the eye could reach, and as far again, was in an upper room of Philip's house, and dying, perhaps. But she was not dying. They admitted him in time to save his pride, for he was close to distraction, and, being admitted, he saw only the woman he had put away. He went straight to his wife's bed and dropped on his knees beside it, not for his life could he have spoken then. Inarticulate things were in his mind. Remorse and the loneliness of the last months, and the shame of the girl, Joan. He caught her hand to him and covered it with kisses. I have tried to live without you, he said, and death itself were better. When she did not reply, but lay back, white to the lips, he rose and looked down at her, I can see, he said, that my touch is bitterness. I have merited nothing better. So I shall go again. But this time, if it will comfort you, I shall give you the child Clotilda. Not that I love her the less, but that you deserve her the more. Then she opened her eyes, and what he saw there brought him back to his knees with a cry. I want only your love, my lord to make me happy, she said. And now, see how the birthday of our Lord has brought us peace. She drew down the covering a trifle, close to his bent head, and showed him the warm curve of her arm. Unto us also is born a son, Charles. I have wanted a son, said Charles the Fair. But more than a son, I have wanted you, heart of my heart. Outside in the courtyard, the fool had drawn a circle about him. "'I am adventuring,' he said. "'Yesterday I caught this horse when the others ran from him. "'Then I saved a lady and brought her to her destination. "'This being the Christmas season and a Sunday, "'I shall rest here for a day.' "'He threw out his chest magnificently. "'But tomorrow I continue on my way.' "'Can you fight?' they baited him. I can sing, he replied, and he threw back his head with its wandering eyes and tender mouth, and sang, The light of light divine, true brightness undefiled. He bears for us the shame of sin, a holy, spotless child. End of The Truce of God by Mary Roberts Reinhardt
Read by Marianne. Wandering Wassailers from Ancient English Melodies by William Chappell. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wandering Wassailers. Wassail, wassail all over the town. Our bread it is white and our ale it is brown. Our bowl it is made of the maplin tree. So here, my good fellow, I'll drink it to thee. The wassailing bowl with a toast within. Come, fill it up unto the brim. Come, fill it up that we may all see. With the wassailing bowl, I'll drink to thee. Come, butler, come bring us a bowl of your best, And we hope your soul in heaven shall rest. But if you do bring us a bowl of your small, Then down shall go butler the bowl and all. O oh, butler, O oh, butler, now don't you be worst, But pull out your knife and cut us a toast, And cut us a toast, one that we may all see, With the wassailing bowl I'll drink to thee. Here's to Dobbin and to his right eye, God send our mistress a good Christmas pie, A good Christmas pie as e'er we did see, With the wassailing bowl I'll drink to thee. Here's to broad May and his broad horn, God send our master a good crop of corn, A good crop of corn as we all may see, With the wassailing bowl I'll drink to thee. Here's to Collie and to her long tail, We hope our master and mistress heart will ne'er fail, But bring us a bowl of your good strong beer, and then we shall taste of your happy new year. Be there here any pretty maids? We hope there be some. Don't let the jolly wassailers stand on the cold stone, but open the door and pull out the pin, that we jolly wassailers may all sail in. End of Wandering Wassailers From Ancient English Melodies by William Chappell Printed in In the Yule Log Glow, Book 4 By Harrison S. Morris Read by Lucy Perry, in Bath, on November 29th, 2013. The Wizer by Mary Hartwell Catherwood. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That was a cold evening. The snow was just as dry as flour and had been beat down till the road looked slick as a ribbon far up and far down and squeaked every step. I pulled Marar on our sled. All the boys went home by the creek to skate, but I was afraid Marar would get cold. She's such a little thing. I like to play with the girls if the boys do laugh, for some of the big ones might push Marar down and hurt her. She misses her mother, so I babies her more than I used to. We's almost out of sight of the schoolhouse and just where the road elbows by the Widow Briggs's place when something passed us like whiz. I'd been pulling along with the sled rope over my arm and my hands in my pockets and didn't hear a team or anything, but it made me shy off the side of the road and pretty near upset Marar. School lets out at four o'clock, and dusk comes soon after that, but it was woolly gray yet, so you could see plain except in the fence corners, and the thing that passed us was a man riding on nothing but one big wheel. Oh, see there, says Marar, scared as could be. I felt glad on her account we's close to Widow Briggs's place. It would be easy to hustle her over Briggs's fence, but the thing runs so still and fast it might take fences as well as a straight road. The man turned round after he passed us and came rearing back away up on that wheel, and I stood as close before the sled as I could. He sat high up in the air and wiggled his feet on each side of the wheel, and I never saw a camel or elephant or any kind of wild thing at a show that made me feel so funny. But just when I thought he's going to cut through us, he turned short and stopped. He had on an overcoat to his ears and a fur cap down to his nose and hairy gloves on and a little satchel strapped over his shoulder and I saw there was a real small wheel behind the big one that balanced him up. He wasn't sitting on the tire neither but on a saddle place and the big wheel had lots of silver spokes crossing back and forward. Whose children are you? says the man. Nobody's, says I. But who owns and switches you? says he. The schoolmaster switches me, says I, but we ain't owned since mother died. Marar began to cry. We live at Uncle Mosey's, says she. They don't want to give us away. The man laughed and says, Are you right, sure? But I hated to have her scared, so I told her the wheel couldn't hurt her, nor him either. 
I've seen the cars many a time, I says, and I've seen balloons and read in the paper about things that went on three wheels, but this... It's a bicycle, says he. I'm a wheel man. That's what I thought, says I. Then he wanted to know our names. Mine's Steel Petticord, I says, and this is my little sister Marar. His eyes looked sharp at us, and he says, Your mother died about six weeks ago? Yes, sir, says I. Tomorrow won't be a very nice Christmas for you, says he. No, sir, says I, digging my heel in the snow, for he had no business to talk that way and make Mar feel bad, when I had a little wagon all whittled out in my pocket to give her, and she cried most every night anyhow, until Aunt Abby threatened to switch her if she waked the family any more. I slept with the boys, but when I heard Mar sniffling in the big bed, a good many nights I slipped out and sat by her, and whispered stories to take her attention as long as my jaws worked limber, but when they chattered too much with the cold, I'd lay down on the cover with my arm across her till she went to sleep. I like Mar. They said we might go up to Cousin Andy Sanders's to stay over, says I. We don't have to be at Uncle Moses at Christmas. That's some consolation, is it? says he. I was not going to let him know what the relations did, but I never liked relations outside of our place. At Aunt Ibby and Uncle Moses, the children fight like cats, and they always act poor at Christmas and make fun of hanging your stockings or setting your plate, for you'd only get ashes or corn cobs. Aunt Ibby keeps her sleeves rolled up so she can slap real handy, and Uncle Mose has yellow streaks in his eyes and he shivers over the stove and keeps everybody else back. At Cousin Andy Sanders's, they have no children and don't want them. You durst hardly come in out of the snow, and all the best things on the table will make you sick. If there is a piece in the paper that is hard to read, and ugly as it can be, they will make you sit still and read it, and if you get done too quick, they will say you skipped and you have to read it out loud while they find fault. I knew Cousin Andy Sanders never had any candy or taffy for Christmas, but Marar and me could be peaceful there, for they don't push her around so bad. Well, hand me your rope, says the man, and I'll give you a ride. I liked that notion, so I handed him the rope, and he waited till I got on the sled in front of Marar. That's Widow Briggs's homestead, isn't it? He said, just before he started. I told him it was, and asked if he ever lived down our way. He laughed and said he knew something about every place, and then he set the wheel a-going. Marar held tight to me, and I braced my heels against the front round of the sled. The fence corners went faster and faster, and the wind whistled through our ears, while you could not see one dry blade in the fodder shocks move. Ain't he a wizard? says I to Marar. We turned another jog, and the spokes in the wheel looked all smeared together. It did beat horse racing. I got excited and hollered for him to go it, old wizard, and he went it till we's passed Cousin Andy Sanders's before I knew the place was nigh. Cast loose now, mister, we're much obliged, says I. But he kept right on like he never heard me. So I yelled up louder and told him we's there, and he turned around his head a minute and laughed. Please let go, mister, I says. That's Cousin Andy Sanders' is way back there. We're obliged, but we'll have to go back. The wizard never let on. He whizzed ahead as fast as ever. I thought it was a mean trick for him to play on Marar and wished I could trip up his wheel. It would be dark long before I got her back to Cousin Andy Sanders's, and the wizard whizzed ahead like he was running off with us. I had a notion to cut the rope, but there was no telling when I'd get another, and it was new. I made up my mind to do it, though, when we come along by our old place, but there the wizard turned round and jumped off in the road. I picked up the end of my rope and shook my head because I was mad. "'Why didn't you let go?' says I. "'Haven't I brought you home?' he says. I looked at the shut-up house and felt a good deal worse than when I thought he was running off with us. "'Oh, Steely,' says Marart, "'let's go in and stay. I want to come home so bad.' He was a man grown and I was only ten years old, but he ought to know better than to make Mark cry till the tears run down her chin. I'd been to look at the house myself, but never said a word to her about it. Once about noon I slipped up there by the cornfields roundabout and sat on the fence and thought about Mother till I could hardly stand it. The house looked lonesomer than an old cabin about to fall, because an old cabin about to fall has forgot its folks, but all our things were locked up here, except what Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders had carried off. Our sale was to be in January. The snow was knee-deep in the yard and drifted even on the porch, but tracks showed where Aunt Ibby walked when she got out a load of provisions and bedclothes. She had the front door key, and took even the blue and white cover lid with birds wove in that I heard Mother say was to be Mars, and the canned fruit for fear it would freeze, when our cellar is warmer than their stove. She said to Uncle Mose when I was by unbeknown that Mara and me would have ten times as much property as her children anyhow, and she ought to be paid more for keeping us. She might had our money for all I cared, but I did not know how to stand her robbing things out of Mother's house and wished the sale would come quick and scatter them all. The wizard leaned his chin on his breast and looked pitiful out of his eyes at Marar, for it seemed like the tears had a notion to freeze on her face, only she kept them running down too fast, and he says, Let's go into the house. Oh, do, Steely, 
says Mar, hugging my knee, for I was alongside the sled. And I'll cook all your dinners, and we'll hang up our Christmas stockings every Sunday, says she. And Aunt Ibby's boys won't durst to take away my lead pencil mother give me, and if you see them coming here, you'll set bounce on them. Mar, says I, we will go in and make a fire, and act like mother's just gone out to a neighbor's. Then she begun to laugh, and one of her tears stuck to an in-spot that comes and goes in her face like it was dented with your finger. But now you mind, I says, if Aunt Ibby or Uncle Mose goes to whip us for this, you tell him I put you up to it and made you go along with me. Mar looked scared. And you tell them, says the wizard, lifting his wheel across the snow toward the gate, that I put you both up to it and made you go along with me. I pulled Mar over the drifts and we went to the side door. Aunt Ibby's got the big key, I says, and I'll have to raise a window while you wait here. The windows were all locked down, but we went round and round till the one in the shed gave way, and I crawled through and bursted the latch off the kitchen door. I breathed so fast it made my heart thump when I unlocked the side door and let the wizard and Mar into the sitting room. I noticed then he'd hung his wheel on the limb of a tree, for it glittered. Bounce ain't here to jump on us, is he, Mar? says I. No, and he hates to stay at Cousin Andy Sanders's, says she. Bounce would come to the schoolhouse and kind of cry till I asked the master, please may I go out. And then Bounce and me'd have a talk behind the schoolhouse, and I'd tell him I could not help it, and he'd own that he might live at Aunt Ibby's with us if he could only keep from chawing up their miserable yellow dogs, and we'd both feel better. But I did miss him that minute I opened the door, when here he come like a house of fire, and lit down on the floor panting and pounding his tail and laughing, and then he jumped up and pawed us in the dark till Mar had to hold him round the neck to keep him still while I got a light. He must have snuffed our tracks when we whizzed past Cousin Andy Sanders's. I felt to the pantry and put my hand in the candle box, but Aunt Ibby never left one. I knew there was a piece in a candlestick in the shed cupboard, though. It burnt half out the night Mother died. So I got it, and the wizard scraped a match and lit the wick. The wizard and me set to, then, and brought in loads from the wood house. We built a fire clean up into the chimney, and Brar took the broom and swept all the dust into it. Bounce laid on the carpet and licked at us and whacked his tail till he's in a broad laugh. The fire got me warmer than I'd been since Mother died. The wizard took out a thick gold watch and wound our clock and set it. Then he says, Let's go over the house. And we did. I carried the candle and Mar and the dog went along. The wizard looked in all the upstairs presses and opened the bureau drawers. I stayed outside of the parlor and Mar and Bounce did too. I did not want to think of the sheet stretched in the corner, for it was not like Mother under the sheet. But her picture hung up in there and so did my father's. The wizard stayed in with the candle a good while. I heard him going from one thing to another and wondered what he was about. I'd rather gone out to the graveyard, though, and sat on the fence watching mother's and father's graves and heard the dry sumac bushes scrape together than to step into the parlor. Father died a year before mother, but I didn't like him the same as I did her. Then we looked down cellar, and I thought I ought to tell the wizard about the provisions and bedclothes being taken out of the house or he'd suppose mother never kept this nice. He smiled under his cap, and I found one jar of candid honey behind some barrels where Aunt Ibby overlooked it. We carried that up to the sitting room. Mar likes candid honey better than anything. Just as we come into the sitting room, I heard somebody pound on the front door. They're after us, says Mar. Let me see to it, says the wizard. So we stepped around the house and came back with his wheel on his arm and held the door open. The snow made outdoors light and we saw a little fellow lead a horse and buggy through the yard into the barn lot and he came right in carrying a couple of baskets. All right, Sam, says the wizard. Put your horse in the stable and then build a fire in the kitchen stove. The man he called Sam stopped to warm himself at our hearth, and I never saw such a looking creature before. He had a cap with a button on top of his head, and his hair was braided and a long tail behind. He laughed, and his eyes glittered, and they sloped up like a ladder set against the house. He was just as yellow as brass and wore a cloth circular with big sleeves, but the rest of him looked like other folks. Ra went back into the corner, and I noticed the wizard set his wheel against the wall, and I wondered if he'd left it out for a sign so the little yellow man would know where to stop. The yellow man went out to his horse, and the wizard took off his cap and gloves and coat and hung them in the sitting room. He looked nice. His eyes snapped and his hair was cut off close, except a brush right along the middle of his head. We set our chairs up to the fire, and I watched him and watched him. If you and that fella travel together, I says, what makes him go in a buggy and you on a wheel? Oh, I like the bicycle, says he. I've run thousands of miles on it. I sent Sam out from San Francisco by the railroad, but I came through on the wheel. It took me three months. I thought he was a funny man, but I liked him, too. When Sam came in from the stable, Marar and I went to the kitchen and saw him cook supper, for one of the baskets was jam full of vittles. He heated a roasted turkey and made oyster soup and mashed potatoes and chopped cabbage. 
There were preserves the wizard called scotch, and hot rolls, and jelly, and cold chicken, and little round cakes that melted in your mouth, and pickles, and nuts, and oranges, and we put the candied honey on the table. The coffee smelt like Thanksgiving. Sam waited on us, and I eat till I was ashamed. We never expected to have such a dinner in Mother's house any more. When Ra and I got down and begun to toss our oranges, the wizard told Sam to clear the things away and have his supper in the kitchen, and then to fix the beds as comfortable as he could. I'd made up my mind even if the wizard did travel ahead that Marar and to stay there all night. Aunt Ibby's would think we were at Cousin Andy Sanders's, and Cousin Andy Sanders's would think we were at Aunt Ibby's. He sat in Mother's big chair before the fire, and I felt willing. If it had been Uncle Moe's in the chair, I wouldn't felt willing. When a stick broke on the dog irons, we piled on more wood, and the clock ticked and struck nine, and I wished we'd never going away from there again. Marar and I played and jumped, and he was blind man, and we had solid fun till we's tired out. I showed him my books, for I never took one to Uncle Moses. The boys there make you give up everything, and they lick their dirty thumbs to turn leaves. Rar and I stood and looked into the glass doors of the bookcase like we used to when the fire made them like a looking glass, and there were our faces, hers round and wide between the eyes and curly-headed, and mine long and narrow between the eyes and my hair in a black roach. I told the wizard she'd better have a bed made down by the fire, considering the blankets and comforts were most all out of visiting, and he guessed so too, and Sam helped me bring lots of quilts and a feather tick from my old room to fix up the lounge with. Sam went into the kitchen and slept by the stove. Then I undressed Marar and heard her prayers after I tucked her in. She's six years old and dressed herself before Mother died, all but hooking up. I hooked her up, and sometimes she'd swell out for mischief when she ought to swell in. But now I tended to her entirely because she missed her mother. The wizard acted like he saw something in the fire, but when Marar was asleep and I sat down by him, he pushed up my roach and he says, you're a very fatherly little fellow, Steel Petticord. It put me in mind to ask him if he's Sam's father, but he laughed out loud at the notion. Sam's smaller than you, and he minds so well, says I, and I never saw a man that was so handy at girls' work. Sam's an excellent fellow, says the wizard, but I don't deserve to have a Chinaman called my son. Oh, I says, is he a Chinaman? Well, I've read about them, but I never saw one before. Then I concluded to ask the wizard what his own name was. But just then, he got up from his chair and brought the other basket to the fire. Do you know who Santa Claus is? He says, talking low. I found that out two years ago, says I. Well, get her little stockings then, he says. I thought you'd like to do this yourself, says the wizard. He acted just like mother. We took the things out of the basket. There were toy sheep and dogs and dolls and tubs and dishes, and underneath them all kinds of candies, enough to treat a school. I felt like the wizard was Santa Claus. We stuffed her little stockings till they stood alone like kegs and tied bundles to them and fastened them together and hung them on the mantelpiece. Bounce would wake up and watch us and then he'd doze off, for Bounce was fuller of turkey bones than he ever expected to be again, and Marar slept away looking like a doll in the fire shine. But all at once Bounce gave a jump and a bark. Back went the door like the wind had tore it open, and there stood Uncle Mose and Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders and the widow Briggs's grown son and two or three men behind them. They all looked scared or mad, and Aunt Ibby's face was so white that her moles all bristled. "'This is a pretty how-to-do,' says she, speaking up loud like she did on wash days or times she took a stick and drove the boys to the woodpile. "'What's going on in this house tonight? Fires and candles burning and travelers putting up, and children running away when they're let go someplace else to stay all night. You little sneak!' says she. You'll get one such a whipping as you ached for when your mother was alive. Stop, stop, says the wizard peaceably. What are you doing in this house? says Cousin Andy Sanders. Are you the man I saw go past my place tonight on that wheel, pulling the children? I am, says the wizard, and I've been making notes of the personal property that has been carried out of the house. Well, says Uncle Mose, I'm the constable, and this is my posse. The wizard laughed, and he says, this thorn bush is my thorn bush, and this dog my dog. I did not know what he meant, and they acted as if they did not either. I arrest you, says Uncle Mose, for breaking into a house and disturbing the peace. You can't do it, says the wizard. Go in and take him, says Uncle Mose to the other men. Because this is my house, says the wizard. I swallowed my breath when he said that. I wish you'd shut the door, he says. And since tomorrow is Christmas, and I don't want to harbor any ill will, you can shut it behind instead of in front of you. I'm Steel Petticord, this boy's father, as you might all know by looking at me. Even Cousin Andy Sanders didn't jump any more than I did, but I jumped for gladness and seemed like he jumped for something else. I'm appointed guardian to the children, he says, and I don't want any impudent talk from a stranger. You pretend you don't know me, Andy Sanders, says the wizard. 
but I always knew you. You expected to settle on their land while Mose and his wife pillaged their goods. I didn't grow up with you for nothing. Steel Petticord died when that boy was a year old, says Aunt Nebby, and she looked so awful and so big I could hardly bear to watch her. He was killed by the Indians on his way from California after he sent his money home. He was only kept prisoner by the Indians, says my father, and sick and ill-used, but he had no notion he was dead till he got away after a few years and heard his widow was married again and even mother to another child. It's a likely story, says Cousin Andy Sanders, that a man wouldn't come forward and claim his own in such case. Your notion of a man and mine never did agree, Andy Sanders, says my father. She wasn't to blame, and her second husband was my best friend. The boy and girl are mine now. It's some robbing scheme, says Aunt Ibby, but she looked as if she knew him well enough. I've more to give them than you could have taken from them, he says, and you may begin to investigate tonight. Is that the widow Briggs's boy? he says. The Briggs boy came up and shook hands with them, and the other men stepped in and shook hands too. They all begun to talk, but Uncle Mose and Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders left the door, and I heard them slam the gate. Mar slept right along, though the neighbors talked so loud and fast, and I sat down on the lounge at her feet, wondering what she would say Christmas morning when she found out the wizard was my own father that Mother thought was dead since I was a year old. I felt so queer and glad that something in me whizzed like the wheel, and while my father was not looking and everybody sat up to the fire asking questions, I slipped over and tried to hug it around the cranks that he wiggled with his feet. You can read pieces about Santa Claus coming on a sledge, but that's nothing to having your own father that you think is dead and gone, Ride up like a regular wizard and open the house for Christmas. End of The Wizard by Mary Hartwell Catherwood. Recording by Angela.